It's the Visit Huntington Beach Surf City, USA. Dawn Patrol, Vans US Open of Surfing. And we're back at it again. Welcome to another beautiful day, Southside Huntington Beach Pier. And competition continues to roll on on the world's largest action sports festival, all centered around the surf stadium right here and exactly what we're looking at sun rising and we anticipate another big day of competition as they always have been really loving the action i'm kaipo this is shannon hughes joining me as we're going to get into today how are you doing shannon oh so good it's been a great week of surfing so far there's been so much action between the challenger series and the duct tape invitational and we got more of it today we do and uh, we have that variety yesterday we were in the challenger series into the duct tape invitational but let's find out what's happening today and for that i'm going to go down to the sand with aj mccord i am here with kira in charge of the longboard tour and so we have a lot of crazy conditions yesterday for the longboarders tell us today first off who are we going to see well we're going to start off with the women's round three it is two three-man heats top two will advance with the third one getting eliminated and then we're going to go into the men's round three and then men's round four, and those go on to man-on-man -on -man heats, and then the men's quarterfinals. And yesterday, we had a lot of longboarders coming in talking about how big the conditions were. What can we expect today? Well, I'm hoping we won't have any broken boards today. <laughs> it's dropped off a lot. It's about half the size, but it's really glassy, so I'm excited to see what everyone's going to do with these conditions. What was your favorite moment from the first day yesterday? It's hard to pick one, but try and just give me a general feel. I really like Justin oh, Quintal's nice. wave. Yeah. He, Karina it was Bazanka. so incredibly critical, and on his there. nose ride, you watched his nose lift and then fall, so and he stayed on while so. going into a pier, three, and so, so that was really incredible to watch. Yeah, hopefully fewer broken boards, but the same the amount of action today, you guys. I <laughs> uh, can't wait. Thank you, AJ. Thank you, Kira. And here we go, an overview. Anticipating the start of the first heat of the day, again, an elimination round, Karina Rizonko's heading out. And I like the fact that uh, she's got no leash on, Shannon. Yeah, the conditions have dropped off a lot. I had a chat with a couple of the surfers uh, just before coming here into the booth, and they were all really excited. There's a really good left, according to Kai Takayama, who's on the men's side of the draw, that's just to that south side of where uh, Pure Bowl kind of is sitting. So that could be something that we see the crew sitting on, but it's definitely going to be just a little bit more manageable. And because of that, we're going to get to see these longboarders showcase why they're in the running for world title this year, why they're in the running during stop number two for this year's world longboard tour. Yes, yeah, stop two out of three. And um, back to the to you know the tamer conditions. Hopefully we won't see as many leashes out there. I really like the fact that Karina doesn't even put the option on her boards. No, no leash plug at all. That I'm... I don't know. I'm just as I'm a sucker for this, that style. I love it. It's such a challenging one, though, Kaipo, because yesterday we had really hard conditions and there is the risk. Like, I agree with that statement in a free surf all the time. And when there's maybe not a lot on the line in a contest because it's a fun event, like a standard duct tape invitational. But this is an event running towards a world championship. And so for these surfers, they need to do everything they can to feel comfortable in the lineup, especially when there's, there's the risk that they lose their board out the back, falling on those risky opening nose rides. And then they're swimming for the next five minutes. They're losing time on the clock. So there's a lot of surfers yesterday that would have been surfing with a leash just for that sake of making sure that they could really control themselves in the heat. Yeah. Let's check out the Surfline forecast and what we have on tap and what we anticipate. Three more days of competition here. And we can see that low coming through. That's what created all the waves. Frank the Tank and we're getting some more developing Southern Hemisphere swell now out of the south, southwest direction. That is moving through Saturday. You can take a look at that. Now the angle of that's gonna be a little bit better, a little, a little bit straighter as well as the period is gonna be longer. We can take a look at the periods right there. Swell periods of 14 seconds all the way through. Maybe a little bit of onshore today. Picking up a little more this afternoon, but contestable conditions. And we look at Saturday and Sunday. Drop off for finals day, but still gonna be some surf again. Winds looking onshore, but winds are ever changing. So winds are harder to predict than actual swell. Hoping those onshores stay light. Thank you, Surfline.
for all the information that you provide to us. Yeah, I'm stoked with that forecast. I think uh, there's going to be plenty available for our surfers in the Challenger Series, but we're also going to see those longboarders be able to just rise to the occasion in some really fun conditions over the weekend. Hopefully that wind does stay down. Yesterday afternoon, it didn't pick up nearly as strong as what we had earlier in the week, Kaipo, so that was good. Yeah, yeah, it's so um, hopefully just light on shores. As it looks like the clock is ticking and heat number one of round three is underway. Avalon Gauls, Sophia Kulain and Karina Rizonko again, like Kira said this morning. Top two advancing into round number four, third place eliminated. Yeah, this is a really great heat. So we've got one surfer, Sophia, who managed to find a quarterfinal finish at the Sydney Surf Pro. She's finaled at this level before as well, back in 2020 at the start uh, at Noosa, which was the start of the World Longboard Tour that year. She made it into the finals against her good friend in Kalis Kaliopaa, walked away with a second place. So she's made it through some, some gritty rounds and coming into this year's world title race, for her to have a fifth place result next to her name is already really good. She'll be hoping to kind of advance past that. Avalon Gall had an earlier knockout at Sydney, so she really needs to get a good result here to really be in that conversation. And then Karina Rosanko is in as the Vans wild card this year, but she's very familiar with competition and with this pack of surfers. She came up surfing through events across Southern California, qualified herself for the world tour uh, you know, when she was in her early, uh, in her teenage years and competed at that level for a long time before bowing out to kind of take on that free surfing lifestyle, which she's been able to just really enjoy for the last few years. So it's fun to see Karina back in a jersey. Yeah, a little visit back to the States for Karina Rizonko before she heads back to a nice life that she's made over in Bali, spends a lot of time over there and uh, surfing great waves. We know everything about the island of the gods there and it is gifted with some beautiful waves, but she's gonna have to adapt to Huntington Beach this morning. Yeah, she's uh, surfed plenty of heats out here before, so I think she'll be fine, but very different from uh, the life, like you said, that she's been able to enjoy there in Indo and just kind of set herself up. She's really been the feature of a lot of great edits uh, over the last couple of years as well. She got one of the, I think, one of the best styles coming through in women's longboarding globally in that whole conversation, um, whether they're in this competitive space or not. She's just somebody that's always a real pleasure to, to be able to see in the lineup. And Avalon Gall, she's also a surfer that's been competing on tour for a few years now. She probably is riding one of the longer boards. We can say her takeoff now on this Michael Takayama. Here we go, Avalon Gall is going to get the first ride, gets the nose for five, nice cross step back, cross step back up for another five, some great footwork. A little pivot turn there, heading to the pier continually. Head on a swivel, taking a look to the right, and whether she should redirect or not, making some decisions as she glides into the shore break. There's a redirect to the right, a little tap by the foot, and straightens out, completed ride. That was a nice way for her to start things off. I think in yesterday's heat, for me, it's surprising to see her in this elimination round of round three because she's from California and she just surfs waves like this so often coming out of the Laguna Beach area. And she just couldn't quite find the rhythm. So it's nice to see her get off to an early start. Karina Rosanko going right. Quick trip to the tip for a little five. They're going to have to get into planing position right here, pushing down on the rocker of the forward part of her board to get through that flat section. Does it handedly, looking for a barrel, unable to do that. And uh, she's gonna just have a short swim for her board. And looks like she's a great body surfer as well. Yeah, she'll have it back in no time, especially with these smaller conditions. So like you said, you know, in that leash conversation, losing a board today is not nearly as consequential as it would have been the last couple of days. Avalon gets this quick start. Sets that line, unable to find that nose right until now, but then gets a bit of lift out of it. You can literally see that space between the tip of the nose out of that first nose ride. Second one, a little bit more challenging. And then here, she was just really patient with it. Love this redirect, trying to figure out, you know, if this wave is going to reform, if she should go to the left or to the right. Good bit of footwork and then connects for that final nose ride and maintains a lot of control on the finish. So the judges will appreciate that. And then for Karina, quick steps up to the nose, gets that quick nose ride. Not really locked in, not super critical either. Looking super fun as she comes through to the inside here and, and just bringing that style through, like beautiful, beautiful trim line. And then I love that she just tucks and, and kind of goes for that little speed section on the inside. But out of that, for sure, Avalon will get the better of the exchange. 
So we're waiting for scores, and we're going to see Sophia Kulain on her first ride. Just catching up with her. And a little caught up with the feet, so I'm cer that's certainly going to affect the score. More of a little shuffle, get a little cross step there. But yet to get to the nose on this ride and a disjointed start for Sophia Kulain. Yeah, that'll be one she's going to need to kind of just wash off in an instant. She's still got 24 minutes on the clock, plenty of time, and can just hit that reset button. Nice to kind of get that first wave underway, but she'll want to be wanting to find something, I think, significantly better See, did, after this. Did the leash get in the way here? No, the leash didn't get in the way at all. Here you can see that little stumble, but it has absolutely nothing to do with it. It's just that her front foot got caught up on her heel, which happens, you know, whether you're wearing a leash or not. Um, so that wouldn't have had anything to do with it, but it did just kind of cause her to lose some momentum. That opening nose ride was nice. Like she found a good section. She got to the nose really quickly, but then the flow was really disjointed throughout the rest of it. On the paddle back out, first score in for Avalon Gall as a 5.67. Karina Rizonko still waiting for her score as well as Sophia Kulain. So early advantage to Avalon Gall. Yeah, Avalon out with a, a great start. Yesterday, it was a challenge for a lot of the surfers to find something above that five-point range. And today, I think we're going to see that that scale, or I think we're just going to see a lot of scores start to head up into that better range. As we look at the conditions, uh, we can see that we have a draining tide right now to 8.35 a.m. So we're losing some water for the first few heats. And then after the turn of the tide, we'll be having an incoming tide till 3.37, a uh, two-point tide this morning and we're going to go up to a five point tide this afternoon so about three foot of tide change uh, not a giant coefficient given the uh, normal california tides so we will see slight changes in the playing field throughout the day but looking forward to the back and where we get that tide push uh, perhaps giving us a little bit more swell action yeah that's always a good thing uh this week on low tide it's been pretty challenging especially with the bigger conditions it's obviously a lot steeper out the back that outside kind of sandbar gets really really sucky and then you get that kind of turmoil on the inside as well the high tide's definitely been helping those conditions improve especially on the longboard side. Yesterday afternoon, we saw kind of the better of the waves and the better of the conditions coming through when we had a little more water on, uh, on the break here. So all the scores are in. 5.67 for Avalon Gall, a 2.73 for Sophia Kulain, and a three-point ride for Karina Rizonko. It's a good place to start from. Both Keeney and Sophia will be looking to replace that score line. And you can see them trying to find their positioning in the lineup. They've headed up to that bank that Kai Takayama was talking about before. Kai is actually Avalon's uh, boyfriend, and he's probably given her a little bit of a spot for where she should be sitting in the lineup, riding that giant Michael Takayama. And so you can see the women just paddling them themselves over, looking for those better lefts, which could be the pick for this morning. Well... We got Louisa on the athlete deck right now, and she's been scanning the vibe out there. What's going on, Louisa? That's right, guys. It's always so much fun to be here right in the morning. I was talking to Karina Rizunku right before she was in the water. I was talking to Sarah's, which is Sophia Skulhane's mom. She's been in the water since 5.45 just to feel the ocean. Taylor Jensen's right behind me, and I was like picking their brain about the conditions today, and they're all saying the same thing. You know, the ocean... It's a little bit more difficult today because the tide is really low. It's closing a lot. And Taylor was saying, like, he's super excited to go in the water a little after because it's going to get better. But definitely, we're not going to see boards breaking today. But let's see what's going to happen. All right. Thank you, Louisa. Louisa on the scene, always ready to report for us on, on the vibe and what's going out there and a great part of our commentary team. We're down to 20 minutes. And Avalon Gall out in the lead and has priority. You can see with the conditions, it's definitely glassy, but there's so much morning sickness on it today, Kaipo, which is still kind of adding just those little bumps on the face of the wave and maybe making it a little challenging to read the lineup right now as well. Just these early mornings, it's a bit hazy today. How familiar do you think the surfers are with, this, with the priority system? Oh, so familiar. 
they've been surfing. Priorities has been has been part of the Longboard World Tour for many, many years. Um, that changes when you go down to club events or for actual duct tape invitationals, where it is just kind of a, a pick of some of the best uh, longboarders in the world. Mm -hmm. But for this event, running as part of the WLT, it's all WSL rules. And these surfers have all been surfing uh, across events like that. Sophia probably with the least amount of experience, but just because she hasn't been competing for as long as everybody else. And there she goes. So looking to get more flow in the second ride, Sophia Kulain cutting through the water. Just a trim. Cross steps back. Steepens up on the inside where she gets a nice five and is able to, oh, I was just gonna be, say, able to avoid the crunch of the shore break, but he got the best of Sophia. Oh, that's such a bummer just for that finish. That was such a nice nose ride. You could really see that, that wave steeping up on the inside section. I feel like that's a really good thing for her, even though she fell on the finish, to find a wave like that. Because for her, for both Sophia Colain and for Avalon Gull, they just couldn't find any rhythm in their heats yesterday. And they were both seated through to that round two, so they didn't have that round one uh, to make it through, where Karina had had won her round one heat and then fell out in her round two. So for this, this will be the best wave that Sophia's had in competition so far this week here at the south side. Finding that little, uh, you know, bit of footwork up to the nose for the start. And then this section, she just finds that little reform on the right. And it's such a good wave after that nice, smooth trim line that Michael Takayama looking really cruisy. And that's a really nice nose ride. Not crazy long, but just perfectly in the section. Gets a little bit caught up on that rail, which is also really common with longboarding because there's just so much rail to deal with. Uh, just a quick up and out from Karina Rosonko. Karina Vans team rider and um, gosh, just uh, one of the stylish, more stylish surfers that I've seen uh, on uh, on and about the uh, longboard tour. And I don't, I don't know if she's a full-time on the longboard tour. I think she came in here as a wild card, but uh, just ha that great style that she has is welcome. Oh, yeah. I mean, she used to be a fan favorite on the longboard tour, took a step away from it, I want to say, in about 2018, 2017, 2018, just to focus on free surfing and to walk away from that competitive scene. She's still been doing lots of duct tapes in the mix of it. Um, but, yeah, it's so much fun to have her in as the Vans wild card for this event. And here she goes. A lovely switch stance and graceful style of Karina Rosonko. Planes through there and a little caught up as the waves kind of piggyback on each other in the shore break. Scratching into this one was Avalon Gall and she'll lose priority with that. Yeah, that's a bummer. That uh, It didn't look like that wave was going to do any good anyways. It was really shutting down quickly, but that's going to hand priority to Sophia. We're still waiting for that score to come through for last of Sophia, last of Karina as well. Do you think priority is going to come into play at all today in today's competition? Yeah, I think it definitely will. Um, maybe back, you know, down to those last 10 to 5 minutes in a heat, uh, we'll start to see that priority really being used. Sophia, a nice hang five and straightens out there. A little getting caught up on the rail here, trying to make the connection to the inside, which she should have no problem doing. Getting into a little planing position mid-board. And nothing uh, on offer on the inside there. Yeah, I didn't get too much work done on the inside. That was a nice uh, start to that wave. We're still waiting for her previous score to come through. It looks like the judges are in favor of it, which I really like. I thought it was very well surfed, had a nice critical nose right on the finishing section as well. It's kind of consistent this morning. There's plenty of waves around. Well, that's been the good news. It's been the theme all, all week is that we had that hurricane swell, which in that shorter period for sure is going to be consistent. It's nice to see the underlay of that hurricane swell from Frank, but now a little bit of that gr longer period ground swell. And we got a score in for Sophia Kulain on previous ride, a 6.23 Sophia goes to the lead. Solid. That's a really good score for her. And I think for young Sophia, she's only about 15, 16 years old. This is going to be a huge confidence boost because she hasn't been able to find a score like that yet. And so for her to now be taking the lead and have just that 2.73 to improve on is going to be really good. And Kaipo, I know you live in town. 
You surf a longboard occasionally. What are you usually riding? I got, well, I'm going to get back to that. I'll let you talk over this replay. So nice quick tap to the nose. This isn't going to come in nearly as high as that 6.23, but again, it's her just kind of feeling that rhythm. Just bogs the rail a little bit there, like maintains control, and she's able to find that trim line coming through to the inside. But that wave just died out. Yeah. Um, one of the great things about longboarding, of course, is that they're riding boards over nine feet, most of them in that kind of nine four to nine eight range. And so they're just going to be able to find that trim line really well. Avalon just took off on probably the set of the heat so far. Nice nose ride to start. Let's see if she's able to hang on to it here. You can tell how bumpy it is. She usually rides something around 9.8. She rides one of the bigger boards on the way to the drop, possibly the biggest. That was a nice redirection as well with the rail. It's a good looking wave. And just kick off right there on the sand. All right. Well, she goes to reset. You're asking me about um, my, my favorite Yeah, what do you ride? Board? What do you normally ride when you ride a longboard? I, uh, my favorite, I have a number of them, but my favorite is a 910 Robert August wingnut model. It has a beautiful um, wood tail block. It's Volan glass, so it's that old greenish boat glass. It's pretty heavy. I love it, and I never wear a leash on it. Awesome. That's great. I love hearing that you're riding a wingnut model. Wingnut's been a... a man, such an important part of longboarding for pretty much all of time. Yeah, come down here, Huntington Beach. We, Robert, we want to see you. We're going to take a break, and I'm going to make a call to Wingnut, see if we can get him over here to the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. I'll let you know on the other side of this break. The Vans U.S. Open of Surfing is brought to you by Vans, off the wall since 66. By Pacifico, official beer of the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. Live life anchors up. By Shiseido, official sunscreen of the World Surf League. By Foo Wax, official surf wax of the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. And by Sambazon. Bringing you the delicious powers of acai every day. The official acai of the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. Welcome back to the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. Yeah, here, Southside Huntington Pier. I'm Kaipo, joined by Shannon Hughes to talk you through this morning's action. And out in the water, we have Avalon Gall in the lead. Here we go, Karina Rizonko. With some great footwork there. And a little warbly inside section, just dealing with a little of the morning sickness that we're seeing here. But still, oh, I like this technique right there. Hopping on the middle of the board, pressing down that rocker to plane through that area, but gets to the inside, uh, but unable to find anything more on the inside. 
Yeah, she's having so much fun out there, though. She's had a smile on her face every single way she takes off on. She only got small scores on the board, um, but I think she's just having an absolute blast. Sophia, oh, she's dropped down into that second place position. And Sophia, ha you know, it really, um, maybe with the tide right now, it seems like it's a little difficult for, for our surfers. Yeah, with that low tide, so it's currently 7.55 a.m. We're just off of low tide. That outside section is going to shut down and have more closeouts than what we're going to see later in the day. Yeah. After we turn that 8.35 mark, then we'll see uh, incoming tide. But, you know, we're talking about uh, Wingnut, and I said going to the commercial break, hey, I'm going to check in with him, see what, see, see what Wingnut's, because I wanted him to come down and join us on the broadcast. But it looks like he's on a boat. Um, about to anchor at R Witch's Rock right now in uh, Costa Rica. As we see Avalon Gall, our heat leader, really smooth, great use of the entire board. Nice footwork with the cross steps. Hits a little dead section there, but got some work done on the outside. Robert Weaver, always on a boat somewhere out there, teaching some cool people how to surf. And... Yeah, Wingnut's honestly probably the reason that we have competitive longboarding at the WSL still. I think mm -hmm. he's been so integral in making that conversation happen over so many years. Mm -hmm. um, competing as well as then hosting our commentary panel alongside Sam Bleakley for a long time. They're the two that brought me into this whole conversation as well. And he just has such a good understanding of what, what uh, I think longboarding needs as a culture and as a community. So it's always a shame when we don't get to have his presence at these events. But I'm sure he's scoring some good waves and enjoying some warm, warm water. Apparently the water here cooled down. I don't know if you've been out there at all this week, Wingna. It's been so busy that I haven't actually surfed since before the event started. But a couple of the surfers were telling me that the water temp dropped significantly yesterday. Yeah, sometimes uh, you get that upwelling, right? And uh, it, that we may have, that might be the result. Um, and you know what? Well, this is what this is what Wingnut has to say, because now we're just in text communication. He says uh, he's stoked to see everyone giving 100 percent. And he's also likes the fact that people are shooting the pier just like back in the day. I love it as well. We saw some crazy surfing from Justin Quintal yesterday, like Kira Seal, uh, our new tour manager for the Longboard Tour, was mentioning as her highlight of yesterday. That guy is crazy. Oh, and, and, big announcement for everyone, it's Wingnut's birthday. Happy what? birthday, Happy Robert birthday, Wingnut Weaver. <laughs> uh. This is great. And, you know, if anyone knows Wingnut, like, once you start him talking, uh, even if it's via text, uh, it's, it's rapid fire. So messages are coming through. You got to watch out when you get Wingnut and Waxhead together in a room. Yeah. Knowledge for... <laughs> Years uh, uh, and years oh. and years. I was going to say it was a party, but yeah, maybe <laughs> knowledge too. Six minutes and 30 seconds on the countdown. Okay, so in this current heat, Avalon, the local Southern Cali California surfer, both Avalon and Karina being from Southern California, but Avalon from Laguna Beach, surfs little beaches around here often enough, loves to head down to Sano. She's taking the lead. Sophia's into second with priority. And Karina's just been struggling to find herself with a way with some good scoring potential. She's got the capabilities. Like, I've seen her drop scores in that excellent range in competition like this. Um, but this morning, her wave selection's just been a little bit off um, as far as finding something with that good outside critical section. Yeah, Karina with that, needing, that need. Uh, gosh, how's, how's she going to get that, Shannon? That's a pretty big number, 6.73. It would be the highest score of the heat so far. So I'm looking, Sophia dropped in that 6.23, which had a good outside section, really good footwork. And then she had that super critical hang five on the inside. Um, she kind of fell at the end of it, but it was after she'd already completed the nose ride. And it was then a second maneuver of a little re-entry that she fell on. So I love that the judges took note of that and rewarded her for that nose ride on the inside. And I think if Karina wants to be back in this conversation right now to be advancing through, that's what she's going to need to look for. A way that's going to give her a good nose ride out the back. And the judges, Kaipo, have been very clear with the scores they're throwing down this week. Same that we've seen in the Challenger series. They're rewarding that similar critical section out the back for the longboard tour. So she really needs to get herself on a good one out the back and then connect to the inside. Talk us through this heat recap. Avalon, she's currently sitting in the lead. She started out with that early ride 
got those couple of nose rides. That second one was a little sticky, which is maybe why this ride didn't go into that six point plus range. The judges just docking it slightly. And then for Sophia, she found herself with the highest score so far. That was a critical, it's a smaller wave, only around kind of waist high, but a nice critical section. She had a lot of speed coming out of that first nose ride. And then she found that trim point here and just put that board in a perfect place on the wave. And this is that nose ride I've been talking about where she gets that little bit of distance, nice and critical, locked in the pocket. Judges rewarding the finish of it and then the fall afterward just uh, isn't really factored in. And then Avalon with the answer back here. This is her second highest score of that 5.77. That was the biggest wave of the heat. Good critical nose right out the back. Then just struggled to really find anything huge to complete it with to match what we saw from Sophia. And I think that's kind of where the judges are adjusting things a little bit from what we saw yesterday. Sophia getting the highest score in this because she got that outside critical section and found another section on the inside. Um, we could see surfers getting really good scores for just that outside section. This happened during the recap. Karina got on a wave. All right, nice footwork. Cruzy style goes for that switch stance. And she just has such perfect placement of her feet all the time. Great control. She's put herself up into that top half, given a little bit of a, a frustrated moment there. She looks like Tinkerbell when she does that. Um, I think had she been able to maybe come off that starting nose right a little sooner, she could have possibly found that trim line. But also sometimes finding that trim line through really dead sections like this, especially at a beach break or in Huntington, or even just in California, the waves are generally a little bit softer. That has to do with equipment. And certain surfers in the draw this week are going to be riding equipment that really handle those soft sections easily. Where other surfers are riding equipment, and I had a look at, at Karina's equipment this morning, that really thrive when they're in the pocket. Mm -hmm. So for her, she's going to struggle to make those connections on those soft sections where the boards that both Avalon and Sophia are riding, they're from the same shaper and they're really similar styles. They're going to have no problem cutting through those dead sections while also connecting with the pocket. And why, why is that? They just have a little bit of a, a flatter bottom to them, a little bit more stretched out, where Karina's has that roll bottom in that back third, a little bit of hips um, as well in that back third, which makes it really nice. Again, when it gets in the pocket, it really sticks in for those nose rides really well. And it also makes for a really good... Uh, rail board like I love the turns that I've been seeing from Karina in this heat but having that roll bottom is almost like putting something with a little bit of a break on it so if you hit a dead section that roll bottom is just going to kind of stall out a little bit where there's not going to be that roll bottom or as intensive one on the boards that both Avalon and Sophia are riding and so they're just going to have that trim line a little bit easier Sophia has priority and she executes on that just gets a little trim there before the wave closes out, takes a look behind and uh, seeing if there's more opportunity maybe for Karina. But now just searching to get up to the nose, wants to better a four point ride. Nice little off the top on the inside. And we'll see if she got that done. I like that finishing maneuver. The Hawaiian crew all from Waikiki there cheering her on. It's been really fun to see that Waikiki pack uh, just start to dominate at this level of competition. There's her mom there wearing the sunglasses, Sarah with the cap on, feeling happy. And we do have a small score coming through for Sophia. This one's not gonna factor in mostly because she didn't get to the nose. And that's an essential part of the criteria is the variety and making sure that that surfers use the entire length of the board. So she kind of almost got there and then she decides to pedal back and she goes for a really cool, that was a really good turn to finish off with. But if she'd been able to connect it with a nose ride, that's where we would have seen some good scores. This happened during the replay. Oh, that was also a heavy section. So Karina changing up her strategy just a little bit. That's the biggest wave that she's taken off on in this heat with probably the most uh, hectic section out the back but it just closed down, and I think that's just due to that, that low tide. And our heat leader, Avalon, just up and out. So the clock's ticking down, and we only have 15 seconds, so chances are likely that the situation will not change as we catch up with Karina Rizonko. Maybe uh, I'm, I gave Karina writing her off a little bit early because maybe she can get something done on the inside here. Planes again through that inside section redirects maybe an opportunity for Karina Rizonko and has to throw it away in the shore break 
That was unfortunate. Yeah, that's not going to get her to the score, but again, keeping that smile on her face. And I think it's just been fun for her to be back in the jersey with some of the competitors that she doesn't typically surf with. Um, great work from Avalon and Sophia to find some rhythm because they really needed that. Avalon Gall and Sophia Kulain on to round number four. Hey, we're going to miss Korea, Karina Rizonko, and we don't want to miss you, so stick around. We're going to be back with more from the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. Check us out, guys. Come check us out. Come check out our U.S. Open gear. All right, here we got custom shoes and custom shirts today. surfer this morning at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. We got duct tape all day today and uh, Avalon not having to worry because she's advanced on into round four for the women. This is round three, heat number two out in the water. Zoe Gaspron in the red jersey, Tully White in the blue jersey and Sally Cohen out there in white. I'm Kaipo joined by Sh Shannon Hughes, and uh, we're in second heat of the day. Your thoughts on this heat? Oh, I absolutely love it. Sally, Zoe, and Tully. Tully, it's a surprise to see her in the elimination round right now. She walked away with a semifinal finish at home at the Sydney Surf Pro. Kaipo, you and I were both there to call the action, which was really fun. And this is like her bread and butter, surfing fun beach breaks. So for her, it's surprising to see that she's already in that elimination round, coming off of such a good semifinal finish at home in similar conditions. Well, knowing beach breaks is going to be a skill set that's going to work well for Tully White. She's just got her first start. Only a couple of fractional scores for the surfers so far. So that's going to be the first meaningful number. Zoe. And the uh, quick section in front of her. We'll see if she sticks with this. She's going to have to get the work done in the shore break. Could be a good section that opens up in front of her right here. Steeper shore break, maybe giving her an opportunity for a nose ride. She's actually going to just do a little float right there to straighten out. And finishes right on the beach. Yeah, again, a really good finish, similar to that last one I think that we saw of Sophia. 
didn't get a nose right out the back, so the judges are going to definitely dock the points because of that. But I like that she's already able to feel kind of that closeout section on the finish. So that's a really important part of longboarding. It's not a nose riding contest. And I think so often we kind of think of longboarding in that context where we're like, okay, go to the nose. All you want to do is go to the nose. We actually want to have that variety and well-roundedness in surfing. Yeah. So we want to use that tip to the tail. That but was if you don't get to the nose, you're not fulfilling all of the criteria in, exactly. in, in, in the book. You know, as we're looking at traditional longboarding is really what we're trying to emphasize here. So nose riding is a, clearly a part of traditional no, uh, longboarding. Oh, yeah, 100%. Like, you can't get a score that's in that kind of average to good range without riding the nose. So for there, like, Zoe's not going to get a great score. But for her to kind of get that feeling of that closeout shore break, that's going to be a good thing for her to know that she can get those good turns in on the finish. Here's Sally Cohen. A little roller coaster outside. And searching the midsection for a connection into the shore break and is unable to make that connection. Sally coming out of Oahu. It's great to see her get the call up um, for this event with some other surfers pulling out. Taking a look at this replay from her now, that was a really nice section to start off with. She does that work to try and get to the nose, but it just seems like a, a, the last few waves, Kaipo, we've seen the same thing where each of the women have tried to force that nose right at the start, but because of that low tide, it's really challenging and really fast, and it just shuts down really quickly. So nice control from her demonstrated throughout. Um, you can see some of that style and that grace coming through. But wave selection is going to be really important. And I think I didn't realize how important wave selection would be this morning, especially coming into that low tide. But now that we're seeing things shape up, it looks pretty difficult. Tully looking left and just kicking out than like what she saw in front of her. So she's going to maintain that outside position. 23 minutes, 30 seconds on the countdown. and waiting for scores. Let's take a look um, at our judging criteria, Shannon. Yeah. Controlled maneuvers in a critical section wave and utilizing the entire board using traditional longboard surfing. Absolutely, and style, flow, grace are the words that we've replaced with from a shortboard criteria of speed, power, flow. Mm -hmm. Super important and kind of all encompassing. So we want to be able to do critical maneuvers, like you said, in that critical section of the wave, which means really good nose rides in a really critical section, not nose rides out on the flats or out on the shoulder, as well as really good turns right there in the curl, in the pocket, and really utilizing the entire board, which means it's not a nose riding contest, but it's also not just a tail surfing contest. Yeah, and but you know, the term traditional longboard surfing and the use of a leash in a way, seems an oxymoron to me, Chen. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's all in the style of how you ride the board. Has I don't think that it has really much to do with anything else that comes into that conversation. It's just the approach that you have when surfing the board. Um, that's really what we're focusing on. And you can do that on a couple of different types of boards, but you'll see most of the boards have a similar style to them. And the definition, I mean, also style flow and grace, what how do we quantify grace? Grace is kind of just a feeling. I think um, you can see that grace sort of coming through in, in Zoe surfing right here, that kind of quiet upper body. She has a lot of speed coming through the finish of that wave, so that was a little bit hard maybe to keep grace in the conversation. But really just making the difficult look easy. So making stuff that is actually extremely difficult that the average surfer would never be able to perform paddling out on a longboard like this, but making it look like it's the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. I'm going to get off the leash thing, and sorry sorry to keep on talking about it, but I've just come from generations of surfers since before the leash, and I think like a lot of the classics and a lot of the greats and the legends never had one on. That's so true, but I think in that conversation as we take a look at this, Replay here from Zoe. So again, nice trim line. That board's looking really good under her feet. She also is one of those surfers that just didn't find any momentum in the right waves maybe in her heat yesterday. She was charging on some really crazy left straight into the pier. Um, but for her, she's going to really want to reset from what she had yesterday. I think that conversation, it's kind of like it in competition. Oh, look at that. Hang 10. Wow. Well, there you go. Tully White's 
are going to start breaking away from the pack with nose riding like that. She's putting together an excellent ride. Again, planing through that little gutter section where the wave goes dead on the inside. Gets nice and steep and straightens out. No problem. You know, incomplete there. She's going to do a short swim, but she got, did some beautiful nose riding on the outside. Yeah, that was a really, really good wave. I think for me, thinking of that leash conversation, I totally understand it when it's a free surf or when you're riding a wave that's not going to have the consequence of badly damaging your board. As we look at this replay here from Tully White, that's a perfect hang 10, nice critical section, find some acceleration out of it as well, pedals back so well, nice cross steps, and then redirects herself to this inside section. Nice use of the rail as well, keeping that body posture nice and quiet at the top while using kind of hips down. Finds that little tap to the nose to finish. Not sure where the judges will go with that as far as, you know, she didn't get that little down carving complete. I think she pedaled off of the nose and would, that would be a completed maneuver. But here, the surfers with the consequence on the line, there is the risk that a board flies into the pier. They damage their equipment. And then now, as far as being a competitor in the lineup, they don't have that equipment that they can use. They're using a borrowed board, something like that, or into a backup board. It, to me, in this conversation, it's the same thing as telling all the short boarders the last few days, you've got to paddle out there without a leash on. And but, if you don't I fall, mean, you can hold on to your, have, uh, yeah, you can we, hold on to your we'll, board. We'll go back and forth on this, but short boarding doesn't have traditional in, 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 the, in, criteria. in the criteria. I understand what you're saying. So that, that word is clearly in the criteria. And so that's, that's just why I'm asking. But I understand also, you know, safety uh, as well as protecting your equipment. I totally understand that. So scores, man, totally nailed it on that one. A 6.33, so they rewarded that finishing maneuver as well. If she'd been able to kind of get that little redirect under the lip to finish on the sand, that would have been really good. Yeah, game changer. As we, as we uh, first saw that start out, we saw that, um, you know, we knew already she was on her way to a great score from that outside nose ride. And so Tully White goes to the lead. Zoe Gosprone in second place, holding down priority. Sally Cohen is actually in the danger zone, uh, but just needs a 3.11 to move into that second place. Here comes Sally. And nice little tap on the five. Maintains herself through a little bit of warble and water as the mixed up wave right next to the pier with a lot of different refractions. She has to navigate through that section little glide there but does not make the shore break 3.11 we'll see if that was enough of the score let's hear from avalon golf she won the first heat avalon yesterday you were the last heat today yeah. you're the first <laughs> how did you adjust the you know the gear to go in the water today well i am not a morning person at all so it's a little bit of a struggle to get up but um well, it's totally different. Like, it's glassy and, like, low tide. And it's dropped so much since yesterday. And, like, honestly, a little bit scary trying to, like, paddle through the pier and stuff yesterday. Yeah. But it was really fun. And you were telling me it's really cold, too? Yeah, it was pretty cold this morning, for sure. Yeah. Does that, you know, affect your surfing somehow or no? I mean, I live in California, so I'm kind of used to wearing wetsuits. But, um... Yeah, I don't, not necessarily, I don't think so. Yesterday we saw so many boards breaking and I was just looking at your board. Do you want to talk a little bit about your board? Because it's beautiful, guys. If you didn't have a chance to take a look, it's green and has like yellow flowers, super feminine. And you were just telling me who shaped it and like how you're writing it. Yeah, uh, Michael Takayama shaped it and it's my favorite board. I absolutely love it. Nose rides good, turns good. It's all around like my favorite board. <laughs> Amazing. How are you getting ready for the next heat now? Um, I think that girls are off for the day. I don't think we surf until tomorrow. Okay. But... See? Yeah. That's <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't sure if we were going to extend a day, but here we go. Congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you guys. <laughs> Ah, uh, beautiful board. I love the, the, the shot of that Michael Takayama surfboard. Um, and uh, just, it, and uh, that was talked through lineage of surfing, the Takayamas, uh, you know, original, originally from Kaka'ako on the island of Oahu, south shore of Oahu, of course, uh, nine uh, um, in, the, her gra in the grandfather's family, uh, Lawrence being the eldest, of course, Donald Takayama, not just a surfer and a shaper and an innovator, 
Um, and that tradition continues when you have this family lineage. That was a um, beautiful board, Michael Takayama. Let's see if we can see some beautiful surfing here from Zoe Gosbrom. A little late there, so no problem. Uh, but what did happen, it actually is maybe a little bit of a concern for Zoe Gosbrom because during that interview, the score came in for Sally Cohen at 3.17, and Sally's in second place. So now Zoe's in the hot seat looking for a 2.74 to get into second place. 15 minutes on the clock, so halfway through. Tully did really good to get that 6.33, and that puts like a solid requirement, like you said, that 6.0 onto Sally. Zoe's right in that conversation still, so it's really kind of that battle for second at the moment, especially if Tully starts to find that rhythm. She's lethal in conditions like this. Um, we saw her at Manly getting some really high scores and kind of also that morning sickness, low tide. I mean, Manly had so many of those waves that were like shutting down on the back. If surfers could run up to the nose, get a quick nose ride, find that full reform all the way into the inside with a lot of downtime in the middle. So I think Tolly's totally just going to run away with this one. All right. Well, we'll see if Zoe can uh, wait. We're going to wait right now because there might be a wave. I was going to throw the break, but you know what? We're going to keep here with action. And Sally goes up and kicks out. That's not going to change the situation. More waves out the back. And our heat leader, Tully White, on the paddle here. Let's see what she has. Taps the nose on the outside. Quick feet to get up there. And graceful cross steps now just moving through this midsection of the wave and just utilizing some footwork with style and grace. Tully White steepens up on the inside and a little floating maneuver for a completion. So likely to better her scoreline with that last performance. What do you think, Shannon? Yeah, that was a beautiful wave. Um, again, just showing that she feels really comfortable. Checks that leap, that fin. I do wonder, it, those surfers kind of finishing off on the inside section, it goes so shallow so quickly, and they most of them have fins in that 10 inch range. Some a little bit hot, uh, longer, some a little bit shorter by a quarter or half an inch. Um, for this one, though, that was a really nice one. So just gets a quick tap to the nose, but finds it in that difficult section. I love that little down carve under the lip as well. And then finds this trim line nice and easy. Little movement of her feet there just to keep that board in the right spot and start lining it up here for this inside section. And just starts to get that little redirect on. Really patient as well, not forcing anything. That's so much of what traditional longboarding is about. It's that style and that grace coming through. So she's not forcing any of those maneuvers. Doesn't have so much to do with the type of equipment she's riding or anything, but it just has to do with the style and her approach on that wave. So that was a good one. 4.83 drops for Tully White. Zoe Gosbrun in the hot seat. Can Zoe come back? We'll find out right after these messages.
Here we go on the beach here at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. Hey, guest appearance by Jamie O'Brien. He's got a watchful eye and he's in the camp of Sally Cohen. And Sally currently in second place and advancing position. So that's some good news for Sally and some support from Jamie. But here's our heat leader, Tully White. And Tully just bailing off the board and uh, grabs it in a traditional sense in that she had to straighten out, just didn't kick the board out in front of her. Here we go with Zoe Gasparon looking for a score and is able to finish that wave. Didn't see the beginning of that wave. Gasparon looking for a 2.74 to take over that second and advancing position from Sally Cohen. Zoe's had a crazy few days. So a few days ago, she had the rail of her surfboard connect with her ribs. Ooh, that There's a hurt. possibility that she has a cracked rib right now, but she's toughing it out. Paddling out for her heat yesterday was definitely a little bit questionable on how she was going to be feeling, if she was going to be feeling okay to paddle, because she hasn't been able to surf for a few days, just to try and rest and make sure she was okay for competition. Oh, I can tell you. Matt, we'll take a look here. So she did a little... Just a whitewater paddle in here, so whoosh. That is um, gonna come under her requirement. Just before where she took off, didn't get outside maneuver. She just got a 2.23 for this, but you know, surfing through an injury like that, Shannon, that's really tough. I I've broken my ribs a number of times. And, Ouch. and <laughs> it, it, ta it takes a, yeah, a number of times. Um, and it takes a long time. When you lay on your board, it's, it's like painful. And a lot of times, you know, even walking around and, and doing everything else in life, when you're healing, it feels okay, but as soon as you lay on that board, man, it is, depends on where you break your ribs, yeah. Oh, so that's some bad talk. Let's talk about some good stuff. Here's all the good stuff happening here. Friday, August 5th, we got the Vans Retail Store. It's open, the street market, with multiple booths open till 4 p.m. local time. Come down, take advantage of the workshops that we have. The Van Doren Village is always a nice place to visit. And uh, you want to ride some duct tape festival boards? Well, we've got demos for you 9 to 4 p.m. today. And you want to see how a board is built. A lot of you don't know how a board is built. we got the live shaping and glassing on the beach, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And I hope to have enough of a break to get in there and maybe I can mow away on a blank and make a... Um, some type of creation. I don't know if they're what gonna give me make? the okay. Hmm? What would you make? Uh, I w you know what? I would make Do you a- have some creative spark right now? Yeah, well, I would, my creative spark right now would be a pretty exaggerated bonzer bottom. Ooh. Um, yeah, Duncan and Malcolm Campbell uh, creating those bonzers. And they were really the forerunner to the thruster. So in, in, in surf history, a lot of people give, you know, the whole thruster thing to Simon Anderson, which he, did, which he deserves 100%. But there were three fin surfboards previous to the thruster in those bonzer designs, as well as when you look at a bonzer bottom, just that exaggerated double concave is something that carries on now. Of course, we have a much slighter double concave in shortboards, um, but that exaggerated double concave, you know, really kind of sparked the idea of lift on the bottom of a surfboard. And what kind of wave would you want to be surfing that in? A bonzer? Um, you know where, where people ride a lot of bonzers and where I would love to ride a bonzer and love to return to is um, Pavones in Ooh. Costa Rica where you have a nice. long wave and then you can take advantage of all that lift and glide that you get on that bonzer bottom. And, and it was, I used to, I saw, like, last time I was down there, I saw a lot of guys riding five fin bonzers. Okay. Yeah. Fun. I like that. Good little bit of insight. Tully White surfs a lot of different boards. She's a really good kind of like mid-length surfer now, mm -hmm. um, especially when you get those big swells that hit that Sydney coastline mm -hmm. and you kind of have to charge. Like you pretty much can't ride a long board because it's just too big. You can't get boards out the back, all sorts. And she's dropped in some really cool footage over the last year or two of her riding some different equipment like that, which is really cool. I think that's something that you've probably noticed about so many of the longboard crew is their, their love for the di diversity of a surfboard. Mm -hmm. riding longboards as often as they can, but the conditions are just not always conducive for it. So they're typically finding something different, whether it's long single fins, long twin fins, um, all sorts of different fishes and things to kind of make them even more well-rounded surfers. Yeah, yeah, and I love that. I love the, the variety um, of equipment and, and really a great attitude to pretty much, you know, the, the ride everything, 
movement that we've seen in the last, uh, I'm going to say about 15 years in surfing. So uh, I can appreciate that. Do you think it's harder to go from a long board to a short board or a short board to a long board? That's a challenge. So personally for me, I struggle riding short boards because I grew up only ever riding long boards. I started, short board, I, sorry, I started surfing when I was in my teen years, like maybe 13, 14 years old, and only ever rode like an eight foot was my first board. And graduated up to a nine foot as I got a little bit taller. From there, I didn't really start surfing anything smaller than like a nine two or something until I was in my 20s. And it's been a real struggle to kind of go down inside. I think just because I'm used to a really easy paddle, my approach is a little bit slower, as you'll see so many of these surfers in the heats today. It's a real cruisy kind of takeoff mode. It's so different than serving something where you've really got to dig in and you've got to be kind of up and going really quick in the pocket. Um, but saying that, a lot of these surfers that surf really well on longboards and kind of grow up that way, then their style and their traditional approach to surfing, which could be done on any type of board, any type of craft, they are able to translate that into smaller boards, whether it's mid lengths down to fishes, down to short boards. I think I noticed a struggle, and maybe it just depends on style and people's approaches, in people that grew up on a real standard shortboard, full thruster, wanting to just be a shortboarder. They struggle with that style element of maybe controlling and feeling comfortable on bigger equipment, whether it's graduating to mid lengths or graduating to longboards. Okay. What do you think about it? I, I mean, you came from kind of the opposite background, maybe? No, I just, I started, I, my father was a beach boy in Waikiki. I started on a longboard, but then I kind of, it was, so it, it's really the best place to start. It's the most stable platform. It's the best way to learn. Oh, definitely. From like is, basics, is basics. on a longboard and then, you know, evolved into shortboarding. Um, but here we go with our heat leader, Tully White, again, gets up into the nose and just taps it there. And it's going to be no problem for Tully because she's looking really strong in this heat. Um, I really think the battle in this heat's going to be for second place. And Tully, you, you said, as we see her, just, just, just the, grace, the grace and the footwork of Tully White before she ends up over there. Is, um, it was a surprise to see her in this elimination round. And that probably was a one-off because she's just dominated in this heat. Yeah, she's just been so strong. And again, those conditions today, just a little bit more manageable. It's going to get so much more favorable as well as we have that high tide start to push after 9 o'clock. Um, taking a look at the draw with Tully's heat yesterday, she bowed out in third place between Soleil Erico and Caitlin Mickelson, which is a really interesting fact because both of those girls, California, Caitlin, extremely good coming out of that San Clemente to Oceanside region, really good in waves like this, as well as Soleil Erico. So all of them struggled a little bit. There wasn't any high scores, but totally got the worst of it. Yeah, and uh, we already had one event in the books, and that leads to our leaderboard coming into this event. Honolulu Bloomfield currently first on the leaderboard. Uh, Chloe Kalman with that runner-up finish in Manly, Sole Erico. You can see Tully White, number three on the current rankings coming in. Uh, so Tully is uh, dodging a bullet here because she doesn't want to have, you know, an elimination round uh, defeat when she's number three on the leaderboard. Yeah, she really wants to keep herself in that running. Um, heading into Malibu, it's going to be the best of these first two events that stays. So she can increase on a, on a third place result. That's going to be really good, obviously, for those points, getting a second or a win. But even so, holding on to a third place finish is really, really solid for Tully. And a big point to make is when we come to the World Championships in Malibu, we double the points. So we're guaranteed for the men and the women to crown a champion at Malibu at the final event of the year because it, it's impossible, it's mathematically impossible for anyone to win that title before Malibu. Exactly, and that's just something where they wanted to structure it so that we can crown the world champion in a really traditional longboarding wave. So another point to that conversation is that right now, these surfers are not surfing a traditional longboard wave. They're surfing a closeout beach break here in Huntington, which has some fun potential, but it's very different from surfing a Waikiki, from surfing a Malibu. So once you get to see these surfers actually perform in a wave that was built for traditional longboarding, like Malibu, like what we got to see last year when Honolulu won her world title, her third. You're going to see surfers that are riding very different equipment, maybe, to what some of them are paddling out on right now. Probably no one will be wearing leashes because that wave facilitates that as well. And their style of surfing will really be able to perform in that traditional manner. Yeah, so that's a great happening. That's October this year, October 3rd through 13th. 
um, for our World Longboard Championships. But this is the road to a world title. You got to keep on performing in these first two events. And Tully White did just that. Here we go. Sally Cohen currently in second place. Wants to secure that second place. And that wave quickly closes out. So Sally takes this one in. She I believe she did have priority over Zoe Gasparon. So she did utilize that priority. Um, and that was some smart heat surfing. Yeah, that was really smart heat surfing. Again, she's a really solid competitor, which is why she got the call up um, with somebody else pulling out of the draw. We've got a few surfers kind of that have gotten in that way for this week. We had a couple different surfers that performed uh, at Manly at the Sydney Surf Pro. We had Kira Molnar. Uh, we had Francesca from Italy. A couple of surfers that are not in the draw here. Um, and so it's really great to see Sally advancing through. Unfortunate to see Zoe go down with that rib injury. Really hope that she's able to now rest and heal yeah. up but she finished out in a great position on the world tour last year she had that semi-final finish at malibu which was really exciting to see so we're going to see a whole lot more of her later yeah. this year we we certainly will well tully white's on to the next round as well as sally cohen we're going to take a break when we come back the men will be in the water and chris and mitch will be on the set Ladies and gentlemen, surf fans from all over the world, you're watching the Vans Duct Tape Invitational, just a part of the Vans US Open of Surfing, the largest action sports festival on the planet. And I don't think there's any other planets where there's a larger festival, so you can say in the universe. Chris Cote here with Mitchell Salazar. Good morning, Mitch. Welcome back to Huntington Beach Pier. More duct tape action today. No broken boards yet, thankfully. So nice, clean surfing. We're looking for style. We're looking for grace. We're looking for technical, traditional longboarding. Sounds like an oxymoron, but it all makes sense when you see these surfers ride these waves. Yeah, and you want that orig originality where surfing originated from too, Chris, and we got a great heat on our hands. Tony Silvani, Taka Inoue, and Joao Danta Silvani from the east coast of the U.S. No strangers surfing beach breaks. Inoue, a great short border too, actually competes on the qualifying series back in Japan too. And Joao Dantas from Portugal, this is gonna be a great one. Taka, up and at it now. Takes the high line. Now the decision-making process comes into play. Which way do I fade? Do a little bit of work on the transition from the outside to the inside. The double pet the cat. Yep. Unique move to duct tape surfing. Quick little hang five there. Another little hang five Ooh. and a hang ten. That's Hold what it. we're talking about. Do the math while you're on your way. Five plus ten equals, you know what I'm talking 12. about. Twelve. Points. <laughs> Quick look there from Surfer in White, Jao Dantes. He had a couple of great heats yesterday. Uh, we did have non-elimination round surfing throughout the day yesterday, but guess what? People are going to lose today, Mitch, and you know it's going to be a bittersweet for some of these longboarders. Yep. But 
this is a championship tour style competition on the longboard tour. Yeah, and Joao actually broke one of his boards in the surfing heat earlier in the event, as we're seeing Taka's opener. So good footwork on the outside, and as he mentioned here, double petting the kitty in a few moments, and that's definitely not something that you want to see as a judge, but made the inside connection. This is where it got interesting, though, and I thought he read it well, got the five real quick, then went back into the cross step, and he got the 10, but I just don't know if they're going to deem that complete at the end or not. Complete. They've been pretty uh, regimented in making sure that, you know, when you're doing that transition from the nose back to the middle of the board, you really got to ride it out. Like, it's, uh, it's, it's different, you know, obviously than uh, what we see in the shortboarding where these quote-unquote maneuvers, mm -hmm. you know, can go the span of 15 seconds with all the work you're doing in between. So uh, the judges fully, fully uh, aware and informed about the finishing of these waves, as you saw right there. Tony Silvani finishes nice and clean on the inside. Races to the pier to get back out there. Well, he's a competitive veteran too, so he's been finish, around. Oh yeah, finishing his first wave off cleanly in a smart way too. Gonna do the run around and paddle back out on north side. And here's his opener, Chris. Goes on the backhand. Nice five to start things off. Beautiful cross step right there to the down carve as well. And I love how he recognized that that left was coming towards him too. He had he had to get out of there quickly. And it gets a beautiful touch five right at the end and a little floater to finish. So it'll be a decent score to, to start things off. You know, I love how these surfers on these giant boards can make that transition to where they're making the board look as big as it is mm -hmm. and going nice and slow. But then when needed, they just run back to the tail. They're yeah. able to whip these things around. I mean, this is a nine foot plus board. Uh, I think people are riding nine fours, nine sixes mm -hmm. even in some cases. So the ability to be able to whip a board around like this so quickly is it's pretty cool to see and it is very difficult to do. Definitely uh, understated on how uh, challenging these boards can be to ride. They're actually really tippy. Yeah. You would think, all right, they're so big and wide and heavy that they would be really solid on the top of the water, but they're tippy, right? That's why it's so complicated to ride a longboard, too, because if you don't know how to distribute your weight and balance yourself out on a board that's either nine foot plus, you're definitely not going to be able to do that on a shortboard eventually either. And that's the most impressive thing a lot about, uh, about a lot of the longboard athletes. They're great shortboarders, too. They ride different things because they want to know what they're feeling under their feet. Yeah, sometimes I equate uh, riding a big log like parallel park in a Cadillac. <laughs> you know? It's not easy, but if you do it right, it does look nice. 24 to go. Winner of that last heat, Tully White is standing by now with Louisa Florence. Yeah, and just had to pull her aside because she was giving Zoe a big hug. I don't know if you guys know, but Zoe has a broken rib. So I just want to make sure I see a lot of sand. Are you in one piece after this heat? Yeah, um, a lot of sand, but I I'm fine. You know, feel for Zoe. She's an incredible surfer and she tro she's an absolute trooper. She's been paddling out anyway. And yeah, just like hope she heels up in the f for Malibu and yeah. Yeah, it always amazes me because longboarding seems so graceful, but you know, the board is huge. So a lot of things can happen. Like how was this heat for you? You were just telling me how tricky it was because of the tide right now. Yeah, so the tide's pretty low um, and there's a bit of a rip running through the waves. So there's a bit of like wobble going on as well. Um, but you kind of had to trust that they'd hold up because there was a lot of water moving through that bit. Um, but yeah, I was really happy to get a couple of those lefts and just connect it through to the inside because, um, yeah, there is a bit of a hole in between. Well, not counting with the conditions, how are you going to prepare yourself for the next heat? Um, I guess I'll just be riding the same board and probably surfing the same bank. <laughs> so just, yeah, resting up, cheering on my mate Declan, who's from Manly as well. Um, he's up later today, so I'm excited to watch him smash it. And um, yeah, I'll see you in the athlete zone. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks yeah. heaps. Thank you, Louisa. Congrats. Tully White making it through with a grand total of 11.16, which is pretty massive if you look at the other scores in that heat, a 5.5 and a 5.44. So it was close for second place, but Tully was way out in the lead, hung on all the way to the end. And speaking of standings, for now, Tony Silvani, the highest single wave score of this heat, a six-point ride. Nicely done for Tony. We've got uh, Taka in second with a 3.5 and a 1. Jao Dantes in third with a uh, Nothing of note yet, but uh, a lot of time to go. And I feel like in these 
duct tape heats. We've seen a lot of waves rated up to, you know, eight, ten waves each just yeah. because they can get around so fast. And I feel like today especially, it doesn't look like there's a lot of current. The sets are a lot smaller than we saw yesterday. So I think uh, surfers in the lineup now have the challenge to maybe be a little bit more choosy in terms of the waves they ride. Almost yesterday, you know, with all those sets coming through, all those waves, a lot of surfers just taking off at whatever came their way. So, uh, you know, it's kind of strange to use the word strategy mm -hmm. when you're talking about, uh, you know, classic traditional longboard surfing like this. But, you know, this is a championship tour event. So you really, you have to uh, toe the line, I would say, nice and calm, stylish. Don't make it look like you're using a strategy, but definitely use a strategy. Yeah, and you want to be selective. As you were mentioning, yesterday there were so many waves still, and today, despite it being very consistent, You've seen that the best scores have come off of the set waves, too. The 6.0 of, of Tony Silvani, he's going to get a backup right now. And, you know, I, I do think that a lot of these waves going into the pier bowl right are going to be very beneficial to these regular footers, too, Chris. Yeah, Tony back on it right there, was purling for about 15 seconds, and <laughs> finally it went under. Submarined, and he goes down. Down periscope. <laughs> Yeah, the, the weightless feeling that these surfers can achieve when they're hanging 10 or hanging 5 is pretty amazing, but that can all go out the window real quick. Literally uh, a shift in your balance. I think you know what you could do at home is if you have stairs in your house or go out to the curb, hang your toes over the curb and kind of lean around and see what that feels like. Now magnify that feeling by 100 and the precision that you have to have, and that'll tell you uh, how athletic these surfers are. You want to look like a hood ornament for as long as possible. So you're a huge skater too. I used to skate a lot when I was a kid. Don't do it as much anymore because I got injured too much too <laughs> often. But imagine doing a manual for the longest time and having to maintain that manual for a long distance from the outside all the way to the shore. Like that's basically traditional longboarding for exactly. you. Exactly, and that's really one of the most underrated hard things to do in skating. Taka making it look easy. Quick run to the nose and now he's doing some Fancy footwork through to this middle inside section. Gets all five over. There we go. Five to ten. That's what the judges want to see. So he rides out clean. I like the way Taka surfs. Me you know, too. He's, he's got, like, energy in his, uh, in his maneuvers, but also nice, clean style. My favorite type of longboarding is wild-style longboarding. Guys like Alex Nost, you know, even Karina Rizunko, who put just unique flair between every step and between every maneuver. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some e eclectic, eclectic surfers out there that are really fun to watch. Chaparro was another one. Jules Chaparro is yeah. a guy I'd never seen surf that I was pretty hyped on. But here's Taka. Yeah, so gets the 10 at the beginning crease. I really like that kind of knock kneed stance when he goes up into the lip again and he brings those knees around. Gets the 5 and then touches the 10 real quick right there at the end too. So. Got a 5.27 on his previous wave. Would be thinking this is going to be around there. And here's Tony again on a great left. The only thing that may uh, impede Taka's score was uh, the flow element. A little choppy mm -hmm. at times between maneuvers. But, you know, again, eclectic, which we like to see. Tony, a little too close to the pier on that wave to make the transition. It dies out under his feet. Right behind him, Dantas. Thinking it could be a similar finish, and he's just on to flat water, so he gets out of that wave. How far away from the pier do you think you have to be in order to make your way all the way through to the inside section? I'd probably say 10 to 15 yards um, at the least. Um, if you want to be in a safe position, probably say 30 or 40, Chris. Um, you look at those things up close, and look at the amount of barnacles on them, too. And this is a low tide. You can really see that there's some underneath and there's some above water too. But yeah, um, try to avoid that as much as you can. The one thing I will say, if you're just going straight the whole time and you have enough momentum to go through the pier, just do that instead. As we're seeing Joao's last, gets the 10 and then a nice cutty to finish off this ride. And props to this guy too. Coming from Portugal, there's not a lot of good longboarding waves either. And then Tony with a great five to start things off and a beautiful set wave on the outside. So that'll score well. Already has the six. Looking to get a better backup than the 417 now, Chris. I like your point about shooting the pier. It's kind of like the same idea of it's safer in the barrel. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you're committed to going through the pier, go. 
because if you make uh, any wrong decision going towards the pier, uh, it can be bad and it can result in more than just a broken board. I mean, we had broken bodies hit that pier and it is definitely not something to be messed with. Although it's probably one of the most iconic tricks in all of surfing, right? Shooting the pier, oh, yeah. especially here in Huntington. 1643 to go. We've been talking long boards for the better part of the last two days. So let's keep that conversation rolling. AJ is in the ultimate boardroom. Yeah, Kote, you were just talking about some of the carnage that we had yesterday. Here's evidence of it. The broken boards, we had two of them. And so many longboarders I talked to yesterday said they had never seen conditions like yesterday break the boards so quickly. So I was talking with Chloe Kalman, who surfed yesterday, won her heat. So she's not surfing today. She does has, doesn't have to go again until tomorrow. But she was explaining to me that a lot of the riders, a lot of the surfers today are picking their boards that they're the most confident on, that they want to make sure after yesterday's condition, they feel feel really good on their equipment and a lot of them she said telling me that hey maybe yesterday I didn't wear a leash but after all the swimming we saw yesterday some of them might be reconsidering that option heading into their heats today. Hey AJ I got a question for you regarding uh, the amount of experience that you have in outside sports besides surfing what kind of impact do you think you've seen at the Vans US Open of surfing have for the development of the sport of surfing and longboarding too? Oh, I think it's been really awesome. I mean, I think you just see what a production it is and how many ways that there are for people who are just getting into the sport, whether it's surfing or skateboarding or BMX, whatever it is, to be around some of the legends. And you see how packed the beach is every single day here at Huntington Beach and how much people are enjoying learning more about the sport, watching the best people in the world do it. And I think it's one of those things where it makes everything feel accessible, you know, and if you can see it, you can be it. And I feel like that's what we're really experiencing at the Vans U.S. Open this week. Love it. Thank you, AJ. It is really, I mean, if you kind of cut through all the, the marketing and the logos and all the stuff that make this event what it is, uh, you get down to the soul of it. We're just here to inspire you to go surfing. I mean, we want you to watch this and then go do this. Uh, and the cool part about having the Vans duct tape, having, you know, men's and women's divisions is that we, we, we want to give everybody something to inspire them. Of course, these are all experts in their field, but uh, if you can watch this and, you know, maybe it'll help you decide, do I want to start off on a shortboard, a longboard, you know, how do I want to start my surfing journey? Well, most of us start on big soft boards just for safety and, you know, of course, for uh, that entry level feel. Uh, once you get to an expert level, you can start doing things like we're seeing here from Jao Dantes. You know, if you're a, a beginner and you're watching this and going, well, that looks easy. I can do that. Try it. It's yeah. not easy, especially on these boards. I mean, we've seen, or I've seen the, some of the best short boarders, you know, talking CT levels. I'm not going to name names. Put them on a longboard. They have no idea what's going no. on. So this is actually very difficult. And it's, it, it is pretty interesting because you think of a beginner board, and that's a longboard, mm -hmm. generally soft. But when you get to the boards like these surfers are riding right now, I mean, these are actually very difficult to ride. Nothing is easy on a board like this. Yeah, and the degree of difficulty of riding a shortboard obviously comes from the different types of waves you're surfing most of the time, too. For the most part, you see longboarders, especially on the traditional side, surf softer waves, but with that kind of length that allows you to have the variation of the traditional maneuvers, too, Chris. And the one thing that I love about being here at Huntington Beach for the Vans Duct Tape Invitational is that not only are you competing at a beach break, there's a good possibility that that beach break shifts within that waiting period that you have. Obviously, we saw larger sets yesterday. We're seeing something with a decreasing swell, but still fun out there right now. Well, we got 13 minutes to go. Tony Silvani in the lead for now. There's Phil Rajman coming up next. We got a lot of surfing left to come. Stay tuned. You're watching Vans Duct Tape Invitational.
My job is professional surfer. My goal is to win titles. That's what I'm here for. The world's best surfers in the world's best waves. We've had a shark attack. Whoa. It's the most intense surfing scenario you can imagine. I have to step up my game now and not make any mistakes. Oh my god! <laughs> This is a war. You have to find a way to win it and do it at all costs. Make or break on Apple TV Plus. Definitely one of my favorite surf shows of all time, and not just because Mitchell and I have commentary <laughs> in those shows. You gotta listen closely, but you'll hear us. 10.28 to go, Tony Silvani in the lead, the veteran on top for now, and he does have priority as well. Uh, Mitchell, you know, getting back to kind of the competitive basics, priority on a day like today most likely will come into a much bigger factor than we've seen in the past few days. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think especially at the Pier Bowl where all three surfers are located right now, and Silvani's on another left-hander now, Chris. He's doing it again. This kid is back on the escalator, 10 toes off the tip. That, there's another Ooh. five, that's 15 toes. Ooh. But that was not a completed move, and now we may see a surfboard that is incompleted and eaten by the pier. Wow, that was a quick reaction. Maybe not. <laughs> yep, fins, rails, we're good. Seems like it's cool. We got duct tape on the beach too, so. <laughs> yeah. There's a reason why it's called the duct tape well, invitation. Every entrant gets a free roll of duct tape by entering, so there's that. Everyone's a winner. 9.26 to go, Taka, straight to the nose, trying to hang that heel, and going for the helicopter spin accidentally. 9.16 to go. One of my favorite parts of longboarding is the side slip boogie made famous by Herbie Fletcher. Herbie, if you're watching, we love you. We love what you've done for the sport. That guy is an absolute legend, and. I would love to see Herbie get invited to a oh, yeah. contest. You got to have a Legends division. Oh, yeah. Just a Herbie division. Just a Herbie demo. All day. I'll watch that all day long. Quick look there for Jao Dantes. Maybe getting a little greedy on the nose. Seemed that way. Silvani. But with the grab rail floater. See, that right. He must have heard me talking about Herbie because that right there showed me that the thrill is back. Herbie Fletcher in the building with the grab rail side slip almost. Yeah. Seems You're going like to have to do a little better than that if you want to get in Herbie's league. <laughs> and, and Tony's great. He is. This is Herbie Fletcher. But yeah, about. exactly. I mean, you, we got standards, Chris, okay, when it comes to those grab rails. It's here got to be pig, dog, or bust. And this was the, the first wave of his two. So a great nose ride right there. Got the five. But this is where it got tricky. Or actually, that's the 4.9 that it got that he got before, and then Taka. I love the little drop knee stance that he has when he's coming out of those carves too. Looks great. He's looking to better a mid five in the scoreline. Don't think he'll do that. And then Joao, great opportunity here on a beautiful looking left, but maybe just stood on the nose for a bit too long. That wave going a little bit a bit flat right there at the end, so he wasn't able to make the inside connection but still did some work on the outside, so should be among his best scores. Looked I love like um, Taka almost gliding into that one. Yeah, I was going to say, I just love the amount of time that Joao actually tries to spend on those on the outside. Obviously, looking at the judging criteria, you're looking at being in the steepest part of the waves, executing those high risk and difficult maneuvers, Chris, and he's definitely trying to surf to that criteria. The only difficult thing that I will say in comparison to yesterday being a bit smaller and with the increasing tide that we're going to be, see uh, be seeing later on, you do need to be careful about how much time you're trying to spend on those on the outside because it's just not giving you the right amount of speed to get that inside connection and the track that you need to make it to the shorey. We saw Tony get the six on a connection on the inside on his first wave, so it's going to be interesting to see what kind of approach a lot of these surfers do, especially knowing that they don't compete as much in these high-level competitions. Yeah, there is a, a difference in the approach. If you're coming from a, a duct tape background compared to a World Surf League longboard tour background. Um, in the duct tape events, historically speaking, you share waves, you go tandem, you run into each other, <laughs> you slap each other while you're on the waves. Uh, there's a lot more contact involved, yeah. and that is actually encouraged and <laughs> rewarded. 
if you drop in on somebody today, even though this still technically is a duct tape event, it is in fact a WSL Championship Tour event as well. So some rules have been taken away, others have been added. Still super fun, maybe just a little bit more seriously competitive. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. And six minutes to go, Inoue with priority, and you were mentioning the use of priority earlier and how important it's going to be. I think for the people that have that competitive experience, like Silvani, who's been, you know, a world champion in the past in other organizations. He's been a runner-up at the WSL level. And Inoue, who has the competitive experience of being on the qualifying series, too, in the shortboard level, he knows what he's doing out there as far as the rules actually go. So I wouldn't be surprised for him to be a lot more selective in these last five minutes. Jiao with a quick five off the tip. Just be careful how you use that phrase in out of context. 5.16 to go. Round three, heat one. So this is our first elimination heat for the men. That was cool. You've made it this far in a World Championship Tour heat. Getting eliminated here in round three is bittersweet. You will get some points. You will get that roll of duct tape, but you might be out of contention in terms of uh, that el elusive longboard world title, which will happen in Malibu just a few, uh, just a month or so. Mm -hmm. So prime time, late summer, early fall in Malibu. That yeah. is uh, that, that right season. there is a magical equation. Absolutely. And I'm excited to see a lot of people, especially the local Soleil Erico, who knows the wave super well, compete later on. Um, she had a decent performance yesterday. I don't think she was that happy with her use of priority in, in some of her waves. And Joao Dantas now needing a 6.0, gets a 4.47, so still not enough. And here's the heat leader once again, Chris. Yeah, Tony showing us why he has been a uh, pretty dominant fixture in competitive longboarding for so many years. Flying down the line, almost busted his board earlier, but he doesn't care. He wants to win. He's probably got more boards at home. He's probably shot this pier a million times. No fear for Tony Silvana. Jao Dantes, though, on the other hand, so he has 12 waves ridden. I don't have the rule book with me. Is there a wave limit? No. Can you catch too many waves? No, not that I know of. Um, there isn't in shortboarding. I wouldn't think there is in longboarding now. Um, in fact, usually you're almost encouraged to catch as many waves as you can. But Silvani's also caught 10, too. And these surfers who will be advancing out of this round will actually be surfing again later today. But I saw Silvani yesterday going out for a free surf in the afternoon when it was choppy, when it was difficult to surf. The guy's in shape. He knows what he's doing, and he's been around for such a long time, too, that I wouldn't even be surprised that he knows that surfing three or four times in a day isn't something that wouldn't be a possibility at the end of the event either. And, uh, you know, I've noticed, of course, frontside and backside switch-ups happen a lot in longboarding. Uh, do you think that a backside nose ride is harder or okay. not as hard as a frontside nose ride? Does it matter? These, the, a lot of these surfers seem to be pretty ambidextrous. Like, I don't know what stance a lot of them are, and if they didn't have a leash on, I would have no idea. I knew I was going to get a question like this eventually. Yeah? Because it's the same thing we see in shortboarding, too. W which one's harder? Is the backside air harder? Is the frontside air harder? I think it depends on the section. And the person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we saw Aitan Osborne get the 9.87 the other day, you know, for the big backside, backside rotation. Um, and if you look at Silvani's two best scores in this heat, which are the two best waves of the heat as well, the six came off of a right. Great nose right on the outside, but the wave didn't stand up as much as the 6.27. That was the big nose right on the left. Here's Jao Dantes, 52nd wave in this heat. Ooh. Actually, 13th wave, but who's counting besides the judges? Goes down there, so he's unfortunately kind of had the same wave over and yeah. over and over. You know, those, those medium-sized waves are not helping him right now. It doesn't matter if you have 24s. At this point, you know, it's uh, it's sixes, high fives that get you through. It's nose rides like that from the outside. Oof. Dangerous way to get out of that wave for uh, Taka. But a great start. I'm kind of 
maybe a little confused as to why he pulled out. Maybe he didn't see anything happening after that, or maybe the peer was just bearing down on him a little too quick. He might have also seen Joao try to make it out the back, and him being a savvy competitor, you, you saw Tony right there actually ask for time and situation. So I think Inoue recognized that Dantas was making it back out. He wanted to recover priority, and he actually did above his fellow competitor in white. So I think it was a smart strategy, knowing that Joao is more than capable of getting a six still in 50 seconds. But as you said, I think Dantas has just caught too many waves that have been in the same range the whole time. And a beautiful five right there for Inoue. But, you know, he saw it up here. He recognized that Dantas was making it back out. He doesn't need to better a score. So just go out there and maintain your position and priority. 34 seconds left. Safe to say, Tony Silvani will be making it through. Taka Inui in second, unofficially for now. Jao Dantas, I mean, he put up a fight for sure. He's got four fours in his score line. Sadly for him, the rest of those waves are just ones, point fives. So uh, a lot of work done, but not a lot of reward. This is his last chance, and it's, again, same type of wave. But this time he's going to opt right. So we'll see if this serves him better. Way deep on the hang five there. So a little bit of work out the back. He's going to have to do something pretty wild if he wants to get a score on this wave through the inside. It dies under his feet. That's it. Nice work throughout the week for Jao Dantes. But unfortunately, that last heat just was not his. It was Tony's. Tony Silvani gets the win. Taka Inoue in second. And more surfing to come. We'll be right back. You're watching the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. Stay tuned. Nice show of sportsmanship there between competitors. They come in, they leave the drama in the lineup. Not that there was dramatics in that. That was a nice, clean, friendly competition there. At the end of it, Tony Silvani gets a 12-2-7. That's enough to get the win. Taka Inoue in second with 11.30. Jao Dantas in third and eliminated. Our first eliminated duct taper in the main event. So Sad uh, moment, Chris. Yeah, but the good news is for surf fans out there, we got more for you. Starting with surfer in red, Lucas Garrido Leca. Jefferson Silva will be in blue, and Phil Rajman will be in the white jersey. Uh, this is a cool heat because there are some serious titles in the water right now. You got Lucas uh, Garrido with a fifth at the surf ranch. He is your 2021 national champion. And this is not Luke Cederman from Raglan Surf Report. <laughs> I, uh, I was kind of confused. I thought he came in and gave a fake name and did a whole show for us. But uh, this is, in fact, legendary longboarder Phil Rajman from Brazil. So not from New Zealand, not Luke Cederman, not Raglan Surf Report. Although he does look just like him. Uh, 
unfortunately for Phil, he's a regular footer though, so he doesn't share the same dynamics that you and I do with Chris. Luke, yeah. You know, Phil is your two-time longboard champion. I think there's about 15 titles in the lineup right now, Mitchell. Yeah. I would even maybe even say more. It's Lucas got a good looking one here, right on the trunks, uh, wearing the trunks today too, Chris. As as he should. The water's still about 70 degrees. And he is on a longboard, so he's out of the water a little bit more. Most of the time, yeah. I'm not a wetsuit critic. You know, I, I have a certain thing on my street where if one of us starts trunking it, we all have to start trunking it, or you will be ridiculed. It's really immature. You trunked it a lot last year, I feel. It was quite warm during the summertime. I've trunked it quite a, quite a bit this season, as we're seeing Phil. Oh, beautiful cross-step switch up right there. Right? Like, how could you tell what stance he is on a turn like that? That was so cool. And then this is the originality, too, that he kind of brings to the table. Kind of does that neutral stance for a while. Gets the five right there at the end. And a little float to finish right here, too. So a good opener for Phil. I mean, that didn't come in as a score that I was thinking, 3.67. I also think that they're taking into consideration the two waves of Tony in the last heat. And then Jeffson who ended up with a fifth place finish at Manly Beach. So this is an important heat for him. He's looking to move up in the rankings or at least stay within the top five. We're seeing him here after the five on the outside. Get some cross stepping in right here and then tries to get the five on the nose at the end and unfortunately just digs his rail and the nose. Pearls have been going on all week long, Chris, and it's not easy with the shore here at HB. Yeah, and I think uh, for some of these surfers that travel here, you know, from Brazil specifically, you know, they have a whole scene, a whole longboard tour going on down there. So they go all over the place uh, on their longboard tour. Right now, uh, Jao Silva, or excuse me, Jefferson Silva, competing on the Brazilian circuit. And definitely showing that he is... An absolute threat when it comes to beach break conditions like we're seeing right now. 24-43 on the clock. Rajman in the lead for now. That will change as we head on through this round three, heat two. So non-elimination rounds all day yesterday. Today, we're going to send some surfers packing in the nicest way possible. So we'll see as Phil has priority. So 23.50 on the clock, Phil Rajman with priority, and he will exercise his right to choose which wave he oh, wants. Sick. Leans into that quick bottom turn straight up onto the nose. Big guy too, and uh, yeah. so graceful, which is not easy. I mean, I wouldn't know, I'm not a big guy, but I know that being big uh, isn't always conducive to grace in the lineup, Yeah, but uh, Phil's got it. I know. As a big guy myself, I definitely know, Chris, it's hard to make things look nice. But that was cool. He's got a great style. Like, I just have to say, for a longboarder to be able to do that, especially a guy his size on a wave that small, look at the way he drops in as we're going to see Lucas on another left. Gets the five. Beautiful one on the outside. Smaller wave. I love the way he drops the knee when he's doing that carve, too. Coming from the land of the lefts, go switch there for a little while, shifts it, back, shifts it back, and unfortunately that wave just dies out. But look at this drop in. Wow, his foot positioning right there when he was going in, that cross step even before he set up, the score comes in as a six. Great recognition by our judges. I mean, that's originality, that's unique, and it's so ordinary to see that, you know, to those kind of traditional longboarders. And then Jeffson during the replays here. Great 10 on the outside. Beautiful drop afterwards and does a nice carve back into the white water. So this should easily be his best wave too. Actually, this was a 6.0. We're waiting on Phil's score. 
So, yeah, this is a tough heat already. I mean, the three South Americans do not want to lose in this round. No, you've got uh, two surfers from Brazil, one from Peru. You mentioned at the land of left. And I think, uh, you know, some of those waves down in Peru look like they would be perfect longboard waves. Oh, yeah. One wave that I've always wanted to surf on any type of board, Chicama. And uh, there's a beautiful spot down there, the Chicama Surf Resort. And I'm just, you know, I keep peppering them with hearts and flame emojis. I'm trying to get a relationship going. And eventually <laughs> I'm going to go down there and hopefully I can get a hang tan on the world's longest left. We'll see. Hey, Luca Messinas is in the competitors area. You got to go talk to him after this heat. He might hook you up. I'm going to go make friends with uh, Lucas Garrido for sure. 21 17. Tony, on the I clock. just saw. Surfers are making their way back into the takeoff zone. I believe that will give us the opportunity to catch up with a veteran, a legend, Tony Silvani. Tony, I just saw you coming back from the water with two different boards. Do you have two different strategies out there? Well, I buckled my board in the first heat on my first wave, so I had to make a transition change and move over to a board that I've only ridden twice before. So um, going out there in the conditions today with similar surf conditions to home, I was just trying to stay calm and be on some of the lefts. How did that affect you with the whole boarding change and like the waves the way they are right now? Just thinking positive, you know, like coming down with good mojo and uh, having Jackson here supporting me. And uh, uh -huh. yeah, just Eric Linus and Ashley, thanks so much from Stuart Surfboards for providing me such great boards. Bill, thanks so much for shaping wonderful boards for me. And um, yeah, you guys have been in my corner for so long, so it's been really nice to have you. Amazing. And when you say Tony Silvani in the East Coast is like almost a brand, you know, with your, your surf, surfing school. So I'm wondering, like, besides the, the surfing career, you have that eye for coaching, for teaching. How do you see the, the scene of this new wave of, you know, talents from uh, longboarding in the East Coast? Believe it or not, like my hometown area, we have some of the best longboarders in the U.S. Um, there's a bunch of young up-and-coming longboarders, uh -huh. um, just to name off a few, you know, Mac Landry, uh, Gus Hertz, uh, Kai Now, um, Callie Hertz. The, these young kids are like really pushing the, the limits with longboarding and surfing in general. And it's just cool to come from such a small town. And how do you pull that coaching that you give to these guys, to yourself when you're in the water? Yeah, I mean, honestly, to be true and upfront, I've only surfed a handful of times this whole entire summer. So I've been super busy with work and uh, just super grateful to be here. You know, most people think that I'm like surfing every day. I've, I've surfed <laughs> twice. So. Oh, my goodness. So maybe that's the luck, right? Congratulations, though. Thank you so much. Yeah, just coming off of drive and motivation. So just want to say one last thing. Thanks so much to my family. It's nice to have a heat win. Looking forward to the next round. Follow the action. Amazing. It was great to watch you. Thank you. Yeah. We're there with Tony. We're looking forward to seeing more of him in the next round as well. I love that. You know, uh, oftentimes you feel like, well, being a pro surfer, long or shortboard, you're living the dream. But Tony said it right there. I mean, you got to grind. You got to hustle. He's only surfed a few times. Unlike these guys that get to surf all day long and not have to work. Here's Phil Rajman there, coming from the top floor to the bottom floor by way of the nose, and now fading his way through the white water, looking as, where do I go? Okay, I'm gonna fade right here. You see, crouching tiger, hidden dragon, <laughs> toes to the nose, completed ride. Nicely done for Phil Rajman. He's got a four, five, and a three, six, seven. So we'll see where that score goes. You look at Jeff Jefferson Silva's score line. He's got a six and a seven. So he has got a healthy lead right now. Lucas Garrido Leca in second place with a five, two, three, and a four, three, zero. So we got a tight heat on our hands. Plenty of time to go. Seventeen forty. Yeah, and the one score that I really like from Rajman actually came in at a four point five. And just comparing it and looking to the six and the seven of Silva, I think they're really taking into account the size of the wave and the sections on the outside that are standing up a lot more. And then Garrido Leca got the 5.23, the one really nice 10 on a smaller left. And here's Rajman's last. So goes to the nose here. I don't think he got the complete 10. It was about nine. It was more, nine. yeah, more of like 
got getting the five and a cheater 10 right at the end too just almost touching the nose barely but good patience right here i mean it goes to show you the amount of experience that this guy has competing in high level events goes to the 10 right there so he gets it right at the end only needs a 504 wouldn't be surprised to see him get the score and you know big props is tony silvani again he's done a lot for longboarding within the united states specifically on the east coast but uh he forgot to mention a name from new york chase leader this kid's coming up last year's national champion here at the nssa level he's only 16 17 works all the summer um, in New York as well, and I think there's a good scene coming up from that part of the East Coast too, Chris. Yeah, I know. Uh, you know the Montauk area yeah. is kind of a famous, or a now famous longboarding zone. Uh, they have got a bunch of cool surf shops, and it's a really vibrant, unique scene there. And all up and down the East Coast, I mean, you know, you you, you think of uh, Peter Pan, for example. Peter Pan, pretty much the the godfather of longboarding on the East Coast. Uh, you know, of course, Spencer family, Yancey Spencer. Yeah. Uh, just icon, legend. Floribama. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I feel like uh, East Coast longboarding, definitely well represented past, present, and future. 100%. And obviously you're having somebody within the top three right now, and Justin Quintal, too, who's making a big <laughs> He's change. He's won a few events, right? Yeah. And easily one of the nicest people you'll, you'll ever meet too and it obviously facilitates things when you're that nice and you're that open and especially to constructive criticism too the guy knows how to do it all so i think longboarding's in great hands especially with the people that are coming up like lucas in the water right now in red too absolutely our men's longboard tour is uh well underway three events this year final stop will be in or at malibu California, just about uh, 45 minutes north of Huntington Beach. That's in a helicopter. It'll take you about three hours to get there on the freeway from here on <laughs> certain days. Jefferson Silva, nose to close. Out of that wave. Yeah, and uh, I also want to give big props and a shout out to LogRap on Instagram. Love LogRap. They have one of the best accounts you could follow. Go give them a follow. They combine hip hop and rap music with log videos. It's the best. I think one of my favorites, I, I'm pretty sure I saw a really sweet Tosh Tudor edit, and it was uh, soundtracked by the Jizza Liquid Swords. Yeah. And I said, they're really onto something here. Loved them ever since. And they actually had a physical shop takeover. They took over a shop down in Cardiff by the Sea called Resin Craft, mm -hmm. which is uh, a really cool shop. Uh, Tosh, uh, Tosh Tudor rides for them, and basically they took over the shop for a couple days. You know, they were selling their their gear and their shirts, and they had a video premiere. And there was about a thousand people there. It was an absolute success. So, congrats to Log Rap. If you're not following them, even if you don't really care about longboarding, follow them because yeah. it will make you care about longboarding. Absolutely. I mean, I started loving longboarding a lot more after watching that, and with the combination of hip hop and rap music. You know, they put people under the stairs in one of their videos the other day. It's like, how can you not love an Instagram account like that? But, And it, obviously what they're doing, too, is that they're exposing a lot of social media followers to what they're actually trying to get more followers to do, is actually get to see them watch longboarding like this. The best surfers in the world and kind of the most, uh, more underrated people out there, too, more of the underground people. And I think that's actually where Lucas got his start, Chris. If it weren't for Log Rap and those kind of Instagram accounts, he probably wouldn't even be competing here at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. Yeah, and that's uh, that right there is just straight up guerrilla marketing. You know, get the get these names out there, get them uh, get them surfing to some good hip hop, and big things can happen. Give them a chance. That's all they need. I mean, they're making a count right now. Who would have thought you would have seen three South Americans in the same heat? When before it was, it seemed like it was all Australians and competitors from the U.S. and Hawaii competing before. Well, big things happening here in the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. As it stands now, Jefferson Silva with a seven and a six has a huge lead in this heat. There are some of our beautiful crafts that will be ridden later today. Stay tuned to find out who rides what.
you very much. Okay, hot dog time over here. How you doing? All right, how you doing? Here you go, bud. The Van Doren Village is raging all day, every day. The one and only Mr. Steve Van Doren cooking up dogs as we watch Phil Rajman do some longboarding to body surfing. Didn't quite pull off the uh, dolphin style exit, but right behind him, Lucas Garrido Leca. Cool looking arched hang 10. Just a quick ride for both of those surfers. 10 minutes left, Chris Cote with Mitchell Salazar. Big numbers for Jefferson Silva, and he has priority. He's caught five waves so far, Chris, and three of them have just been in and outs. So it goes to show you the efficiency that he's had in this heat in the first 20 minutes. Just under 10 to go, and as of right now, this would be a massive upset if Phil Rasman actually bows out of this event right here in this heat. And it would be the biggest heat win for Jefferson Silva so far. But here we go, wide up and riding. Yeah, Phil Rajman is not going to give up easy. I think he's trying to do too much on the outside, though, Chris. It seems like he's going straight to the five and maybe even the 10 on a couple of his waves, too, and trying to stay there for a bit too long. He's kind of noticed that those scores haven't really broken the four point range so far. So maybe noticing that they want to see that spectacular surfing like they've seen from the surfer in blue. and. So far, Garrido Leca has been on the verge of maybe bettering his low score of a 4.3, but hasn't been able to get that connection after the wave flattens out. So it's still a close heat for second right now. And we're getting at about a 9.30 Friday, August 5th. Happy Friday, Mitch. We got that feeling around here as well. You can start to feel the energy building up around us as fans make their way down to the beach and into the Van Dorn Village. A oh. really cool looking drop knee turn just got away from him there you know that's the thing about these giant boards no matter how good you surf sometimes they have a mind of their own if they're going one direction they're staying that direction as we saw right there from Lucas yeah, there's a lot of leftover uh, residue of all those white waters next to the pier as well where he finished off his wave but he was on his way to a great score too. got the 10 at the beginning and unfortunately for him, a wave that's probably going to be a throwaway easily could have bettered his low score right there, Chris. So kind of a missed opportunity. But as you said, it's so hard to control these boards, even after having a large amount of experience like Lucas does have. And coming from the land of the left, he doesn't tend to surf a lot of beach breaks either. So having Why completed, would you? well, <laughs> especially if you're going up as a goose footer, you know, like. He wouldn't be looking at those waves. He'd be thinking, OK, I'll go surf Mancura, I'll go surf Chicama. Even Cabo Blanco on a longboard getting barreled would be sick, too. With seven and a half to go, cheering squad for Phil Rajman. Just waiting patiently <laughs> for Dad to uh, get something above a 484. Oh, hey. that just, I feel so serene now. That just calmed my nerves beautiful little moment there from the Vans US Open of surfing Rajman in second priority out the back doesn't need a huge score but I do agree with you uh, Mitchell it, it looks like he's trying a little too much yeah. trying to fit in a little too much action uh, maybe just a, needs to have a little bit more patience uh, wave selection might not be as good as we've seen from Lucas and Jeffson but there's still time and he does have second priority so he can block Lucas off the wave but uh, if Jefferson is paddling for a wave he needs to get out of it. There's Kai Salas former champion and I would say one of the best styles in the event too surfer shaper and also owns a couple of surf schools in Honolulu. Here goes Phil again. Let's see if uh, Phil wakes up his baby girl with this one. Quick five there in the soup. Nice dropped knee cut back there. All right, this wave's already looking better. And right as I say that, it starts to die out. But he keeps going. Nice flow through to the inside, makes the connection. Almost got 10 little piggies over that nose. Finishes nicely. So uh, he's looking for a 484. I think that's going to be right there in the conversation. Yeah. He did have more patience on that wave. He didn't he did. try too much. 
I think he didn't push where he didn't need to push either, Chris, but... You know he's not trying enough? <laughs> no, I actually think it was kind of the perfect pace for the wave, but still looking at his 4.7 and even the 4.5, I'm thinking to myself, is it his best wave so far? I just don't know. I mean, Garrido Leca has the 5.23, and that was a pretty decent wave, but looking at the replay, doesn't fully make it to the nose Ooh. either. And the judges see that. Oh, yeah, and they're watching the replay as well. Great carve back, though. Drop the back knee. I really like that move that he does right there where he kind of goes into the mid-cross step and doesn't really full, fully commit to it until after he sees the section uh, really turning up. He does get a small 10 at the end, though, and it's going to be a real close score. There it is. Not enough a 4.4. Just under. He's probably a little bit frustrated right now. Thinking, what do I have to do to break up into the 5 and above range? I feel like it was, uh, there wasn't much more he could have done on that wave. I think it was more wave than Phil. He missed the five at the beginning, though. And yeah, you're right. I hope this isn't controversial or it's not stirring the pot or anything oh like gosh. that. But back in the day, whether it was shortboarding or longboarding, you didn't have access to replay. So human beings make mistakes. There's human error calculations. And sometimes in the moment, you can't see those little precise and small things that actually make a difference. Now you can. And we have Chucky Regano up there uh, doing the judges' replay for them. They watched that thing a couple of times before they actually dished out the score. Well, Jefferson Silva definitely got his toes over the nose just then. And he had a nice kind of uh, bottom turn snap. It's pretty cool with... Uh, with longboarding that the actual kind of like pivot bottom turn <laughs> is a maneuver. Yeah. You know, it's not just a setup. Ooh, okay. Here we go. This could get interesting now. Rajman trying to answer back. He's trying to get rid of a couple fours. Three and a half to go. Jefferson Silva had a, a, about a half a wave. Did really nicely on the outside, but failed to make the connection to the sand. This is a good laugh too, Chris Lucas. Ooh, I see a nose ride in our future, and there it is. Nicely done, a quick 10. Big drop knee slash there. Longboard version of a tail slide. That drop knee carve. And again, just dropping the knee makes it look cool, and it makes it a little bit more difficult than mm -hmm. a standard cutback. Here we go, weaving into it, swiveling his hips. Gets the final snap. Little mini fist pump right there warranted as that was a nice wave so basically if you think of the judging criteria right get something cool done on the outside make it look easy all the way to the beach finish strong and clean mm -hmm. and you're going to get a good score i think that's exactly what lucas did on that last wave. but let's see what phil rodgman did here that was critical yeah so he got the five and as you said on a critical section difficult the drop out of it wasn't easy at all and then through this midsection just kind of waited it out See that little move right there is so cool when he's about to the cross step and he kind of hesitates and he he just keeps it there for a little bit. And then eventually gets a small 10 at the end too. It was a real small section at the end though, so I don't really know how much that's going to count in the end. But Lucas gets a 10 right off of the bat too. Outside section, larger wave, beautiful carve right there, especially dropping down that back knee too. And this is where I thought he could have done a bit more. He stayed really patient, didn't do any cross-stepping, stayed in the middle part of the board because he just wanted to garner some speed for the inside section. Gets a quick five right there and a little floater to finish. So I easily think that he's bettering his, four, bettering his 4.3. Now the real question is, how good is Phil Rosman's wave? Well, the answer to that question, pretty good, 4.7. So he does tie his high mark. It was another 4.7, but it wasn't enough. Now he needs a 4.84 still and way over the nose. Hey, hood ornament time. Jefferson Silva, weightless as all 10 toes. Get a nice little uh, front row seat. And now we go to the hip swivel to make the inside section. Ooh, a nice little quick cross step yeah, there. That was cool. Uh, that was the, the longboard version of a down carve. And he's from Ubatuba in Sao Paulo. I guess love Ubatuba. Guess who's leading the rankings in the shortboards? He's from Ubatuba, Sao Paulo, Felipe Toledo. 
Jefferson Silva's number five in the rankings right now. Can we see a double duty impact? Longboard tour, shortboard tour, Uma the, Tuba. The Brazilian longboard storm? <laughs> you, you need to throw that out there every time a Brazilian longboarder paddles out. Right. I think it's adequate, and I think it's cool. The, the San Clemente Cyclone. Long. Yeah, where are our San Clemente Cyclone log loggers? Karina Rosunko. She's out. True. San Clemente was definitely a hotbed of longboarding, you know, throughout the late 80s, early 90s. Sano's right there. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I feel like Sano is kind of like its own island, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a different planet. <laughs> Everybody surfs there. Great heat. That was a great heat. And uh, Jefferson Silva made it even greater. 13 point total to get the win. Garrido Leca in second, and unfortunately we do lose Rajman. But there's more action to come. You're watching the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Vans Duct Tape Invitational and a happy Jepson Silva walking up the beach. Why is he happy? Because he survived the dreaded elimination round. We're going to see him in round number four of competition. And the competition's happening right here, south side Huntington Beach Pier. And uh, we're just about to get going on the round number four. I'm Kaipo. This is the Waxhead, also known as Matt Shanaki. Thank you for joining me again. An absolute pleasure, Kaipo. My favorite subject, longboarding. That's right. Well, I think you have a lot of favorite subjects. I love, I love your insight in longboarding. But you know what I like also? Your appreciation and knowledge of surf history, because that's something we want to interweave into our stories here at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational, because not only are we celebrating the best in the longboard world right now, we're celebrating the culture of surfing. Absolutely. And, uh, Huntington Beach, which is considered Surf City in California. Santa Cruz may have something to say about that. <laughs> but the stories that have been written here in terms of professional surfing, uh, innovation. We have David Nueva with the nose ride, the, the, the nose riding prodigy, and it's such, such a fitting place to have the Vans duct tape and a, uh, a longboard world tour event here, stop number two, and leading into Malibu, the holy grail for longboarding. That's right. That is our calendar this year. We started in Manly. We moved on to Huntington Beach. We're going to have a world championship in Malibu where the points get doubled there on the classic California point. Uh, the surfers keep the best two 
results of the year out of the three events. And uh, we see Stevie Sawyer uh, from South Africa paddling out in this heat. Uh, we just had some reseeding. We had um, Kai Salas, who was actually in the competitors area. I was having a chat with him five minutes before. I said, hey, aren't you paddling out? He said, I'm waiting to see who I'm surfing against. He wasn't sure if it was going to be Full Rajman or Stevie Sawyer. So that's why we see Stevie paddling out. Heat hasn't begun yet. And um, Kai gets a little bit of time to himself out there in red, uh, our Hawaiian competitor. And he was saying he wouldn't have minded having um, perhaps Phil out there because he knows Stevie's capable of shooting that pier and those bigger <laughs> lined up lefts. But uh, Kai is also no slouch when it comes to commitment. And this is going to be a fantastic heat ahead. Kai Salas, three-time runner-up for a world title. The world title has eluded him, but he's been the runner-up three times. So that's got to be a burning fire within Kai Salas. Yeah, absolutely. And it's something that uh, I think has revitalized him over the years. Perhaps two, three, four years ago, you could see that pressure in his surfing uh, coming out, really wanting that world title. And his surfing, I mean, he's probably, along with Chloe Calmon in the modern era, uh, another surfer who probably could have won three or four world titles by now. Um, but it's just those points and those short years and, and limited opportunities had eluded them for, uh, you know, for victory. But here he is now doing arguably some of his best surfing, uh, especially with this uh, adapted criteria. Yeah, Kai Sal is, is uh, but he's up against a challenge in the way of the 2018 World Longboard Champ out of South Africa, Steven Sawyer. He's out there in the blue jersey. And Steven is... Uh, a force to be reckoned with. So this is a really, really, it's an, it's an elite heat when you look at the two characters who are going to be battling in this 25-minute heat, and the clock has just started. It is on between Kai Salas and Steven Sawyer. All right, and Stevie makes that paddle straight towards the pier. I think we all know what he's got on his mind. Some amazing left-handers heading into the pier in those last two men's heats. Uh, the women's was a little bit sleepy on that dead low tide, but that tide started to push in now. It was, now it was an 8.35 low, and Stevie opens up his account. Uh, quick two-step to the nose. Nice little slash as he heads towards the pier. And now uh, working his way through. So that wave not big enough to really push through the pier like yesterday, but uh, he's going to try and connect that inside right. And a nice little opener there for Stevie Sawyer. Here goes Kai Salas on the backhands. Recognizes where he's at in the wave. Kicks out and wants to hold position outside and maintain that priority. And uh, that was a good decision by Kai. You know, he's just going to get his feet in the wax. He hasn't had a surf this morning. Um, but, you know, on a, in a longboard heat, 25 minutes, two men, there's going to be multiple opportunities on a beach break scenario like this for lefts and rights. Pada bends. Jeffson Silva and Jeffson is up against the glass with our own AJ McCord. And Kaibo, every single person who comes up after their heat today gives us a big sigh of relief. How are the conditions? What is, what's making him tricky today? Uh, today, I think he's much better than yesterday. So the big challenge for us is keep doing, keep is the same the waves because some waves close, but it, it's same for all the surfers. But yeah, we're happy to be to be here. So. <laughs> Yeah, let's wait for the next. One of the things I noticed, you didn't have a leash on your board yesterday. You chose to put one on today. Why did you make that decision? Uh, yeah, sometimes I don't like to ride with leash. But yeah, in the yesterday, I, um, I don't lose leash. But today, uh, I have one more chance. And I, I think with myself, yeah, I need to lose leash because I don't want to lose my board. And um, yeah, and I make, I make the heat, I make the score. And now I'm so happy to be in the next round. You don't want to lose that board because it's so beautiful too. Not only the way you're riding it, but the board itself looks um, after the Brazilian flag. How proud are you to be riding for your country, representing? Uh, yeah, this uh, is it's, it's really the same Brazilian flag, and I, I make this one for the other competition that we're going to have in Panama for the next weekend, uh, where I'm going to represent my country, Brazil. And uh, it's a really good. Everyone to talk about the board and talk about the color. Yeah, Jefferson is really good, and I'm, I feel happy. Yeah. yeah. What, do you want to say anything to your friends and family back home? Yeah, for sure. I just want to say thank you so much for all my friends they watch in Brazil and around the world. I want to say thanks so much for my shape, Luffy, and all my friends for, from Portugal, from Brazil, to everyone. Can I say something in Portuguese? Absolutely. Estou muito feliz de ter passado aqui o round elimination. Agora eu estou no round 4. 
estou contente de representar o meu país, representar os meus patrocinadores. É, quero agradecer a todos pelas mensagens de apoio e é isso aí, vamos para o próximo round. Obrigado pelas mensagens, galera. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Valeu, valeu. All right, Jefferson Silva. Um... Coming through there, and we're going to see him later on in this round four. So we had a ride happening during that interview for Kai Salas, and we'll update you on the score. And it looks like we also have a score owed to uh, Steven Sawyer. So just beginning right here, let's check out the replays, Waxhead. So Stevie's second wave here, as you see Kai on the inside. So starting out quick, four steps to the nose, another little slash, uh, pretty similar to his last wave, a little less critical, though, on that opening nose ride. Shooting the pier that time. Other wave sending him through that way. Kai, backside, two steps to the nose, and a beautiful cut down, um, which is pretty much the only option to get back on that right. Um, and he, he's actually surfed that one all the way through and finished cleanly. So, you know, on the backside, Kaipo, even with the, uh, in, the, in the shortboard division, you see the Challenger Series. This is the type of wave where you've got to turn before it's time to turn. Yeah. If you leave it at the last minute and you come down with that foam, you will get bounced off nearly every single time. That goes for aerials, it goes for re-entries and floaters. Great insight, especially lefts into the pier where you're going to have those warbles and some of that you know, unrest in the water coming off of the pier and pilings. Uh, you want to get that down because the explosion, and if you're coming down with the explosion, it's very difficult to hang on. And uh, we talk about the leash, no leash debate, but there's actually something out there called an undertow, an undercurrent caused by those uh, 60 or so pylons that are in the water. And then there's like swelling of water and that can combust the wave. Um, we see Stevie there pulling off the top of that one. No love lost, he'll get priority back. But yeah, it's just this undercurrent. I've surfed out here and so have you and mm -hmm. you can feel it in between tide. It's like a whirlpool. Yes, it is. Um, and even more incredible when you don't have a leash and you make it look super easy. I, well, I like the fact that both these guys are just styling and they're confident enough not to have the leash. I mean, if they do lose their boards, they're going to have to swim. Yeah. That's all part of the drill. Tell me about it. Uh, on the beach this morning, <laughs> going for a little walk, and my beautiful linen, light summer clothing <laughs> is now heavy, wet, uh, soggy <laughs> linen clothing from Wax saving. Wax had saved a couple of boards, didn't you, this morning? Got to do it. And uh, they were on the shore, and the board just got, you know, uh, d you know, got dis. Uh, I guess you could say they didn't really fall off. They just flicked off and the board yeah. floated in, in this side current. I said, oh, my gosh, it's going to hit. I'm, <laughs> I'm coaching the opposition, but, hey, you've got to save a board. Yeah. That's also part of surfing, you know, camaraderie and, and uh, the culture. And, you know, we're surfers. We like to have fun. Your board, someone else's board, nobody wants to see a board get nope. dinged. I've been doing, I, I've done presentations and stuff where the boards are standing and I've like <laughs> almost thrown out my back when those boards, a you know, wind catches a board of yep. one of the athletes and you turn around and try to grab that board because nobody likes the, the sound of a, of a surfboard hitting anything hard hurts every surfer's heart. Only a surfer knows the feeling. Right. And, uh, <laughs> You know, even as a guy the other day paddling out, a, a beginner surfer, he had a, a, a vintage um, single fin on the beach. And I said to him, like, do you know what you, this board is? The nose is all chipped off. He's got a bodyboard leash on. <laughs> I said, man, this is worth like 600 bucks. Like, I just felt like my heart was ripped when I saw the big ding in the nose. Oh. He's surfing in the water and <laughs> someone had given it to him from underneath the house. But uh, Kai locked in a 510 on that opening left with that redirect to the right. Stevie out in the lead, though, with a 5.17 and a 4.17. And incredibly well-paced heat, I think, for Stevie. And um, Kai's not far behind. Yeah, evenly matched heat. And on the note that you were talking about the, the single fin, any of you out there listening and you have any boards from the 60s, 50s, 60s, or 70s, and they're in good condition, contact myself, Kaipo Guerrero, or the Waxhead, yep. Matt Chonaki, uh, will assess them. And we may even make a cash offer. Absolutely. Okay? So um, hit us up. That's it. Yeah, specifically, I've got room in my board bag. Um, <laughs> Randy Rarick sending over a Yada spoon for me, which uh, is the reason why I've got that room in the board bag. And uh, here's Stevie. See what this left does. Yeah, this one's not going to do it. It's going to see the warble from the, uh, yeah. from the backwash there of the pylons coming back. So it's a sketchy kind of one, that wave. Yeah, that's not going to factor into it. Low tide, you can still see all those barnacles on there from the low tide. At high tide, you can't see them. You know what? That was a, a talking point that I've had before. That's another great, great observation. You can tell the tides at the pier by how many barnacles are exposed. No barnacles, it's high tide. Lots of barnacles, 
it's low tide. Mm -hmm. That's that's a you know just an easy tide chart right there. Don't even need Surfline on there. <laughs> Free subscription. <laughs> Here we go with our actual tides today. 3:37 p.m. is going to be a five-foot tide. So throughout the day, we are going to be gaining water on the sandbar. How do you think that's going to change the surf out here? Uh, it's going to be really good for a longboard, actually. A little bit testing, as we see Kai scrapping into this one. Didn't see much of that in the last few days. Usually, as we even saw Honolulu slow down on her paddle in one of her. Right. As Pete Mel commented on that. You know, delaying her paddle so she didn't over paddle. But uh, it's going to move in on that inside bank, and we're going to see a lot of trimming and a lot of redirects, and I think setting up that inside section will be super crucial as that tide comes in. All right, 16 minutes and 20, 25 seconds. Let's see what our viewers and our fans thought about this matchup. We're going to turn to our Pacifico fan picks, and it is straight up the middle. 50-50, Waxhead. Mm. Kai Salas and Steven Sawyer. We talked about it even set up. Even the fans think so. Well, uh, Stevie actually beat Kai in that 2018 uh, World, World Championship, and Kai was ripping as well. But Stevie had some unpredictability. Uh, kind of not fresh on the scene, but not many people had seen him uh, internationally, and I think that really worked in Stevie's favor in that final uh, back in 2018. So there is some uh, some old blood here that the commentators don't often pick up. And um, go to worldsurfleague.com if you're watching and go to all the heats. Pick who you think is going to win because we want your data for our Pacifico fan picks. So uh, we want to know what you're thinking and thank you for watching. So Kai Salas with that paddle that we saw before, Wax said that he did lose priority. So that was a prior priority error. Yeah, and I think he, th he sort of thought that oh, he only needs a marginal score of 425 to jump in the lead. And if you can get on one of those and link to the inside, and you can do a few nose rides, a few turns, that's pretty much going to be the score. Uh, but it didn't break. And that's a sign of what may come as that tide comes in today, Kaipo. But hey, Kai's on a 9.6, uh, a and Stevie, I, I believe, is on a 9.4. A 9.4. Um, so yeah. I know Steve, uh, Steven Sawyer shapes his some boards. Do you yep. think he shaped the board that he's riding? I think so. Yeah, I believe so. Uh, it's a, like a high-performance beach break style log, uh, and he said it nose rides really well. Uh, it's got a the rails are uh, there's a lot of different rails, all mostly traditional log style rails where we say 50-50, whether they're pinched or rounded. Uh, but Stevie's is a combination. It's kind of full, and then it blades out into a into a more refined rail. Uh, which acts as like an edge. And Kai, beautiful tip control, and um, pops that one off. And he's going to try and set up this inside bowl. That was a great start. That's pretty much all you can do on a wave like that on the right here at Huntington. And Stevie in the background, four steps. Almost identical to that first wave, mimicking that. Beautiful angle here from the camera. And great tip control for, for Kai. Now, Kai, it's going to be very interesting to see where the judges go with this as the right fades away that left holds its size into the pier um very well surf wave from both surfers yeah that was a pretty good exchange i mean an even exchange we'll catch up on that stuff on the replays and now the surfers are kind of doing the paddle back out i think um steven sawyer by the piers in the fast lane though here we go let's start with kai salas all right sets it up perfect timing of that sidewash wobble we talk about and he just pops that one off just trying to keep that nose above the water um, and he sort of shuffles forward a little bit just to get that, that trim speed. And you see his feet there in the middle of the board, steps back onto the tail, redirects, beautiful little setup here, and he will just pop back on the nose, four steps up. It's all in the criteria, great tip control. Not overly critical on that last nose ride, but it's, you know, ticking the boxes for the criteria. And Steve doing the best he can. Once again, satisfying that criteria, four steps up in the nose, shooting the pier, and did he come through the here and oh we didn't see him come through there so he may have got collected or maybe he just hopefully flicked off in between well waiting for the numbers on that exchange um i talked a little bit about the equipment of steven sawyer self-shaped board the same is true for kai salas uh, he's a Kai Salas longboard company, so Kai also making his own equipment. So that's another nice little storyline between this matchup. Number came in for Kai as a 4.9, and that was enough to push him up into the lead. But the judges still owe us a score for Steven Sawyer. We're going to take a break and wait for that score. When we come back, we'll be, have that score more here 
at Huntington Beach on the shore. The Vans U.S. Open of Surfing is brought to you by Vans, off the wall since 66. By Flying Embers, official hard kombucha of the World Surf League. By Hydro Flask, every adventure starts with two simple words, let's go. And by 805 Beer, proud partners of Connor Coffin and the WSL, properly chill. Vans Duct Tape Invitational, part of the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. Thank you, Vans. Bringing radness since 1966. This one happened during the break, and this was a 6.67 wax head for Steven Sawyer. Wow. We'll see what happened at the end here, but that majority of those points will come from that opening uh, nose ride. You see him actually get to the nose, a little bit of levitation. It actually twist and turn while hanging 10. And as I said, that nose ride does... That board does nose ride really well, Stevie said, and I could tell just by picking it up. And this is Kai's answer back. You see if he uh, got done here. Oh, coming undone. Leashless as well, so hopefully it, uh, it didn't didn't go northwards too far and get, nah, he's got his board, no problems there. So just a point nine seven, a throw away there for Kai, but uh, Stevie, a six, six, seven. So taking back the lead there, Kaipo, and uh, all it takes is for a nice critical nose ride in that section. A little bit of risk involved, and he's got that score. I like, I don't know if that was an intentional technique, but it can be, when Kai Salas recognized, like, hey, I, hey I'm not going to make this maneuver. I don't have a leash. Kind of, you can pearl on purpose and, and make sure you shoot your board out the back of the wave so that it doesn't get in front of the wave and, you know, and get carried into shore. And that's, you know, again, guys, before the invent of the leash, there were a couple of things. You could kick your board out the back. You could pearl on purpose and torpedo your board out the back. There were a lot of ways to control where your board went um, when you didn't have a leash. And that was like a skill of a waterman, right? Because watermen are everything, not just surfing, not just fishing. You swim because you got to swim for your board or you're just swimming because uh, that's what we do in the ocean. And so I like that. I like seeing a little technique like that, old school technique. Absolutely. And uh, just I've got shades of Waimea Bay in the 60s there. And you had guys like, you know, Peter Cole at Sunset. And then you had um, even Greg Knoll. He yeah. was a big football player looking guy. But those guys could swim. Yes. Like their life literally depended on it. But more importantly, like other people's lives depended on it because those guys were the lifeguards as well at times. So, um, oh. Kai just hanging on there, getting that wobble under his board. And um, this one, he was, he's chasing a, a 6.74, so I'm not sure if he's not really on his way at the moment unless he can see something on this wave that we can't. Beautiful well, there you go. on the inside. And I, uh, he definitely could see something that we couldn't. Kaipo, and uh, he liked that. He, he liked that answer back, so we'll see how that one is faring with the judges. What do you think, Kaipo? Um, I liked it. I like he got an outside nose ride. He kind of like you know had to kind of glide through the middle of that wave got the inside tip ride as well so nice little combination for kai salas 6.74 it'd have to be better than last of steven sawyer however 
Jeez, but in this heat, we have talked about the tide a little, but wow, there hasn't been too many actual set waves mm. closing out in this. Um, and here's a replay of that. So he did get the 10 on the outside, straightened out, and it did look a little bit sleepy. And the judge will take note of that almost loss of control there for, for Kai, where the hands went up, window winders going. And um, yeah, he did link with two 10s and a slash on the inside. So it may be his best wave yet, um, but we'll see with scores still to lock in. And you can see the surfers paddling. St they're actually able to paddle out on the south side of the pier, um, not on the elevator on the north side. Yeah, that's right. On the north side, and so. that's because the swell's gone down, right? And, but there's still fast, the fast program? water. There we go. That's the support squad for Kai Salas. That's the Queens, Waikiki Queens squad right there. Kalis Kaleopa'a and her mom, Malia. And we can see Sophia also in the in the background so that's the uh, the crowd that comes from that classic surf break queens in waikiki you know so kai locked in a six on that last one is now he only needs a 5.85 kaipo so um he didn't do it in one wave but did he he did reduce his requirement correct but some, one judge went as high as 6.7 on that so uh definitely rewarding those hang tens so he's just getting that news now from the beach announcer and a little kick of the leg. See, now he's on the south side. You can actually see that current on that set pulling him into the pier. And he's, he's very experienced. And yeah, he, he might just go straight through now. Um, let's see what he does. All right, he's in that little well puller. We just talked about that. Yeah, definitely. And um, I mean, honestly, Ooh. We're sitting right here on the set, but there's, a f the f there's faster water mm. heading out on the north side of the pier right now. It looks like he's um, in a little pain there, perhaps, Ka uh, Kaipo. Um, you know, really sucking the breath, or maybe he's just taking some recuperating um, breathing there. But, um, yeah, see that, that current pushing him back. So he knows he's in there. He's, he, he will have the paddle strength to get out of it. But um, just kind of taking it easy, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, that's it. You know, it's when you see surfers, especially bigger wave surfers or in heats, people really doing those deep... Um, these, those deep cycle breaths, it can look like they're in pain, um, but they're actually just recuperating and getting this, so their breathing uh, balance back. And here's some sets. We haven't seen a set like this in this heat, Kaipo, where it's, they're sitting very close to the pier. They're not as far over as that previous heat, but that could also be a tactic from Stevie to, uh, to maybe four minutes 30 left on the clock. Maybe some, uh, he knows how savvy Kai is as a competitor, so Stevie might start playing that priority game. Well, here you go. Some of the bigger waves that we've seen this morning in heats. And Steven Sawyer with priority takes a look at it. Kai Salas is uh, upset because he thought that Stevie blocked him on that wave, made an effort to paddle for that wave. We'll see if the priority judge flips the priority to Kai Salas. Another look at it. What do you think? Uh, Stevie definitely made an active play at it. And he did paddle, and his board did move slightly, and um, you know Kai definitely sold him on it, but uh, it doesn't seem like we've had the, the switch around at the moment. So um, yeah, waiting, and yeah. you know I mean as a competitor, I, I believe Kai Salas should be pleading his case a little bit more, putting his hands in Absolutely. the air, letting the priority judge say, hey, did you see that? Yeah. What, what, what what's going on right now? But Kai just playing it cool. Yeah, it was a little, a little bit of showmanship by Kai, but why not? There's three minutes twenty on the on the clock, and you have a uh, a fierce competitor in Stevie Sawyer who's taking the lead. So, uh, but Kai, he, he, once again, he only needs a 5.85. There's we had a little shot of the priority indicator yeah. there, which uh, our beachside announcers will give priority over the microphone. But there's also priority squares on the side of the judges' tower, so you have a visual indicator of who's in first and who's in second. And that's something that a lot of the uh, the viewers at home don't get to see. And even Karina Rizonko mentioned yesterday she hasn't surfed in a WSL level contest for quite some time. And she forgot about priority. She forgot about the uh, the colors and where to look. And, and that is also something at every event that judging tower is, there's, there's eight tents set up on the beach here. Mm -hmm. There's eight marquees. And if you gotta you do your homework before you're here. Absolutely. Heat. Yeah, you get out there and it's been challenging like it has. The last thing you want to be doing is scanning the, the shore because the wave's been so solid and you've got the sea mist and the grey and the, the glare of the sunrise as well, which, of course, is rising behind us. Um, if you're in the colour white, 
which in this heat, it's a two-man heat, so we don't have that. It's really difficult to see which priority number you are. Yeah. Preparation, you know, it equals success. And um, we've got Kyle looking at this. So just a 585 required, and... That's not it. That's not it, but keep him busy. A minute 50 left on the clock. He knows he's got to get moving now. So... Uh, I'm hoping there's another answer back for both these servers. In the context of the, this heat, if priority was to switch during that paddle, that was a key moment in this heat. Absolutely. It would have changed the entire atmosphere of this heat because then Kai would be in a commanding position in trying to seek out that 5.85. So that was a really important moment. And keeping in mind as well that Stevie didn't compete in the Manly event and, and Kai didn't go as deep in the event as he wished, yeah. having been... Uh, you know, knocked out by uh, Carniella Stewart. So this Kai, means a lot to both these surfers. Yes. So, again, three events that we have, double points in the championships in Malibu. You take your best two. So that means every event's going to count for a Steven Sawyer. Kai Salas on the comeback. Gets the 10 in the whitewater, however. Great footwork on the way in. He's going to have to stay mid-board and really push down on that rocker to squeeze through there, get into playing the situation. the inside section. Four steps up to the nose. Nothing overly critical, but he pulls it, and he makes it Kaipo. So he's given himself the best opportunity with 35 seconds on the clock. That's going to be all she wrote for Kai Salas in this heat. And we'll see where the judges go with this one. But Stevie still may have an answer back with 30 seconds left. Kai will be waiting patiently for that score. Although his body language isn't really selling it to the judges. He has no fist pumps there, but he did all he could do in that wave. We'll see if Stevie's got anything on the outside. So, uh, You know, I think the size of the wave is going to hurt uh, Kai Salas' chance. And it does. It comes in at a 4.03. Not enough. Uh, this is just a ride to the beach for Steven Sawyer because he will be advancing into the next round. Kai Salas eliminated from competition. So big upset was a great matchup. Anyway, so we got another matchup coming out, coming your way. When we come back, Taylor Jensen, Jefferson Silva, they'll be in the water. Stick around. Steven Sawyer happily walks out of the water because he just advanced out of his heat and into round five at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. The South African surfer with a beautiful board under the, his arm <laughs> that he shaped himself. I'm Kaipo in the booth with Matt Shanaki, the waxhead, to talk you through this next seat. Taylor Jensen, Jefferson Silva. This seems like one of the more, I, I would like to say, 
maybe modern approach to longboard matchups that we have in this competition? Yeah, absolutely. We saw Taylor and, and Jeffson uh, have a really good battle back in our first event in Manly. Uh, but one thing I want to allude to when we talk about performance is the colors of boards compared to our Challenger Series and CT competitors. Jeffson out there with a Brazilian uh, colored flag surfboard and we saw Stevie walk up the beach with that marble resin swell. That's something we don't see on surfers boards very often, is it? I love the marble look, to tell Absolutely. you the truth. And obviously, right here is Brazilian pride and he's gonna get a ride into the pier, kicks out as Jefferson Silva's first ride. Taylor Jensen opened up with a keeper score. This is a six point ride. So uh, yeah, Taylor keeping busy on this ride. He, uh, he's been eyeing this off all week and um, just hot dogging his way through that. It was a nice open up, beautiful carve, setting up the inside, flawless connection to that inside section. I'm sure Kai wished he had this one uh, for his last wave in that heat before. Beautiful tip work for Taylor. And um, yeah, that was a great opening wave of six. And to be honest, that, that, that may actually be a little low from what we've seen. I thought that was a really well surfed wave. And here he goes again for the answer back. and kicking out the board as we just discussed he's got no leash on just pops it out the yep. back using that uh that forward momentum and just kicking the board behind him classic stuff right a skill set that is worth learning i mean i think we're i think right now what's happening is a lot of people are so dependent upon leashes that they're not learning the skill set of torpedoing the board out, being aware of where you're board. Now, look, it, it's not 100%. You're yep. not going to get it every single time. But just to have the awareness to do that, illustrated by Taylor Jensen. You could talk about the leash actually um, getting more people into the water and going into conditions that they're not capable of uh, holding their board. Um, but that was pure crowd control. I've done that, and so have you, in many places like Queens, yep. Malibu, even Sunset. Yep. That type of thing 100%. is very essential for saving not just your board it's not about you it's it's looking after that other surfer and, and it's leash or no leash it's about how you can control the board and coming from hawaii we have we have a saying if you can't swim in don't go out oh, oh beautiful ten and to hey, five. if you can't hang 10 like jeffson don't go out in your heat because <laughs> that was fantastic opener for our uh, our two-pack connoisseur uh our hip-hop uh, loving jeffson silver He's got, um, definitely has some uh, two-pack playing in his head right now with that flow. <laughs> and he finishes that off. What a great opening wave for Jefferson. Um, you know, a bit of left, go right, but uh, and maybe not the same control as Taylor, but I think the judges might like that, that hang 10. Is he really a two-pack kind of so Every he loves his hip -hop? That's, clip that, ah. that Jefferson will chuck up on his Instagram. Feel free to look up <laughs> Jefferson's Instagram. He's got two-pack playing, and I love it. <laughs> Here's a replay. He got some work done here. All right, showing some California love here for uh, <laughs> for Jeffson. Beautiful footwork. And it's a it's a it's a big board, but it's light as well. You can see it being reactive with those uh, with those uh, bumps. But here he is connecting and just trimming through. Beautiful footwork and manages to pull that up and jump on the tail. So uh, he'll be stoked with that opening wave. Oh man, I ain't mad at you, Jeffson Silva. We're gonna wait for that number to come through. And I'm expecting, uh, a, well, a 6.1 will take the lead from Taylor Jensen. Taylor Jensen, um, just with a six-point ride and a fractional backup. Taylor Jensen, a three-time world champ, 2011, 2012, and 2017. That's a lot of titles. Absolutely. And he's been right there in other years as well. You know, he's showed competitive uh, uh, prowess right throughout, and not just in the WSL, and a lot of amateur events and... Um, you know, pro amateur events as well. He's a big guy. I mean, he makes that longboard look like almost like a mid-length to me. Absolutely. He's always been, um, he's always had a really good aspect of control on all these longboards, both long and, and short, you know, whether the nine foot spectrum or even a 10 foot board. Um, still looks small on Taylor, but I think that's a testament to perhaps, I know it's been drawn before, but the comparison to his father-in-law, Nat Young, who also made uh, longboards look, um, you know, very comfortable under their feet and they're able to, to maneuver is, back and you forth. You know what, that's a great point to pick out. Uh, Taylor Jensen married to Nava, who's the daughter of Nat Young, and Nat Young, this is the original Nat Young, the animal, Nat Young, also a three-time world champ, Nat Young winning yep. in 88, 89, and 90. But the 66 world title too, 
which which we talk about vans being established in 66 oh and i've mentioned it before that was the pinnacle year for longboarding you had the, the best nose riding and you had the best turning and guess what happened six months later kaipo heading into 67 68 of course you had stuff like vietnam you had woodstock coming and you had the uh summer of love but we had shortboards that's right and that saw the end of that longboard era and as music changed as cars changed you know hairstyles clothing fashion politics Everything. surfboards adapted to to yeah. that and it became less about jazz and surf music and rock and roll came in punk we had psychedelic music and the shortboards went that way too tune in turn on drop drop out, out that's it you know, that was an error, wasn't it? And that and that was the beginning. That's why longboarding expanded so quickly in that era and also dropped off. And here we have beautiful tip work there from Taylor. And he is certainly tuned in on this wave. That was um, so clinical, the beginning of this wave. And he's still going. If you can get this inside, Kaipo, it'll be a, a really nice... Oh, Taylor Jensen just on fire in this heat so far. Wow. What that, a connection and what a well put together wave. Absolutely. And uh, Jeffson, 5 on 7 in his last wave. And he knows exactly what he's got to do. Phenomenal. Nose right oh, hand no. just coming unstuck, unfortunately. Um, but interesting to note about the leash. He decided to wear a leash today and not yesterday, which is very unusual. That's pretty counterintuitive because the waves were twice as big yesterday and the current was twice as strong. Absolutely. And less open waves, but um, each to their own, he'll get priority out the back. But let's watch this replay of Taylor and, you know, so controlled, four steps up. Um, you know, obviously a bigger guy and showing it on that turn, but those that really delicate footwork, um, super in control. That board's not reactive in a negative way. Um, it's just got the right amount of trim speed. And you see that trimming in the middle of the board, stepping back, those little adjustments. And, um, you know, just absolutely schooling right now. That, that was phenomenal surfing from Taylor Jensen. Um, you know, and Jeffson as well. If you could pull that off, that would have been a fantastic answer back, Kaipo. He was only needing a 1.44 um, with Taylor only holding on to that, uh, that single six-point opening ride as a keeper. But uh, I'm, I'm sure the judges are going to um, have a look very closely on that, and it might trump his first score. Last heat winner. We call him Steezy Steven Sawyer, and there's a reason for that. He's against the glass with AJ. So we were talking before this just about the difference in strategy when it comes from a two-man, when it becomes a two-man heat. How critical was that for you today? Um, you know, I really enjoy the two-man heats. Uh, priority, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, it's like a chess game. Me versus you, you versus me, and uh, just position, timing, knowing which waves are the ones not to go and to leave, you know. So I felt like I had it. Yeah. So, I mean, we've surfed a couple of heats against each other, and um, it's not to say that I know his strategy or what, but I mean, like, I just, I could just have a feeling out there that I was like in rhythm, and things kind of just led its way into how it ended, you know. And I'm super stuck. It could have gone either way. Like he had two waves that I let go, and they weren't quite the scores, so he got real close, but. Um, a little nerve-wracking, but uh, yeah. And towards the end, we saw you really utilize your priority to your advantage. What did you see there that you wanted to make sure that happened? Um, just stay on the inside. If he goes for a wave, I can turn and burn. It's my wave. If he gets in my way, he gets penalized. Um, a little dirty play, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that everyone was talking about how clean it was is your board. And I understand that, that the shaping of that board is something very special. Tell us the story of it. Yeah, so my dad's been making boards since he was 13, and it's just in the blood. So he's he's made my boards forever, obviously, and every step of the way, he's helped me make a board for that next step, you know. So later on in life, I was like, let me let me get a go into that, you know. So we've been making boards together for the last, I would say, six years now, and um, like proper hands-on, just me and him. So he had a couple ideas put into that board. I had a couple ideas and voila there you go how important is that for you to have the confidence and how much more confidence does that give you in your board i mean i know my board it, you know it came from the, my hands and my dad's hands so it's 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 special you know I, and also i can't blame my, my own equipment because i'm blaming myself anyway so it's, so it's it's all just in line you know well it worked for you this time we'll see you in the next one cool thank you
Hey, we want more of Steven Sawyer for sure. That was awesome. That was a great conversation with AJ. A few waves getting ridden uh, during that, but nothing that changed the situation. Taylor Jensen still on top. Jefferson Silva needing a 6.97. And who says longboarders aren't competitive, Kaipo? That was fantastic <laughs> insight. Uh, we were speculating in the booth, although I do know we both know those guys personally. Uh, but amazing to hear the uh, the punches thrown in terms of priority and the game. But uh, you know, punches thrown. Jefferson nearly getting smashed by that pile on that carve was a safety carve. But he did get a little link up, Kaipo. This was his 5.17, a uh, 5.70, sorry, and. You know, I think the judge is making note of that shuffle back and that they would call that a loss of control and footwork and making sure the board is looking, you know, controlled through maneuvers and flow was lost a little bit in that moment. Yeah, so clarify. A cross step is generally looked at in higher regard than a shuffle, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, it's just maintaining that trim and that natural momentum. What is trim? It's natural momentum. Uh, and, you know, Taylor's combining that with turns. Uh, cross steps, nose rides, and there we go. The cross step up. He's in the pocket here. No levitation, but driving through the whitewash there. And this is emulating that first wave. A little smaller, though. Uh, comes back left to right. Beautiful, spicy bottom turn. And this one, not cooperating. But um, I was surprised with his 6.67, the wave before last, Kaipo, that uh, the judges didn't go a little bit higher. Yeah. Um, but in hindsight, I suppose it, it wasn't a massive wave and there wasn't a lot of risk involved, but he surfed that for, you know, every little point that was involved in that, that wave. Well, with 11, five on the clock, we're gonna cross step into a break, but then we'll, be ba we'll shuffle right back after this. in beautiful Huntington Beach. You want to visit Huntington Beach, the home of the Vans Duct Tape Invitational and the Vans US Open of Surfing and the iconic Huntington Beach Pier. We're in the back half of heat number two, round number four with Taylor Jensen with a lead over Jepson Silva. So, uh in that break, Jefferson locked in a 6.17. So um, I'm interested to see the replay of that wave. And here it is. So let's see where he goes. This is his highest scoring wave yet. So a quick run to the tip. And uh, gets that hang 10 when that backwash lifted him up. And he, yeah, a little bit of elevation there. So the judges would like that. A shuffle back. And kind of like, a, once again, another safety slash to, to steer clear of the, the pier. As that tide comes in, you can see that reverberation. Um, he's in that trim spot. And that one not cooperating on the inside. But uh, I feel like if you could get an inside on that one, Kaipo, he might have got the 6.51 that he's chasing. Um, but I'm hoping in his head that he's understanding that he's got that outside nose ride section down pat. But it's, what's happening is he's hitting that pier section and 
Um, it's all coming undone. All that hard work is not being topped off with an inside bowl, where Taylor's just been fluid on those rights from start to finish. Um, so very closely matched heat. You've got the more critical lefts, but the precise surfing of Taylor on the rights. And I think I feel like Taylor is he's, he's probably thinking, what else can I do? Like he's he's really surfing what he's what's in front of him extremely well. Um, so this is a tough one for, for Taylor as well. He's sitting there seven minutes thirty to go, wondering what he can do to get into that excellent range. Silva breaks away under priority. And here he goes right. Cross steps to the nose, Ooh. five to ten to a dismount. Keeping busy there as we see a set looming and uh, a lot of action out there on the horizon too. We have a, uh, a freight ship and we have the, the lifeguards and fishing boats and of course we have the Vans US Open and the duct tape in the water. With um, I I'd like this a natural and a goofy footer. We had the same thing with uh, Stephen and, and Kai. So one choosing majority lefts, the other one choosing the majority of the rights. Well, as we wait for an exchange, I want to check in with Mitchell Salazar. He's on the surfer's deck. What do you got for me, Mitch? Hey, uh, gentlemen, I just actually wanted to touch and give my two cents on equipment and, and how these kind of conditions have actually favored certain equipment in contrast to others. As you're seeing big contrast in styles out there in the water, Taylor Jensen loves to use his rail, whereas Jefferson Silva, one of those people who actually likes to go to the nose as quickly as he can. But you gentlemen, we're talking about the use of those boards out here. And I think that we're seeing nowadays a lot more transition into more modern technology. Kaisala shaping a lot of boards, Firewire shaping long boards now too. And I think the thing that has changed the most as we're seeing Jefferson with the quick in and out is that we're seeing conditions be more, at, or boards, excuse me, be more adequate to certain conditions. A lot of times before, especially 60s, 70s, you might never have had that option to really kind of perfect those boards in a beach break like Huntington Beach. And I know you, Maddie coming from that area of Narrabeen in New South Wales. There's been a lot of different swells this year, so you've probably been able to try out different kinds of boards too. Well, fantastic insight there, Mitchell, because I've just released a longboard fin with FCS. I'm a traditionalist and a purist at heart, but I'm using a clip-in and clip-out fin system mm. uh, with a traditional single fin, and that's something that's very ironic for myself to be involved with, but uh, product of the environment, right, Kaipo? you got the technology, adapt or die, evolve or dissolve, and uh, Talking about adapting, and here we have uh, Jeffson. He's looking for a 651 now, and uh, that last wave, 617, being his highest scoring wave of the heat. So he's got the inside here, Kaipo. Let's see if he can get a connection here and a critical nose ride. And uh, more of a grubbly wave, but tapping it off the top. So more along the lines of what Taylor's been doing a nice combination go left, go right. But uh, we'll see how the judges go with this wave. Yeah, uh, my gut is that was not enough of a performance for that 6.51 for Jefferson Silva. He's still got time on the clock for a second wave. Um, but, you know, you're talking about equipment, you're talking about the fin that you develop. It was, it's a, was that like a McTavish type of inspired fin? So, um, well, we'll just watch this replay. Yeah, we'll watch and, the replay um, first. So Jefferson on his uh, nose right, his Luffy nose right, a beautiful upright 10 with a matching yellow knee leash. And, um, Beautiful, uh, beautiful footwork there. That's all he can do in that section as he waits for the ref reform. He hasn't had much luck with these reforms, so it's the first time he's actually connected through on the right. And um, but hey, he stays on his feet and he taps it off the top. So um, you know, all things considered, that was a really well surfed wave. And once again, he surfed what was in front of him. But yeah, the the fin. It's called the Waxed Industries fin. I'm all about traditional surfboards, um, cars, and whatever whatever else comes my way. I can't really be pigeonholed into one type of board or one type of uh, subculture. Um, but that fin, um, I ride McTavish boards, Bob McTavish boards, but my quiver's 50 or 60 surfboards deep from all over the eras. Uh, Wiz Fins, who used to do the McTavish fins, was a huge inspiration on me. I used to get whatever fins I wanted, whatever yep. templates. Um, but no, that Waxhead fin's actually an evolution of all my 60s boards. Oh, so okay. I've got templates of drawn, cardboard, and got them made. But the modern twist to it is that it's a, it's a toolless system so that it just kind of clicks in right and that's really cool because you can adjust the looseness or the tightness of your board of where you position the fin in the fin box correct and there's Game actually changer. there's five competitors in this event that are using my fin as well nice. so maybe later on I'll, I'll jump in the in the board area and go through all the boards for the uh for the viewers but um fins super integral as with surfboards but you don't want to change too many variables fins can be super technical 
Um, but if you can keep just your, your quiver of fins down to one or two different fins and then change boards and keep that same fin that you know, it's crazy. You can have a, the, a huge difference between a nine foot board and a nine foot two, but have a, the same fin in a 10 foot board. The same, um, the same applies to all surfboards. The same applies 100%. to my short boards. I, I ride the same template in all of my boards, but I just have them in two sizes. It's either yep. medium or large. large. So if I need more drive, I'll, be, I'll have a large in there. You want to loosen the board up, you put a medium in there. And when you're getting new boards, the one thing about keeping your fins consistent is you are eliminating one variable so you can really feel a new board because you eliminated that variable of the fin. And you can tell the fin is not the issue. Right. Um, and then from there, if you love the board, you can then change with fins. But and that's what my fin was about. I have that fin. I ride it in, um, you know, eight different types of longboards and transitional boards. Nice. Um, but yeah, stoked. Thank you for asking me about the fins. All right, the hunt's on right now in the final two minutes of the two-minute drill. Taylor Jensen with priority and the lead, sticking really close to Jefferson Silva. Now he's playing the game. All right, 5.47 on his last wave for Jefferson. Didn't go into his top two, and at this stage. He's really going to need to pull something out. And uh, we do have a set approaching. But hey, 6.17 on that left. If you can link it up to the inside, and that there's the score. So he knows what he needs to do. He's just got to try and find the wave now. Um, very similar circumstance to that previous heat as well. It's coming right down to the wire. This one is going to definitely go down to the wire. And, uh, you know, a three-time world champ in the way of Taylor Jensen knows how to structure heat, knows how to play the game. And I, th I think he's going to try to really reduce Jefferson Silva's chance of getting that score. Super experienced competitors in the water, but uh, Taylor's one of Jefferson's heroes. He said that on the webcast in a post-heat interview that uh, he was looking forward to a matchup um, last, last event in Manly. And um, that's amazing, surfing against your hero. You know, it must be intimidating. But he's bringing the, you know, he's bringing the... Uh, the gun to the gunfight. Yeah, he's not. He's not, he's not coming in. Coming in short. He's ready to go. And we have some action. As uh, you know, Taylor's pretty activated. And um, yeah, okay. So there is. There's two. He might get two chances here. This. This one. Let's see if Taylor's going. All right. Lost the priority here. So Taylor pulls the trigger. Starts off nice with a tight five, trimming through that midsection of the board. Power gouge, displacing some water, and he looks back to see what uh, Jefferson's up to. But this is a really good start for Taylor. If it has an inside section, he, he might, you know, build on that six-point ride. 15 seconds to go, and um, pops that one off the top. So a very professionally surfed wave there for Taylor Jensen. And we don't know if uh, Jefferson's got one out the back yet, and he's not looking like it, Kaipo. Yeah, he's not going to get there in time. There goes the Hooter, and it will be Taylor Jensen on to the next round. Jefferson Silva eliminated from a competition. More of the Vans Duct Tape Invitational coming your way right after this.
tape. This is premier longboard competitive surfing at its finest. You see two warriors coming back from a well-served heat, Taylor Jensen and Jefferson Silva. Taylor Jensen got the win in that one. Your surfer in red continues on. I am Chris Cote. This is Shannon Hughes. We've been Hello. loving what's been uh, happening so far this morning in the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. Yesterday, it was all about flowing through heats, no eliminations. Today, a bit more serious. Surfers are bowing out of this contest, and we're filling quarterfinals with some serious talent. It's so exciting. It's great to know that we're going to have those quarterfinals on today. For Taylor and Jeffson, they actually met up at the first event of the season for the World Longboard Tour in Sydney at the Sydney Surf Pro. Jeffson got the better of him in round four there. Taylor's got him back one here. It's a little bit of a bummer when friends like that always match up against each other, but they've gone head to head. And for Taylor, he has won so many events here in his past, starting all the way back to like 2000. Two, literally 20 years ago, he won his first event here at HB. So he's got some experience. Yeah, and uh, both these names you will recognize if you know anything about longboarding at any level. Ben Skinner, like you had mentioned, uh, he's been at it a long time, representing the UK. Kaimana Takeyama. Again, if you're uh, a fan of longboarding or surfing in general, you'll know the Takeyama name. And uh, that nose ride looks very familiar. Something in the uh, family heritage right there. As Kaimana Takayama makes his way to the sand. Of course, I'm talking about the legend, the icon, Donald Takayama, named uh, one of the 25 surfers who changed the sport by Surfer Magazine. He's a surfing hall of famer. He's on the surfing walk of fame. I had the pleasure of growing up, being able to watch Donald ride the nose at my local break every now and then, and it truly the thing of beauty and I see Kaimana Takayama a chip off the old block there oh, straight out of the family that was a beautiful opening ride as well here see where the judges go with it great nose ride good bit of rail work as well and oh, okay so Ben took off on this as his first ride this has come through as a 4.5 so this is a good kind of indicator for the heat really quick tap tap to the nose to start things off and then we'll see if he was able to get a little reform here and where the judges go with the score based off of that because it wasn't like a locked in hang five that's a really good one actually that's super critical and super difficult but again it's on that inside section so nice finish for ben score though just a 4.5 so judges going to reward that outside section a lot more kai with a nice five to ten stumbles a little bit Lack of control, lack of flow coming off the nose from that opening nose ride, but looked so much, like so much fun. And then finds this little connection here through to the inside, looking graceful as always, as any Takayama does when they hit a surfboard. And then goes for this little roller coaster finish on the inside section, gets the better of the exchange. Nicely done, a six point ride for Kaimana Takayama. His Puts dad. him in the lead for now. Oh, here we go. That's why I mean for now, because these guys are going to go wave for wave, no doubt. Ben Skinner takes the high road, goes to the low road. Now he's in the middle of the road, trying to make the transition from the outside to the inside, scanning the uh, surface to see where this wave will take him. All these surfers have displayed mastery of uh, being able to read the ocean, in, even in complex situations, being able to react that quick run what four feet from the middle of this board all the way to the nose in such a short span uh ben skinner right there making it look so easy although the surfing that he's doing right now is expert level it really is i think that's the thing that we're trying to hammer home to our audience there's so many good longboarders that have been the diehard fans over the last you know 15 years of broadcasted uh longboard tour events who know these guys so well because they're surfing with them at home as well Ben gets that big nose ride to float or finish for that outside section. Absolutely loved it. And then this nose ride on the inside is so good. But that is it. It's so extremely difficult to do what they're doing. These are highly talented surfers, athletes we could call them. And look at that little bit of a just kind of speed section lift out of that nose ride. That was really good, critical in the pocket on that inside section. A bonus to what he got done on the outside. So be curious to see where it goes in that conversation to what we saw from Kai's opening ride. Kai with a six had a really solid nose ride to start, which was lacking from Ben. But again, 
This isn't a nose ride contest. We want to see the use of the entire board. That's what we're talking about when we talk about traditional longboard surfing. So use of the nose and the tail and the rail. Yeah, exactly. We want to see all nine feet plus of these boards utilized. And they've so far have done a great job of that. Ben's last wave comes through to 577. 18.35 on the clock. Kaimana Takayama straight to the T of the pier into the danger zone. Sprays a couple barnacles there on that cutback. Fading into this mid portion of the wave. Just getting down low to get across this chunked up water. And now the glide. Can he make the transition? Close call. <laughs> well, we wait for the judges to lock in scores for those last waves. Let's go to Mitch Salazar in the VIP zone. Hey, Chris Shannon. I just want to talk about the legacy that Takayama family has, not only within the longboard community, but also within the World Surf League as well. Our head judge, Tori Gilkerson, actually a team rider for Donald Takayama Surfboards. Unfortunately, his passing a few years ago did catapult her into shaping now with Michael Takayama, who is Kaimana's father. So not only a big legacy impact within the Takayama family, too, but within the World Surfing family. And I know, Shannon, you're a big fan of Tori Gilkerson surfing. Talk to us about that kind of shaping bay that she's experimented with Michael in the past. Oh, that's such good insight, Mitch. I mean, you know, seeing Kai riding his dad's boards out here is always a pleasure representing Michael's boards. But for Tori, I believe she was riding the in the pink model when she won her world title back in 2016 and I mean thinking of that a surfer who's at a world championship level and has a world title behind her she's then getting in the shaping base so she understands the equipment and she understands the equipment of what everybody is riding out here she's now up in the tower watching the world's best and leading that judging pack which is just a really good thing for the tour yeah you definitely uh, you know all of our judges are great surfers Tori is an amazing surfer, so it's uh, we are in good hands, and the surfers are as well, under the watchful eye of our judges and our head judge, Tori Gilkerson. 16.30, here we go. From the outside to the inside, his last wave was a 5.77, and I was just about to say, I, I, I'm so shocked every time uh, surfers on these boards come to that inside section and are able to actually stay on the board through uh, that wild finish. Ben Skinner has to drop to his stomach. He will get credit for that wave. Maybe not as much had he ridden out clean, of course. But uh, that was nicely done. He's looking to get rid of a 4.5 as his low for now. So 16 minutes, surfers making their way into the zone as out the back. Kaimana Takayama taking a quick look. It's a no-go. That gives us the chance to catch up with the winner of round four, Heat 2, Taylor Jensen. We are here with Taylor and his beautiful daughters, Zion and Jagger. Taylor, we were just talking about how much life has changed since the last time you served here at Huntington Beach. You have two beautiful girls. How does this moment compare to just, like, how does this, how does this moment feel to have them both with you? Oh, it's great. I mean, I had a lot of success when my daughter Jagger was around, and, um, yeah, I got a world title with, with her there and her and mom's tummy. So, yeah, it's been good, but this is special, too. They're older now. They'll remember this, and, yeah, it's just a lot of fun. Life's just better with kids. What do you guys think of seeing Dad surf here? It was really fun. Yeah? Yeah. And you get to do it again, so how did you get it done today? Um, honestly, I think I got lucky at the start of the heat with that really good right, and that just kind of set the pace and just stayed calm and tried to make sure no really good lefts came to him because I know he can throw a huge score on those, so I yeah, just stayed busy and, and got the work done. Anything that you learned today that you're going to carry forward into more, more of the intense heats? Um, yeah, just cal stay calm. Like, it's really easy to get kind of frantic out there. There's a lot of waves, a lot of bad waves. So, yeah, just try and stay calm and be patient. Yeah. How proud are you guys of Dad? Yeah. <laughs> we'll send it back to you guys. Thank you, AJ. Yeah, Taylor Jensen has, uh, has really done a great job of kind of adapting to our the, the latest format of competitive longboarding. You know, he, he definitely was a standout through the years of performance longboarding, which... Uh, you know, I think for some critics, we're kind of glad that that's in the rear view, although that is its own art form as well. But uh, I really do like that, you know, we've kind of really honed in on uh, the style of longboarding because there are no rules in surfing, of course, but when you are in a contest, you've got to make it abundantly clear what the judges are looking for. And, you know, uh, it, it would be it would be kind of strange if somebody was out there you know, trying to do airs, going against somebody who's purely doing nose rides, you know. So we, we like to see 
uh, everybody come together and agree on a format. And you know, you can look at the phrase traditional longboarding and put a lot of emphasis on those two words to kind of see where we're at in 2022. I think we're in a great place for what we're featuring today, the sport of longboarding. Oh, I could not agree more. Ben here with another opportunity. Just a quick kick in and out. With that, I think the, the best summary of it, and I love that comparison to, we know Taylor has put down some clips in recent years of him doing some crazy airs, like out at Waco on his nine foot board. Yeah. But the change to the tour now is that we just want to be able to see what we can do without trying to shortboard a longboard. Yeah, he can do it all. He can do it all. <laughs> he can do it all. And uh, again, he's able to kind of adapt not only to the conditions, to the rules, to what the judges are looking for without changing you know, his trademark style without, uh, you know, we don't want to see people not surfing the way they want to surf, of course. But uh, it's just nice to get everybody on the same page. 12.58 to go. Ben Skinner in the lead for now, but this is still a very tight matchup. This is round four, heat three. One surfer goes through, one surfer's out. Who will it be? Stay tuned to find out. We'll be right back. Welcome back, surf fans. You're watching the Vans Duct Tape Invitational Ben Skinner v. Kaimana Takayama. Two very capable surfers in the water. Only one will advance through to potentially get the win. In a combined field of duct tapers and WSLers, this is the elite of professional longboarding in the lineup right now. Chris Cote with Shannon Hughes, and we're about midway through the WSL 2022 Longboard Tour, a three-stop series. We've got one behind us. We're halfway through one now. And your leaderboard is the who's who of men's longboarding. And most of these surfers are uh, still in this competition. If you look at the one through nine list, there are some ties as we're you know only one and a half events in. But we'll get to that list here in a minute. And as you see, Kaimana Takayama right there, fading onto that left, and the whole wave kind of just crumbled around him. So he's got to wait and try to stay weightless. Getting through that flat section right in the middle. There we go, a little quick hang heels. Bringing and a little Cole a Robinson tough way to do. <laughs> tough way to stand on the nose, isn't it? It is an extremely hard way to stand on the nose. So when the judges look at something like that, they obviously love the difficult factor of it, but they do want to look for functional maneuvers. So we want to see surfers that are doing those nose rides. If you could do a hang heels in a good section and it keeps that momentum moving forward and, and you're not kind of stumbling coming off of it to then maybe transition into the next maneuver, then they'll reward it really well. But if they're doing a maneuver like that in a section where it actually would have been better maybe to just do a normal hang tin to keep that momentum moving forward into the next maneuver, they'll take that into consideration sometimes. Yeah. Taking a look at that. I mean, that's super impressive. He definitely executed it very well. It wasn't like a crazy long held there, but it's pretty cool looking and it's highly difficult to do. Well, you're going to need to pull something, uh, pull a rabbit out of your hat right now because Ben Skinner 
does have a lead. Kaimana Takayama only needs a 4-2-7. It's still pretty even. Kaimana does have the highest single wave score of this heat, so he's in a really good position. This is one of the closer heats we've seen of the day. Great Britain versus Hawaii, Team USA. It's the first head-to-head -head matchup for these two surfers at this level. And I like what I'm seeing. I think they're both surfing really well. Their equipment's kind of different. Uh, ben surfing his own equipment with really wide tail. Well, actually, their boards are kind of more similar than some of the other ones in the draw. They both surf with really, really wide tails. Ben's has maybe a little bit more kick or lift in the tail, which helps facilitate really good nose rides. Um, sometimes when you have those crazy wide tails, like I heard uh, the wax head, Matt Shinaki, who's been in the booth with us this week, describing Ben's tail as maybe like 17 inches wide, yeah. which is literally the width that we would see of some of the shortboards in the draw this week. It almost looks like the tail broke off. Exactly. It's almost <laughs> like it's someone custom chopped built it on accident, that. maybe broke it in the shore break, like we've seen some other boards go down today, and can slap the fin on anyways. But that does facilitate a really wide field for the back of that board to sit into the pocket and be able to nose ride. Um, a lot of surfers have been riding boards like that. There's uh, Michael Takayama there alongside of the, uh, some crew that's been riding his boards. And he's kind of brought that into the conversation, that really wide base tail in his boards over the last few years. And we've started to see that kind of shuffle down into what other, other surfers from around the world are riding as well. Yeah. And uh, it, it is, you know, it's pretty cool that, you know, you have this, this uh, traditional approach to the boards but they're constantly upgrading, improving. I mean, they're, you would be very surprised, you wouldn't be surprised, but a lot of people out there would be very surprised as the subtleties that go into making these giant boards. Uh, that's why long boards, you know, are most likely gonna be more expensive than your average short board. But there's other reasons why they last sometimes two, three, four times longer. They're glassed heavier in most cases. Uh, you know, you see more glass on fins on a lot of these boards. So uh, these things are built to last. Uh, but trust me when I say there's constant improvements uh, on all the boards that these servers are riding. So when we do say traditional, it's kind of like neo-retro traditional. Totally. There's definitely some nuance to it. Also, one of the reasons those boards tend to last so long is because you're not surfing a 10-foot beach break on them. And you're not snapping them all that often. Most <laughs> unless of you're the in time, the duct tape in Huntington Unless you're in the duct tape in Huntington Beach yesterday. These surfers are not going to paddle out here on those days. I mean, they're more than capable of it, but they want to surf a board that's made for, sorry, they want to surf boards. They want to surf waves that are also suited to that classic longboard traditional style, like a San Onofre, like a Malibu. There's so many other waves in the region, even Blackies just down at the Newport Pier, which is a few minutes down the road. Those waves are just a little bit more suited to traditional longboarding. And so you typically see people that are owning boards like this that cost a lot, but that have length of life because they're riding waves that aren't going to snap them straight away. 100%. <laughs> 5.40 to go. There's Ben Skinner up on the nose. That's a familiar sight. He's been doing this for a long time at a very high level. And I just love the awareness, too. You know, he's he's already thinking about his next four moves as he's into his move that he's currently doing. He's been on the nose three or four times on this wave as well. And uh, he's just got that uncanny ability to correct subtle errors. You saw right there his nose went underwater. And no stress at all. He just jumped on the tail and pulled it right out as Kaimana now up to the nose, combos it with a turn. He's feeling good about that one, as he should. You know, a quick combo like that uh, made smooth is not easy to do, but Takayama right there did it so clean on that inside section. Yeah. It was all one motion. Exactly. And that's that kind of that flow that comes in the conversation, that flow and that grace, making the difficult look easy, making those transition between maneuvers look effortless. And... Kai is definitely displaying a little bit more of that in this heat than what we're seeing from Skin Dog from Ben. Great hang 10 to start things off. And then this is where that flow, that grace really comes into the conversation because he connects multiple maneuvers through here, has some good footwork just to that top third of the board to make sure he can cut through that flat section. Just something that the Michael Takayama boards do really well. Finds that nose ride and then look at how effortless he made that finish look. It was just like a little pet of the cat, rides out super clean. And the judges are going to love those little subtleties within Kai surfing today. Absolutely. You know, he's he's looking for a 4-2-7. We're still waiting for that last score to come through. Ben Skinner does have a 4-5 as his low number, so he could have improved on that score with his last wave. He does, albeit slight, a 4-8-3. So that increases Kaimana Takayama's ask to a 4-6. 
And the judges right now are taking their time to decipher all the you know, unique elements of that last wave from Takayama. I feel like in my heart it's going to be enough, but I'm not a judge. I'm just a fan. I'm the same with you. I'm so glad I'm not sitting upstairs. I do want to bring in a little nuance to Huntington Beach Pier is the paddle battle that happens in and around the pilings. So we just saw Kai take off on that wave. I watched him as he kind of came into the shadows under the pier and actually Ben was already under the pier starting to paddle his way up on the north side for that current. They kind of had to like shuffle themselves around each other there. And Ben's going to win the paddle battle. I think he's probably going to end up properly out of backline. There he is because he just had that little extra momentum on him. But that's something that uh, you don't have to deal with in every lineup, in every contest, where you actually have to get a nine and a half foot long surfboard through pilings, huge piles of concrete covered in barnacles that are in your way, and also navigate having other surfers with massive surfboards under their feet. Yeah, just to add, add to the danger element. Well, this next heat's going to be real fun. Evan Skvarna and Lucas Garrido, Leka. It's going to be a really good one. They've both been on tour for around the same amount of time. They've both uh, around the same age as well and have come from different styles of surfing kind of within their own backgrounds. Kevin's always ridden really traditional surfboards for a few years on the tour. So we see that score for Kai Takayama. You nailed it, man. Well done. Hey. Coming into the longboard family, well and truly. Of course, you're a man of all crafts. Ride it all. Ride it all. Don't, don't limit yourself. You know, I, I used to be... Shortboard, that's it. Don't even talk to me about anything else. Now you look at my quiver, and I'm just as weird as everybody else. And, you know, shortboards, mid-lengths, longboards, boogie boards. Bring it. Uh, yeah. It just uh, increases the joy of surfing. You know, if you limit yourself to just one type of board, you're doing yourself a disservice. And you're, you're hindering your ability to, you know, enjoy uh, one of the finest ways to ride a wave. And that is on a longboard. Uh, for me, I prefer riding longboards on really, really small waves because these boards are pretty scary to ride in waves that waist higher over, I would say, uh, especially at a beach break. You know, it's so deceiving when you watch these surfers in the lineup because they make it look so easy, which is pretty much in the rule book. You have it's to make it criteria. look easy. Um, but yeah, you would, you, would, uh, you would watch me out there fail a few times it's these boards are pretty hard to turn i mean that that is kind of like the baseline thing to just drop in and do a bottom turn is difficult definitely takes uh, some skill and some technique to it which is why these guys are the world's best it's not something that can translate even if you're the best in the world on a shortboard it doesn't mean you're going to be able to paddle out and handle having this much weight underneath your feet that's also part of the conversation these boards weigh so much that sometimes airlines won't let you check in more than one can't even get two boards in the bag, not because of size. They'll fit into a good travel bag for a longboard, but depending on the weight behind them, your airline won't even let you check that bag in. Yeah, you know, you're, you're watching surfers on the longboard tour. Wow, three events, Australia, Malibu. This is so, what a life. And then you say, take your longboard uh, anywhere on a plane, and it is, uh, it's brutal. You know, I, I know a lot of longboarders like yourself traveling with two boards at some, you know, most times. And uh, I mean, I travel with three five sevens, so I still get eye rolls behind the counter. You bring two nine sixes, they're, they're not going to love you. No, nah, you're looking at at least hey. a 30 pound board bag. You got to do what uh, you got to do. Or more, 50 pounds sometimes. Ben Skinner there doing what he has to do to try to get a score. 6 2 0 is the requirement, and this will be his last chance. So pretty good out the back, but this wave not helping Ben's cause at all all trying for the hand paddle it won't be enough so unofficially kaimana takiyama gets the win over ben skinner that was a great heat that was a great heat well done to kai riding boards that are literally shaped for california waves so it's understandable his equipment under his feet looking really good ben with a good effort but for him he's already got a second place on the rankings this year because he finished runner up in manly so he's looking really good heading to malibu even though he's out of competition and you saw a quick shot there michael takiyama dad is stoked Kaimana makes it through. We got more action to come. The Vance Duct Tape Invitational cruises on. Stay tuned.
restoring some of the oysters here in the local area of California where I'm from. Uh, the more I can learn about the environment and how to help and what's going on, the better. So just for my own personal knowledge and growth and to be a helping hand. Today we are going to be stringing Pacific oyster shells so that we can put them into our restoration site. We're working on some oyster restoration. These will get placed over in Long Beach Harbor and help attract the oyster larvae to reproduce. To come here and to have a, an organization that will give back to these oceans here locally, it's so important. It really touches on our original lifestyle, particularly as indigenous people, on what it took for us to sustain ourselves. We are trying to restore our coastal ecosystems to make them clean, fishable, swimmable, drinkable, and enjoyable for everybody that comes to visit. A side note, Oyster Larvae is playing Coachella this year, so get your tickets now. In all seriousness, love what Shiseido and WeAreOneOcean.org have been doing all around the world. And I love what this young man just did in that heat. Kaimana Takayama, 11-9-7 against Ben Skinner's 10-6-0. That's the kind of tight matchup we like to see. And I'm sure we're going to see more of that as we get into man-on-man -man and surfer-on-surfer -surfer competition throughout the rest of this day. Right now, we've got Kevin Skvarna and Lucas Garrido Leca, and on demand, like your cable television, Kevin Skvarna on the nose, straight from the takeoff. Which stance is he? I have no idea because he is so good, either goofy or regular or straight, traditional, prone, whatever you got, Kevin Skvarna can do it well. He is a master of it all. That was a really, really good Hank Five soul arch to start things off with. And he's up against Lucas Skoretaleka, who has made it at least to the semifinals on this level of competition. Um, Kevin's made it into the finals before at this level of competition. Different types of waves that they were surfing uh, at that stage. And so Kevin made it into the finals at Nusa, which kind of suited his style a little bit more. Lucas made it into the finals back in 2019 at, in Taiwan at the World Longboard Championships. Walked away with a third place finish, which was a little bit more wild kind of conditions. Big left hand uh, point break, rocky. It was about eight to 10 foot that day. Just as, you know, swell always arrives for the short borders. I mean, sorry for the long borders, but not the short borders. <laughs> You see Lucas Garrido Leca now slashing it back. And so I can tell he is a regular footer, judging by where the leash is. Uh, there have been few instances in the past where surfers have their leash on the front foot. Kevin Skvarna there having a deep look at that last wave. Curious to see where the scores are going to go for the first exchange between those two because Lucas also had a really good nose ride to start. Seemed to be favoring that left heading into the pier. And I did hear Taylor Jensen, I chatted to him before he paddled up for his heat, hoping that the rights were gonna start to come into play. Taking a look at that soul arch, that is so sick. That Just could be the cover of the pamphlet for next year, a oh. soul arch right under the pier, come it on. It should be, it's Kevin Skavarna. He should definitely be on the cover with his handlebar mustache. And uh, judges loved the look of that one. Taking a look at this one, a little bit different. Maybe more control coming out of it. He didn't lose control coming out of the nose ride the way that Kevin did a little bit. Went in for that big turn as well and then, you know, goes from his uh, just a little switch stance in the mix there. Kevin just caught this one as well. Let's see what he what kind of work he got done. Finds that quick nose ride, flat section. Finds that trim line throughout, but not highly critical by any means because that wave is so slopey. Keeping that fluidity though, that flow in his surfing. Oh, that was a nice section. That was way more critical than that outside nose ride. Goes for that little jam, kind of similar to what we saw from uh, Lucas on that jam out the back. Little Larry under the pier. Nice. Danger and, zone. You know, I did fail to mention something about Kevin. Uh, I said he's great going regular. He's great going goofy, prone, traditional parallel stance. Also a ripper on his knees. He just competed in his first ever kneeboarding contest and did very well. He's a natural on all types of craft, and I would love to take a peek into Kevin Skavarna's garage and see the uh, vast diversity in his quiver. I've seen all types of clips from Kevin Skavarna, not just nose riding, slashes, airs, carves, drop knee, L rollos, whatever you got, Skavarna can do it. 18.32 on the clock. 
Skvarna in the lead for now. That last score comes through a 6-3-3. Well, we just saw uh, an incredible performance by Mr. Takayama. He's standing by now with AJ. You just called that heat a nail biter. What about it was so um, was so nail biting? I just uh, I have a lot of respect for Ben Skinner as a surfer. He's number two in the world, but you know we just went back and forth. I got a good score on our first exchange, and there wasn't too many great waves coming through for the rest of the heat. So when they heard that I only needed a four something, my whole strategy was sit and get one that you think is a five. And I got one I thought was a five, threw my hands up. I waited, you know. Normally I don't claim, but I'm pumping out there, you know. I've wanted to be with the WSL and surf in all these contests for so long, and I finally got the opportunity. And now to have made the quarterfinals, you know, I want Malibu. You know what I mean? I'm not on tour. I'm a regional replacement seed, but I know there's some wild card spots. You know what I mean? I just, you know, gave number two a little shock, and I got a lot of respect for Ben. He's such a good surfer. But I'm here, and I've shown my presence, and I'm ready, and I really want to perform for everybody. You know what I mean? Yeah. How much does this validate all of the work, all of the grinding that you've done to get to this point? Oh, I mean, the second that I got the invite, you know, I haven't gone to work in three weeks. I've been doing nothing but surfing and surfing and surfing. And just to be in the quarters, I think that puts me somewhere top eight. That is a huge result for me already, you know what I mean? So I'm ecstatic moving on. I got a bunch of friends that I'm surfing with in this event, and I'm just really stoked to be here right now. How much confidence does a win like this give you moving forward in the competition? It's huge, you know. I know what he's done out there. You know, Ben is one of my favorite surfers to watch. And as a competitor, he's tough, man. He is super tough, but he plays the game well. I had to play it well, and, you know, things happen, and I got lucky. So I'm really stoked, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm fired up, honestly. Awesome. Yeah. Congratulations, we'll see you in the next round. Right on, thank you guys so much. <laughs> the humility right there, he got lucky. That was all skill from beginning to end, made that a great heat and uh, gets the win. And I love that he's, you know, giving absolute respect and full credit to Ben Skinner, knowing that he was going to be such a tough competitor in the lineup. So with 16 minutes to go, Let's take a look at uh, some very unique and cool dance moves on this surfboard so by unique. Lucas. Oh, that was a really good nose ride. Coming into it, he was coming in from behind the section and then just loses control, does a little spin around on his tummy. Belly spin. That's Belly a bodyboarding spin. move, technically. Oh, right. Sort there of. we go. Add that to the criteria. Yeah, break dancing move, too. You kind of mix things up in longboarding. Back to Anything the goes. knee boarding conversation, we'll actually currently the World Longboard Tour standings. Surprisingly, yeah. we don't see Kevin Skavarna in that mix because he didn't compete at the first event of the season. This is a shot. Yeah, and uh, you see Harrison Roach up there. And just like we have seen on the Challenger Series leaderboard, same goes for the men's longboard tour. A lot of names already blanked out. Harrison Roach has been so strong throughout this entire event. You say Kaniela Stewart there in third. He has room to grow as well. Declan. And uh, down at the bottom, Tony Silvani, he could make a big leap if he keeps surfing the way he has been. Meanwhile, Kevin Skvarna on the nose, drop knee, G-turn right there, fading right. Right there, there's the parallel stance, a parallel semi-layback. And a backside sole snap with a frontside straight ollie. There you go. That's a great combination platter right there for all of us to enjoy. That was very cool. Well, I'll just digest that for a second. Take a minute. Take as much time as you need because I'm about to ask you some hard questions. All right. So we're watching Kevin Skvarna right now. I didn't see him on that top 10 list for the WSL World Longboard Tour. Takeyama, on the other hand, just talking about making the quarterfinals, thinking, well, this could give me a, a decent shot. But, you know, rules and regulations, rankings, all that stuff. Could Takayama be a world champion? He definitely could be a world champion this year. Look okay. at this nose ride starting out for Lucas. That was a good section on the outside. It's so tricky because it goes so flat right there that you really got to make sure you pedal back to keep that speed moving forward. Or you just give a little kick. <laughs> that, you know, kick. kick the water, keep, keep yourself going. So some scores come through. But yeah, so technically Kai's not on tour this year. Uh, which he, in every sense, deserves to be, except that he's been battling it out with the world's best, and it's hard to get yourself onto the list when there's only 20 surfers in the draw. It's a very small field. Um, same as the championship tour. It's very hotly contested, and we could see, you know, 
10 to 12 surfers going down the list that aren't qualified that are absolutely at the level where they should be, which is like what we see at the end of the Challenger Series every year, where you're like, oh man, if they'd had a different result, we'd see those bottom 10 also in that mix. So for Kai, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that if we see a winner at this event on men's or women's side, who's not currently qualified for the tour, we are highly, highly likely to see them get the call up to compete at Malibu. So there's already guaranteed 10 surfers that are qualified for that, who qualified by being in the top 10 last year. So we got, uh, you know, our world champions, as well as going down that list, our surfers that finished within that top 10 conversation are definitely gonna be present at Malibu. Then there's some seats to fill in below that. That could go to different regions. There's a few different things happening with the rankings. And maybe by the end of this event, we'll be able to get a chat in with Kira Seal and, and our new uh, manager for the Longboard Tour to get an official update. But I do think that once you start talking about a winner of an event, like a Harrison Roach uh, or a Honolulu Bloomfield, they've got 5,000 points to their name. If we see new winners at this event who don't have themselves on spot, they're gonna have 5,000 points to their name and they are front runners in the world title race. We've got to give them a shot heading into that at Malibu. Absolutely. And speaking of heading to Malibu, it was a Malibu style nose red right there. Kevin Skvarna straight up and into it, cross stepping to the nose. And now cross stepping his way and swiveling his hips through this flat midsection of the wave fades left. Little snap float there, good way to finish for Kevin Skvarna. He has a 6.33 and a 4.17. He's in control of this heat so far. We'll see what the judges uh, throw out there for that last wave. I really liked it. It was a lot of variety in his maneuvers. Nicely done, nice and smooth. And meanwhile, Lucas Garrido Leca wave did not pan out for him, and I believe we're going to see a paddle race to the takeoff zone. That wave's not going to help your race. It's going to knock you back about 20 feet. Longboards are. Not easy to duck dive, maybe unless you're Ben Skinner. Yeah, unless you're like got Ben's shoulders or Taylor's shoulders or something, or you're riding something kind of light, you can sort of almost get under. There's like a, a spoon, kind of like a shovel movement you can do with it, doing one rail down first and then the other rail, other rail like a scoop, but it's pretty difficult. Now thinking about some results that we've seen coming through this year, Obviously, we're running the Vans Duct Tape Invitational, which is a WSL sanctioned event. So all these surfers haven't kind of technically been invited. They've qualified for this event. But there has been some other duct tape events going on around the world. Kevin Skavarna just took out the win for the most recent duct tape invitational just last month in South Musenberg Africa. in South Africa. But that, uh, there's no points from that that go to your World Surf League. Okay. Exactly. Nothing to do with the current situation for WSL going towards a world title. This is the first ever that a duct tape event has been included in that conversation, which is a, a great move in the right direction to getting more events on the World Longboard Tour. But for Kevin, it was a career highlight for him. It's probably the most significant win that he's ever had. It's the first time he's won the duct tape invitational. And to be able to do that against the stack of surfers that he had there at Musenberg, small, fun conditions. I was there for day one of competition. Uh, had surfed for a few days beforehand, and it's a really soft, slopey wave. Um, runs a little bit better for longboard typically than Huntington Beach does, but maybe if you get some of those connectors through the inside, it can be a little similar. Needing a 6-2-4, we got Lucas Garrido Leca. Good start there. Wasn't the longest nose ride, but it was done in a pretty critical spot on that wave. And now he's just scanning the shore break. Which way do I go? He's fading left, a little quickie. Five to 10, straightens out, job well done. It was, uh, uh, I would say, you know, mid-range mid score. He does need a 6-2-4. That would be almost the highest single wave score of this heat. So uh, I don't know if that had uh, the excitement or the creativity that we saw from Kevin Svarna's 6-3-3, but I think it's gonna be a decent score and most likely will replace that 3.5. We got 9.14 to go. Can Kevin Skvarna hold off Lucas Garrido Leca? You're gonna have to stay tuned to find out what happens next. This is the Vans Duct Tape Invitational.
Welcome back to the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing, the world's largest action sports festival right here on the south side of Huntington Beach Pier. We are in peak summer mode. It's about 85 degrees out there, and it's only 11.15 a.m. Friday, August 5th. We're into the business end of this event. Coming up Saturday, Sunday, we've got skateboarding. We've got surfing finals. We've got a 1,000 hot dogs about to be grilled by Steve Van Doren. It's all happening right here at the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing, and that includes the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. This is World Surf League Championship Tour Longboarding, and uh, here's the schedule for the rest of the day today. Our retail store is wide open for you. The Vans Street Market is raging. There's record stores and skate shops, and it's local businesses being on display here in on the sand in Huntington. The Van Dorn Village is where the fun and games goes down. And I'm being literal with that. There are games for people to play. And uh, the Duct Tape Festival board demos run until about 4 o'clock. And those boards look super fun. You can ride a board that is Zion Wright shaped, that Dakota Road shaped, Holly Wan. Troy Elmore shaped a couple boards. He is a professional shaper. So, you know, when you put your reviews in, just remember <laughs> three, one of four professional shaper. Actually, maybe has been doing this for a while. He's been he's shaped a couple boards. He shaped a few. Look, look, I got a hat with his name on it that says surfboards on it, so you know. How fancy of you. He's legit. Yeah. Five forty-five <laughs> to go. Kevin Skavarna drops another hammer, a seven-two-three, so increases his lead over Lucas Garrido Leca, who now needs an eight-point-zero-six. He's got a five-five and a four-eight-seven, and now he's in second priority. Now time's going to start to fly. Kevin Skavarna with a uh, well-surfed heat so far. Here goes Lucas Garrido Leca. He's staying busy under priority. He's had a couple looks at a couple little waves. Nice little drop knee, cut back, fade. That wave's not going to mount anything, though. I can start to sense that little bit of urgency with him. Um, I think he really wants to find himself with a good result. He only had a ninth place finish uh, at Manly, so he's got some work to do to try and get himself a better ranking here. He's also chasing a huge score now of an 8.06. And I was just thinking about the Peruvian crew we had down here, and there they are. Daniela Rosas, Maria uh, Mafa, who has been hanging around and giving some tips to Lucas. They're just so supportive of each other, as we see Kev up and riding on his way through to the inside section. He's going to try and get a quick nose ride there. But Lucas actually in his corner, and they've been so supportive on both sides. So we've got the Challenger Series here running, obviously. Luca Messinas, Daniela Rosas, Arena Rodriguez, that are all competing in the Challenger Series from Peru. They've been down being supported by the longboarders, by Maria and by Lucas, day after day. And now they're down here supporting the longboard crew. That was a really good outside nose ride for Kevin. And huge kind of layback snap, setting himself up through the inside. Tries to go for this extra section here, and this is where things just kind of get away from him. But that outside nose ride was really good. Fumbles on the inside. Might come through as one of his highest scores of the day because it was really, really, really cool. But for Lucas, I just uh, wanted to mention that I saw Luca Messinas, championship tour surfer from earlier this year, down giving him some coaching advice in between heats. So it's cool to see that contingency supporting across multiple crafts. Yeah, no doubt. And, uh, you know, I, I guess... Uh, again, everyone is talking about the Brazilian storm, and they have been for the better part of the last 10 years. The togetherness there is rubbing off on a, a lot of groups of surfers. 
and hopefully that tradition continues. It just lifts everybody's performance level up. And speaking of performance levels being re re lifted, come on, Kevin Skvarna now dropping another one and 7.90. And uh, that is a huge, huge heat total. 15.13 heat total. That'll get you through any heat today. Poor Lucas. I think he just kind of doesn't have a chance anymore. He could get himself a near perfect 9.63, but it's going to take one of those perfect waves to come through as well. That was really solid surfing from Kevin. I'd actually love to see that 7.9 again because that outside nose ride was really critical. Remember, he fell on the finish, but the judge is clearly rewarding that critical section at the start of the wave, his commitment levels as well, knowing that if he falls on that nose ride, he risks the entire rest of the wave. Now up and riding again. That was such an awesome turn. You know, I, I feel like a, a turn like that on your backhand, especially on a log like that, super difficult. It's all, it's balance and it's just the, everything needs to be in its proper place. He's also one of those surfers that's very good at engaging the rail. As we take another look here at the 7.9, so great footwork up to the tip, finds that hang 10, and now you can see all that distance between. That is a proper, critical, in the pocket hang 10. Goes for a massive turn coming off of it, engages the whole rail. He doesn't just pivot that board, but he really engages the rail in the surface of the wave, and that's why those judges, why a few of them went into that excellent range for that two turn combo. Lucas with a great hang 10, but maybe just stuck onto it a little bit too long there. It looked like a more difficult section to navigate as well. Came off with some grace, gets those cross steps, reforms here on the inside. Let's see how this answer back looked at the finish. And I like that he really got that opportunity. That was a really long hang 10. But again, sometimes you kind of almost want to see someone not go for the length. You want to see them go quite for that quality and maybe be able to keep some of that momentum coming into the next section. But the judges might really like it. I'm not sitting upstairs, and I'm really thankful for that, as we've been saying this whole contest. Uh, but that one from Kevin was really, really good. And when we talk about turns and longboarding, Chris, we really want to see surfers engage that full rail rather than pivoting like a shortboard. Right. That's one of those differences where we want to see surfers do really good, powerful turns on a longboard, but it's got to be engaging that full rail instead of kind of shifting from the tail. No windshield wipers. Exactly. On a long or shortboard. And that's Kevin looked exactly the opposite of a windshield wiper, except for the amount of spray he was throwing. <laughs> exactly. So 47 seconds left as we wait for scores. Kevin Skavarna well into the lead. Lucas Garrido, Leka would need a perfect wave and a perfect performance in order to get that 9.63. We know he's got it in him, but uh, he's going up against the clock right now, which is flying by. And uh, this round and this heat could potentially be spearheaded by Kevin Skavarna. That score just a 5.47, which is a good score for Lucas. Uh, it actually comes through as the second highest. But again, just that quality of wave didn't quite facilitate getting him into that bigger score line on the opening nose ride. Kevin's looking like he could be one of the surfers to beat. His surfing is really maturing into the likes of a Justin Quintal, who's just like a nine time duct tape invitational winner. And he found himself a little barreled finish. Yeah. This little head dip in the shade of the pier. Now he's in the pier, <laughs> still in the pier. He's officially shot the pier. Kevin Skavarna, a masterful performance out here in Huntington Beach as part of the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. You're watching the Vans US Open of Surfing, and we've got more to come. We've got Waxhead, Kaipo, and a special guest. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
south side of the iconic Huntington Beach Pier. And this is the venue for the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. We're into round four, heat number five. And I got a special surprise for you. Tanner Godowskis is with us. Oh, thanks for having me. <laughs> Surprise. Surprise. <laughs> Hopped over the couch. I'm, here I am. Uh, along with the Waxhead, Matronaki, as well as myself. I'm just Kaipo. Um, Tanner, thanks for coming in. And we got some uh, really good longboarding, as well as uh, currently number one in the rankings, Harrison Roach, starting this one off. Roach, a stylish surfer from Australia, has come close to a world title before, but it has eluded him. Will 2022 be the year for Harrison Roach? That was last year, wasn't it? Yeah. So close. So close. And there, Harry just ejecting from that wave. Harry just ejecting from that wave as we had uh, no leash, obviously, moving towards that pier. So he just got down low, grabbed those rails while the uh, momentum of that wave um, was carrying him. Probably a good opener. He's happy just to finish on his feet. Um, yeah, interesting. And then we had Tosh start off with the wave waiting on a, uh, on a score for this. So, of course, choosing that left, um, you know, knowing Harry's probably going to favor the rights, uh, a good option for, for Tosh to work this inside and see what he can do with the... Uh, with the reef on beautiful trim there we talked yeah. about that cross step trim we see that thomas surfboard uh carrying its momentum through section connecting looking activated and uh see if he finished off cleanly on the inside which he did in a little tap five and looks like he just shot the pier so it was a 317 for tosh locked in here's harry's replay um beautiful 10 and we noticed just out in the water then in those last two heats and noticed the wind was to come up kaipo uh, we've got a little more wind on the surface than yesterday, so you can see that reverberation around from the pylons, but also in that outside section, making it a little sketchy. But Harrison, once again, also on a Thomas surfboards, smoothing that wave out and, um, yeah, just cutting through it like butter. So we'll be waiting for the score for Harrison Roach. Tosh Tudor already with a 3.17. And it appears that uh, I got a feeling that Harrison Roach is going to have the best of that first exchange. Tosh Tudor, just 17 years old, out of Del Mar, California. Great surfer. And uh, he's, you know, he said in his first seat he had some butterflies, uh, but he got that out of his system. We already know the talent of Tosh Tudor. Yeah, and, uh, you know, certainly surfing like... Uh, other goofy footers from generations past that we keep talking about. And I, I think the thing with Tosh is he surfs with so much maturity and he always has. Uh, he wasn't a natural, uh, I, I guess coming up, he wasn't a natural. So he's developed his style from his influences. Well, he better be a natural. But Tanner, you, you, you spent some time with Tosh as a Vans team rider. Tell us something about that you know about Tosh. Yeah, I was just going to say that, I mean, on both ends here, I feel like really stoked to be in the booth on this heat. This somehow feels kind of like it could be an iconic matchup that we'll probably keep seeing like you know Harrison Roach is one of my favorites to watch like I was definitely tuned in last year watching the whole thing go down and uh, I mean you see right there it's 52 percent versus 48 percent for you know uh, fan picks in this heat it's so close like for us on the van side it's been so fun seeing Tosh grow up like he really he's into everything I mean specifically he loves getting tubed like yeah. he'll, he'll do that all over the world but He'll ride every sort of equipment, and he rides it so well. He has, like, such a natural grace on the way he surfs a surfboard. And, Tanner, you've seen Tosh do the hard yards at Pipeline, you know, getting out there day after day, and that's just trial by fire, isn't it? I think it is, and it's it's also a really cool thing, I think, for us being on the Vans team. There, there is almost like a lineage and a totem there that you can kind of climb up, and having guys like Nathan Florence and Ivan Florence, like, to paddle out at Pipe with is such a... It's such a mm. good thing to tap into. As we see Tosh there. Oh, oh you can see the disappointment <laughs> right there. And uh, he's on his way to a score there, Kaipo, and he knew it by looking up to the gods. But when I said it, it doesn't come natural, I mean, he's put in the work, as we are just talking about, like that pecking order at Pipeline. Right. Sure, he's had some Vans riders to, to leverage off, and, and obviously uh, his pick of surfing heritage. But uh, we watched this replay of Tosh here. Um, Four steps up behind the section. Beautiful oh. 10, levitated. It just slips off. It's very un unusual. We haven't seen that too often, you but can thankfully. See, you can see him cool. with a smile on his face, too, like taking that with a grain of salt, just like, I blew it. Oh. Yeah. 
Why? Back on. No, but I love your point, and I think it's super true. Like, Tosh is on his own fortitude making who he is. You know, he pushes himself out of pipe. Nobody's really asking him to do that. He mm. just loves it. Does it on I, his own. And I, I, he just, <laughs> yeah. You can tell he has such a bubbly froth. It's yeah. insane. Like, it's so fun to hang with. He's humble as well. Um, and we'll get on to Harrison in a moment. Uh, a lot of talking points there. And um, Tosh is trying to build a little bit of pressure and get his feet in the wax or what little wax he has if, it ta if he takes up as his father. Um, might just be a tiny little bit of a splash of wax. He's that's notorious good, for not that's having what he, wax That's what he it. told me. He's like, I barely wax my boards. Like he's watching everyone else beat up their boards and stuff. He's just like a couple of swipes of the wax. Okay, that's good. Well, in that case, he, he may, may be a natural. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's this is an iconic heat. You're I, right. I remember doing a trip with Joel where he was bringing. You guys know that sex wax that was at like Seven Eleven and stuff. Yeah, the like yeah. pink and the yeah. purple. The OG one. The OG, and the he would just kind of clear. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's like, no, no, this is actually it's better. I prefer this. Yeah. Not the grippiest wax in the no. world. That was the original formula, but um, I don't see Joel falling a lot. Some though. people, some people get used to that, and I think maybe with footwork, there's a benefit to that as well. You know. <laughs> well, Kar Karina Rosonko was an, was another. Uh, and competitor, and she's like, I don't like super grippy wax on my longboard. Uh, I, we're sitting next to the wax head. Oh, well, <laughs> I mean, what are we trying to talk out here? Let's ask, just ask the professional. Yeah, well, funnily enough, uh, <laughs> that name just comes from, it's just like anything, greaser, hodad, like a biker or whatever in Australia, a wax head was just someone who's so obsessed with surfing. But... Um, but yeah, wax has come a long way, obviously, and it's a, it's a practical formula. If we're not using leashes, how about we at least put some wax on our board so we can uh, grip in? But um, now we talk about nostalgia, we talk about no leashes, but man, those guys in the uh, 60s and 70s in Hawaii surfing leashless with no wax, <laughs> incredible. So there Tosh, he goes. Oh, look at that little heel dip. That <laughs> that's the intricacies right there. That is. That was really cool, and uh, I hope the judges pick up on that, those little subtle details. So 367, now, that was actually a super technical hang 10. He moved his back foot and steered the board around. We saw Kai Takayama do it yesterday. Um, very technical, but because he didn't, it wasn't a big wave and he didn't link up with that inside section. I mean, a 367 for one nose right, that's probably fair. Can I ask you guys here, are you seeing a lot of variety on the uh, equipment? Yeah, yes. I, I think when you can compare, uh, you know, the Challenger Series, absolutely. We've <laughs> yeah. got, um, you know, guys on. Um, Harrison's actually on a borrowed, a borrowed board uh, of one of my buddies in Australia, Tom Payne. Um, that one's nine six, um, twenty three by three. Tosh, he's on a nine four, I believe, for Thomas as well. But aside from this exact heat. These boards that are up to 9, 9, 10 foot, and yeah. some people are on 9 O's as well. Got it. Um, yeah. And we've seen fins. the wide, the really wide tails as well as the uh, round pin, like a Taylor Jensen. Yeah. We've seen the kind of pig shapes with the hip, hips a little further back. We've seen the nose rider shapes with, you know, the fuller nose and the narrower tail. Like so, the, the Michael Takayamas. Like the Michael Takayamas, yeah. So And then, yeah, this, this heats, these two are on boards that are Australian inspired, um, well and truly made uh, pretty much around Nat Young's... Um, synonymous victory in 1966 where they considered it to be you know the iconic uh, although midget one in 64 doing that classic phil edwards mark hinson style of surfing california-esque it was nat that with that blady rails and uh involved surfing that uh put into the top and talk about involved surfing here we are tosh Oy! Yeah. and uh popping that fin out and recovering um so he actually had some levitation on that opening five and he works his way on the inside we'll see what he's got his style just looks so familiar, you know? So Tosh Tudor kicking out of there. Maybe his best wave as of yet. What do you think, Waxhead? I think so. Yeah, very committed. Um, you know, activated. It's easy for stylists and uh, traditionalists to have that Jerry way of... In fact, there's the funny story of Jerry when he surfed here. One of the last contests he ever did. You see Harry here. Uh, mid, mid of the board. Oi! And oh, no. catching. Uh -oh. And... My expression of, oi, is because the pier's right there. He's got no leash and a paddle battle. Have a look at this. <laughs> can, um, can we get a little breakdown on Harry? Like, I, f yeah. I feel like he is at the top of the game. I mean, he won Manly, right? Over, yes, he did. Over Ben, and, and that was really fun to watch. And, like, what's his course looking like this year with the hopes? I'm sure he's thinking the title. Well, he didn't really need to be here right now. 
Um, like honestly, because he's the, got a keeper. Yeah, that's it. The keeper score because it's a, they're taking the the two out of the three results. Um, but this shows his competitiveness. There's been a bit yeah. of chat around this. I didn't see him in the competitors area before the heat. Uh, he's on his own program. And he had a he had a heartbreak last year, right? Because he uh, Ben Skinner beat him over at in Malibu, and that cost him. Yeah. A, a world title right there and that was that was a crazy crazy moment um i i want to throw this interview but i want to throw this interview with a correction i called the heat last heat winner kevin skvarna a dana hills dolphin i want to correct that to all the dolphins i'm sorry he's actually a san juan stallion so let's hear from the san juan stallion kevin skvarna he won the last heat Kevin, I cannot help myself by watching you today earlier, just like with your headphones on, just super calm, eating an apple. Like, yeah. is that how you just bring it on the vibe to the water? Uh, yeah, I usually try to take like a little moment, listen to some music or just kind of try to chill and just... What do you listen to? All sorts of stuff. It's too much like some rap music or reggae or whatever's just feeling good at the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm asking this because I talked to Lucas too and he was like, oh, I, I wanted to surf early and it like, you know, shakes my, shake my nerves yeah. off. Yeah. Do you ever feel nervous and how was this heat for you? Yeah, I mean, I do feel nervous sometimes, but like I was talking to Ryan actually about this before. It's like, it's like it sucks that they make you sit here and wait and wait so you you kind of get nervous or whatever but i more get like excited and kind of jittery just like just want to go do the do it you know like get a couple waves because i know like it's all good if i get a couple waves and you're also coming from a very good vibe from south africa yeah is that is it weighing on you somehow no i mean like maybe not weighing on me but pushing me for sure like to win a duct tape, like especially the one where like it's the best guys invited, you know, like that's a that's a big deal for me. And like I I was working for that for a long time, and to have it happen was super sick. And to go to South Africa and like see all my buddies that I hadn't seen for a while, and like really just get to hang with them and see their waves and their families and stuff was really cool. Amazing. And I think I just learned something fun yeah. about you. Do you really want to be a nurse one day? No, my girlfriend's a nurse. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't. <laughs> want to be a nurse <laughs> that's a horrible job everybody was like oh Surfing my god so I much can... more fun but people were like i can kind of see kevin being a nurse he's so nurturing and good to be around yeah. so here we go yeah no i i've got no desire <laughs> maybe someone will pay me to surf but one thing that you desire is to show this board <laughs> yeah for sure uh, this is uh, my new Infinity. They did a little interview on uh, Dave Bainey yesterday, uh -huh. who's running the shop there. Steve Bainey's uh, taken me on, and, and we've been working together to make some boards. And, and this is like the Skavarna Diamond that we're doing right now, and it feels really good. And they're available for order, so <laughs> order them up. Here we go, guys. Salesman. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, Sick. Kevin. We'll see you in the next heat. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Hey, if you're in Dana Point, check out Infinity Surfboards. They've been in business since 1970. That's part of our culture of surfing. Steve and Barry Bainey, some of the original tandem couples in the entire world and world champions in tandem. And thanks to Dan and Dave Bainey also shaping the boards. We're taking a break right now. We got more talk story with Tanner Godowskis when we come back. And Joel Tudor will still be in the water. I mean, Tosh will still be in the water. Harrison, you were in second with Bruce Hardy, a 5 6 7. 
Welcome back to the Fans Duct Tape Invitational. And we are in round four, heat number five. What's up for grabs? A space in the quarterfinals. Harrison Roach up against Tosh Tudor. Harrison Roach, number one in the rankings, coming into Huntington Beach. Hi, I'm Kaipo. This is the Waxhead. And everyone knows T-Dog, Tanner Godowskis, joining us here. Um, Harrison Roach, you were going to tell us a little bit more about Harrison. So Harrison at the moment in the water needing a 3.57 to take over Tosh. But we started off the, the heat just infatuated with, I guess, Tosh in this heat. It's his first WSL event and with a strong lineage in surf culture. Um, you know, he's taken the lead so far. But Harrison is the number one seed coming into this event. Um, a super stylist. He probably could have won several world titles in the last few years uh, if he concentrated on that. But... Uh, the direction the WSL has taken in the last three years has now uh, really opened the doors up to a lot of people like Harrison and in all those little, you know, strong cultural pockets where longboarding is dominant, um, it's, it's really inspired a lot of those people and Harry's leading that charge, especially in Noosa Heads Australia. Competent on all boards, in all waves. Uh, Harry's just as comfortable in a QS or a Pro Junior event back in the day, along with Julian Wilson. Um, you know, one of those guys we spoke about yesterday as well, do, you know, um, crossover between equipment like you and your brothers as well. But we see Harry here chipping away at that 3.57. A nice clean start on his uh, Thomas surfboard. Sets up that inside five, a little slight 10. You saw his foot tapped over the rail and makes it very, very important. The judge has been super stringent on that last uh, as they are in the Challenger Series, you've really got to stay on your feet. Likely to see a, a lead change. 3.57 is the requirement for Harrison Roach. Nice finish, nice nose ride in the shore break for that wave. Replay, talk us through this, Tanner. I mean, it's, it's just so fun to watch. I mean, the way these guys make it to the inside with that much grace is almost like unknown to me. There's no hopping. It just It's almost just wait for it and then get that tip action right there in the pocket. It's Rad. And we're going to talk about uh, the surf swap yesterday, but oh, yeah. that moment where Harry stepped five, quick ten, the inside rail was mid-face. If we could get a slow-mo on that, it would be perfect. <laughs> and he stepped backwards, fully in trim, locked in. And that's those little subtleties that are, are like a, a wide point back surfboard, 60s inspired. So he's this little setup. Quick leap to the nose with his taut long legs. And then, look, little tan on the inside rail, steps straight back in the middle of the board. That is pure involvement-style surfing. Super technical. I well, love he got the work. he got the work done. He needed a score. He got the score, 4.93. And now Harrison Roach is in the lead, putting Tosh Tudor in the back seat. And Tosh now needing a 5.04 right at the five-minute mark. Tosh paddling back out. But I want to touch on Tanner. We got so much stuff going on over here. Um, at the Vans US Open of Surfing, but we had a board swap yesterday. Yeah, that was the first time. They did the vintage surfboard swap, and I was really stoked to be included on it. I mean, I feel like my garage has almost become a pawn shop, and it, it really enabled me to continue that dream of mine forward of buying things that are almost about to break or old or <laughs> and then refurbishing them. But I've been buying surfboards, all surfboards off Craigslist, actually since I stopped competing. And it's just been such an easy, fun way to like open up doors in different ways to ride your equipment. And uh, yeah, so yesterday I brought down a bunch. I had like a camo spray Jerry Lopez. Wow. I had a really nice Herbie. Wow. Um, I had a bunch of stuff. I had a Tyler Warren Fireball Fish. Was and the Herbie? Was it a step deck? The the Herbie Fletcher? It one? wasn't. I mean, there's so many different Herbies you can have. This one was just like a spotless airbrush. It had the old Jimmy Nudo Catalyst Surf Shop logo. Yeah. And ah, that was yeah. Yeah, right. It, Square nose. Uh, not square nose, which I'm still looking for a square nose. But anyone got a square nose, Herbie Fletcher, contact <laughs> Tanner me Gaskus, Yeah. I mean, Vans is doing such a great job. It was honestly so fun because sandwiched, but I was in between Rocky Sabo, who had Rocky Surf Shop when I was growing up in San Clemente. Dale Smith is like iconic skate historian skater. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just in the middle of these guys. I have all my VHSs, a small little TV. And, and, and to me, I was 
enjoying it almost more just getting to have these conversations with guys and be a part of it. And the people coming in, it was the same thing. Like everybody was so interested. It was very open minded. Yeah. I love it. And I'm going to quantify that. Dale Smith, really one of the godfathers of freestyle skateboarding. Rock and, and then Rocky Sable, a legendary, you know, when we break through California pro surfers, we're one of the first kind of California pro surfers out of the South Bay, South Bay area, and then came down to San Clemente, opened up uh, Rocky Surfing Sport. Yep. And so you were surrounded by legends. And I love that you appreciate that, Tanner. Oh, honestly, the, the intricacies that you kind of learn through conversations, it's like, it's almost like schools in session. It is. For me, it's just like, oh, Oh, wow I'd love to ask more questions like even just hearing you break down like that nose right of Harry on the inside I thrive on that kind of stuff because I don't I wasn't growing up knowing this and and I've been on a hot longboard kick as we see Tosh just Beautiful. screaming maybe through the pier we're not sure but uh, yeah I mean it there's I think in longboarding as well that the culture is more alive today. Mm -hmm. Like when we're talking about the difference, that's why I asked about the variety of equipment. I almost wish somebody would paddle out a Red Beauty for their heat when it's mm -hmm. cranking, you know, and just almost do a little homage to like some of the guys that had phenomenal style on shortboards, like Tom Curran, right. I mean, Andy Irons, like a lot of people in US Open, when I think about it, like it's, it's definitely cool to see where high performance surfing is at now, it's at such a high level, but it's also fun to recognize the style and the importance of that. And, yeah. um, absolutely spot on there with the Red Beauty reference and uh, there's so much to take from that history and uh, see Tosh pulling off that wave. It'll be uh, interesting to see if that, uh, and the judges loved it it's coming in at a very good score and Tosh Tudor has taken the lead, locking wow. in a 5.97, pushing Harry back in a second with a minute 45. The experienced Harrison Roach will not want to lose to Tosh Tudor. <laughs> But he's well, after a 5.88. If there's a bright side of the scenario, you touched on it earlier in the heat, Wax said, is that it's three contests making up the longboard tour. And you keep your best two out of three. Harrison Roach already has a first. Mm -hmm. So he already has a keeper result. Malibu is double points. So this is really not going to, even if Harrison was to go down right now in this heat, it's not really going to hurt his chance of a world title at all. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of that's a cool thing. I mean, yeah. there's a bright side to this. Um, of course, he wants to come out of this heat, but he's only got a minute and he needs a 5.88. Good thing is he's got priority. And Tanner, here he goes. I mean, this is, oh, look at Tosh out the back. <laughs> Okay, wow, straight to the nose. I mean, like Wax said, let's get legit with that. Like, yep. what do you think Harry's thinking right now? Uh, he's trying to put Tosh off, move a little bit out of priority, but he's just hunting a right. He's just, he's at the mercy of the of the Huntington Pier right now, just hunting for a little bowl. Uh, we do get him. You do get those little pier bowl rights. Yeah. So he's moved in a little bit, and um, there's a little bit of, you know, it's frustrating to lose to Tosh. He's the wild card, and Harry's number one. But... Uh, Tosh has had a lot of people before him to watch. And well, if Harrison goes down, we're going to see number one in the rankings out of competition. We've already seen number two, Ben Skinner, out of competition in an earlier heat against uh, Kaimana Takayama. Here we go. One more chance for Harry. Slight footwork there. Still just planing on the board. Wave not giving him a lot of opportunity, and unfortunately this wave doesn't have a 5.88 written in it. And so it's just going to be a ride to the beach for Harrison Roach, and it is going to be a victorious ride in for Tosh Tudor. There's the numbers. Thank you, Tanner Godowskis, for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, boys. I love this. This is good, good stuff. St hey, Wax it. Are you going to stick around with me for another heat? Absolutely. All right. We're going to be back with more right after these messages. Stick, stick around. Photo. Right
Tosh Tudor and Harrison Roach coming in, having a conversation after their matchup. And it is the young Tudor that is going to move into the quarterfinals here at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. Good stuff. Great surfing by both of those gentlemen. But you know what? Keeps on keeping on. We're moving on to another heat. Round four, heat number six, Quinny, Justin Quintal against Cole Robbins. I'm Kaipo, joined by the Waxhead to talk you through all the action. All right, back in. We've got a world champion here, and we've got Cole Robbins, who gave me an incredible, inspiring uh, words of wisdom on my Instagram Live not long ago. He wants to be world champion. He said he wants to go all the way, and he wants to be here in finals day. So he's uh, super... Oh! And the commentator's cursed, but you know what, Kaipo? He grabbed that board and he'll be straight out the back in a moment. And uh, Justin looking to capitalize. Oh, the, the man is on already. Five to 10, and this is no surprise. Wow, setting this one up, a little safety carve in front of the pier, and he'll probably shoot it, Kaipo, what do you think? He's uh, showed mastery of the pilings in past heats. Let's see if he can zigzag through this one. The energy is going kind of away from it. He wants to keep on the wave, so he's staying away from the pilings. He wanted to make that inside shore break connection, but unable to do that. However, he will have an early advantage in his matchup against Cole Robbins. Jeez, and he's hungry for this one. He needs this result, as he said, Kaipo. Uh, a familiar scenario with uh, a couple of those surfers that didn't compete in Manly. Uh, this is a keeper result for Justin. So this is a, a strong heat. Gets through this and he's into the quarterfinals, which given that Malibu's got, uh, got double the points, um, this will be a keeper result for him. And a quarterfinal result will be just what he's after at the minimum. So nice, strong power carve there. Uh, Justin on a 9-9. It's his favorite board. He's won most of his victories uh, riding this board. It's a little beat up, and he said that black uh, that black tint is hiding quite a lot of damage um, in and along those rails. So um, an old favorite for Justin. Paddling back out through the pier, and uh, Judge is really enjoying that quick nose ride and a strong car. Very critical, though, with a 6.83 to lock in, and Cole with a 1 just on that simple up and off and uh, I think Justin's going to be pretty comfortable in these lefts Kaipo. All right well 6.83 nice start for Quinny. Uh, let's check out what AJ has. She's always got something out there in the Van Dorn Village. What do you got AJ? We're out here at the Van Dorn Village of the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing and we're at the BF Goodrich tent. They have a photo booth with all sorts of props including a little puppy. This is Taylor. She's posing for pictures with me. They have a bunch of giveaways going on. You can enter to win a free set of tires. And then right when that Huntington heat gets really going this afternoon, they're going to have shave ice from one to three. So come back for that. But in the meantime, I'm going to try and sweet talk the owner into including the dog in the giveaway. Oh, look at that. That is awesome. There's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, that dog looks like it's having an absolute ball of a time, just cruising down the U.S. Open and uh, oh. on the good stuff. You never know what you're going to find. Oh, boy. Okay, so back to the heat. 6.83 and a big advantage to Justin Quintal out of Florida. Cole Robbins, I believe he's out of Santa Barbara, California. Santa Barbara, California, and uh, Justin and Cole were hanging out earlier and <laughs> we're having a little chat, and I said, you know, Justin, we talked about the NASCAR reference that uh, that Karina brought up yesterday. You know what? He's actually not really into NASCAR. He said it's it's just been to a few races with some friends, and they gave him a bit of a uh, a bit of a joke yesterday <laughs> afternoon. But um, he is into fishing, and I did say, look, we're a product of our surroundings, and uh, I said, let's hang around Cole a little more because he's a uh, he's a wealthy real estate agent, and um, <laughs> he said, if if I hug you and I like rub you, will I get some money? Um, because that's something we all need. And hey, being longboarders, as Kevin Scavana said in the heat before last. Um, there's not a lot of sponsorship around Kaipo. The prize money's getting there, and um, this is a fantastic platform, the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. Um, in this case, it's not actually an invitational. It's a qualifying event for the World Tour. It's a World Tour qualifier with Malibu being the final event in October. Yeah, correct. And uh, that's our series. We started in Manly at the Sydney Surf Pro. We got the, this uh, duct tape uh, competition here and then we go move on to Malibu in October where we're crowned a world champ for both the men's and the women's and the formula for that top two results count towards your year end points and to make sure Malibu is extra meaningful it's double points for that Malibu event 
And uh, we're starting to develop stories, Kaipo, with these events sort of really in close succession. We're developing a storyline between the competitors, you know, where they're from, what's at stake with points, uh, and it's engaging. And there's a lot of feedback. A lot of people are really tuned in, and I think this US Open, uh, it does suit Longboards. Uh, although it may not be perfect waves, it is a place of, uh, a lot, you know, there's a lot of history here, and a lot of tours have decided world champions, or this event has gone on to be the decider to somebody to win later in the season. So you could say Harrison was here for confidence, although knocked out, may have done the opposite. And Justin finding a one of those, a lot of ribs in this phase too, uh, that onshore wind um, really coming up in the last hour and a half. But Justin cool as a cucumber, just cruising his way through, getting that 9-9 in trim. He knows the, uh, the operation at hand. And uh, that one not cooperating, but uh, I think the judge is going to enjoy that as a backup score. But Cole, what has he got here? Redirecting back into the power source, setting up his inside. And the wave not cooperating either. So Cole, 17 minutes to go. Still got a lot of time to uh, just restart his heat, Kaipo. Yeah, lots of time on the clock. 25 minute heats uh, in this round four, as well as the upcoming quarterfinals. Um, so Cole Robbins still enough time on the clock we'll see what the score is going to be for Justin Quintal and the need for Cole Robbins we got the winner of the last heat he was smooth and he just took out number one in the rankings Tosh Tudor is with Louisa Florence Tosh you were just telling me earlier that you needed to get your feet wet yeah. and get the morning wobbling off it seems yeah, like you yeah. worked out yeah it worked out I'm <laughs> I'm so stoked I mean I Look, up, I've looked up to Harry since I was so little. We used to, he used to come over to my house and we'd play like Mario together. Every time he'd come from Australia, we'd play Mario together. So it was cool to just get to surf and heat with him. And the whole day, I was, you know, he's world number one. I was just like, oh my god, like, of course I get put up with him. But I'm stoked to made it and get a couple. Definitely still had the wobble, but <laughs> it was fun. I'm, I'm so stoked. So. When, how do you handle the nerves in the water in situations like this when you're surfing against like almost like a hero for you? Um, I don't, honestly, I don't know. I think I just think of like how m much more nervous it could be in a different situation and how I'm surfing a heat in the ocean on a nice sunny day and like it's what, what do you, I can't get that nervous about it, you know, but <laughs> obviously you still are like the nerves are boiling by. Yeah, I just think of other things I could have been nerv more nervous about, and then it eases into it. And it's Life more. can be worse than this for sure. <laughs> it can be a lot worse, so <laughs> we're cruising. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. You're just telling me that yesterday was your first interview ever. Yeah. So here you are again. Yeah. I'll see you in the next heat. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you. Tosh uh, looking very comfortable there behind the microphone. Almost shocked that he was doing his, uh, his victory speech there and he moves on to the quarterfinals and I think Dad would be very proud. Um, and we all are. It's always nice to see a, a story uh, and, a, and a new career start to blossom, especially in front of our eyes at the, the Vans US Open and, and Tosh hopefully setting up a career ahead and, a, and an illustrious one in the longboard world. Number came in for Justin Quintal during that Interview of 5.93, number for Cole Robbins of 4.17. And Robbins now trailing Justin Quintal. He needs a big number, an 8.59. Yeah, it's almost like a, a heat restart here for Cole. Um, it, it, it's frustrating, you know, to start off with a, with a one-point ride and then you back up to be a 4.17, which is under your competitor's two scoring rides. You always want to up the ante, but here he goes. Beautiful. Stays nice and high with that five. Driving through the whitewash. If you can get a nice cut back here and set up the inside, it'll be a... Was on his way to a nice back up there, Kaipo. But, you know, all that hard work on the outside, you've got to, you know, uh, capitalize. If I make reference to that last heat where we had that beautiful side angle of Harrison and that inside shore break, um, although it wasn't a, a, a super dynamic wave, there was that moment where that narrower nose and that wide point back really was put to good use. He, he, sh he cross-stepped back, locked into trim, and you could really see the control Harry had in the midsection, where we actually just had Cole, that wider nose, you know, blossom out a little bit and unfortunately drop off the back. And uh, back with yeah. more right after this.
with a waffle bottom. We're back at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. And we are in heat six of the fourth round of competition. Winner moves on into the quarterfinals, which will be in the which will hit the water later this afternoon. Currently we have a Justin Quintal out ahead of Cole Robbins. I'm Kuiper with the wax head, and Cole Robbins not only needs a score, a big score of 8.59. He is under the priority of Justin Quintal. So yeah, Justin's in a really commanding position right now. Unfortunately, Cole, uh, Cole hasn't capitalized on those rights. And I was saying before the break, before the, um, the board knows rights so well, but he's just getting hung up a little bit and doesn't have that, that sort of buttery projection that we've seen on some of the, the natural footers linking up throughout the day that we had uh, Taylor Jensen being a highlight, you know, smoothing out those transitions. And also Harrison in that last heat sort of able to, uh, to link up on a couple of those rights, but unfortunately Tosh um, getting him at the end there. But yeah, Justin, he loves this wave. He's had many victories here and he's on his favorite board. Lefts into the pier. It's gonna be a hard one for him. But uh, as I said, Cole is so hungry for victory. Uh, he didn't go as far in the draw as he would have liked in Manly. So once again, he's looking for a keeper result here too. So the very entertaining 10 minutes left on the clock. Yeah, Justin Quintal, uh, numerous duct tape titles to his credit as well as a world championship in 2019. Here he goes again. Just a master on the tip. And, um, it's a great nose ride, a little cut back there. Wax said, and take us through the rest of this wave. Yeah, the wave's very almondy. It's uh, we've seen it's not as it's not running as hard with no opportunity for levitation, but Justin just using that long board for what a fantastic camera angle as well, really showcasing, you know, the footwork up and down the board and um, really well surfed wave there for Justin. Here we have Cole on the answer back. Nice quick feet, very precise footwork. And um, stepping back into the bowl. Nice change of direction here and um, just setting up the inside, which he hasn't had much luck with yet. And this one's looking good so far. He works it through. He's going to get one chance here for a hit off the inside. And he connects. So that's exactly what Cole was looking for. Um, it's in the judges' hands right now. We've got one to lock in for Justin and Cole to get his lock in his best wave yet. Patty. Nine minutes, 20 seconds. And uh, Justin Quintal, you know, really when we deep dig into a lot of the um, his competitive track record, if you will, we have help with that because we compile all of that information. And so him on the paddle out as we finally dig into the deep stats powered by Hydro Flask, 80% career heat winning. So his heat winning percentage, 80%, that's pretty high. Absolutely, uh, incredibly high, higher than Kelly Slater's. Uh, but mind you, Justin um, really only made a, a real solid stab at the uh, at the World Tour in 2019. He had competed previously. Uh, and the longboarders haven't had a lot of opportunity at the WSL level. So, you know, perhaps inflated a little bit from the lack of events. But still, Justin's super dominant, um, winning his 2019 world title. 
I uh, said in a previous heat that he uh, he won on all lefts, even at Noosa in Pantene in Spain and in Taiwan, which is actually mostly a right-hander. Um, the luck was in Justin's draw, mm. where we had lefts pretty much at every single event. But that's just the way the cookie crumbles, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the X factor of our playing field, the ocean ever-changing. Not ever 100% predictable. I mean, we look at forecasts, wind models, all that, but you never know. Yep. So it's a moment-to-moment -moment thing, and that's why we absolutely love it. That's why we keep on coming back. Absolutely, and I remember sitting on the beach at Narrabeen during one of the impromptu uh, CT events um, two years ago, and, you know, Italo, fan favorite, destined to win, killing at all event, Connor Coffin sitting there doing, you know, backside re-entries and, and took the win, and I think back, everyone on the beach was, was just stunned. How could this happen it's mother nature it's a changing variable smack the lip get a point you got 25 minutes half an hour you win and justin here 5 10 beautiful soul arch there for justin um no 10 there and a power gouge talk about narrow bean and power surfing and there's justin showing us a little bit of that cole smith power leaning back on that tail pivoting and throwing some buckets um on, on that 99 single fin a traditional log and Quinny, uh, look at with the connection as well, Waxhead. Absolutely. He's got that little intro, and he goes and taps that one off the top. Justin Quintel putting on an absolute showcase as we see, um, you know, we're still waiting on a score for Cole from his last wave. Before this run, his third wave, Justin's third wave, was a 6.37, so he did increase his lead, Kaipo, but with the wave still to be locked in for Cole and Justin. I think this one may be better than his 6.83, uh, his first wave. Oh, he camped out on the nose, didn't he, Waxhead? And I love that turn, too. Just set it up with the rib. He timed it really well. It was, you know, I talked about um, the combination of um, power surfing, but also safety surfing. You know, there's a, there's a huge pier looking at you, and, and, you know, you have to cut back to time it sometimes to get through that pier. But Justin makes it look like it's meant to be right on the, on the correct side of the, uh, the warble, and go left, go right, using the footwork, the rail transition, um, kind of like ticking the box for all the criteria there. Well, running through the criteria, we're waiting for the score for Justin Quintal. Last goal for Cole Robbins, a 5.87. His best so far. Here's live action with Cole, gets to the nose, has to overcome some white water, no problem. Smooth cutback, little cross step through there. And again, a cutty to cross step combination weaving back and forth to the flat sections wave steepens up on the inside hang five a little 10 and another great wave for Cole Robbins so he's coming back at the back half of this heat yeah well served for Cole uh, didn't quite have that dynamic finish like the last wave uh, but he did nose right on the outside section so it's difficult to see on the camera but the right tapers in size but the left actually it does hold right into the pier so if we could talk about sort of you know more critical surfing um you know you see this right here perfect so he stays up nice and high quick five little touch 10 trims through and the wave starts to fade here and it's kind of like a redirect carve it was the right turn for the wave but not quite as dynamic as justin's heavy gouging carve um but hey cold to surf that wave everything that it asked for um, in any regular heat that's a keeper score whatever he's about to lock in now so scores for both uh, Quinny as well as Cole owed to us by the judges. And um, the gut feeling is that the situation in the water likely not to change and Cole Robbins still be trailing Justin Quintal. 7.4 for Justin Quintal. Puts Cole behind where he needs an 8.36. Still waiting for last score of Cole Robbins. But anything below an 8.36, Cole Robbins will remain in that second place and elimination position. I just want to touch on the judging as well. We had one judge for Justin's last wave uh, give it an eight, just at the lower end of that excellent scale. Um, you know, I feel like the waves have a lot to do with it. They are transitioning in each heat, but we haven't seen many excellent scores in this event yet, Kaipo. So I'm wondering who's going to be the first to really bust out that excellent range scores, or are they holding back for the final? Although we could be on our way here with Justin, that one didn't quite cooperate, but again, repeating his last wave, a 5-10, uh, adjusting with the backwash and surfing under the pier. Justin's having a ball. It's Justin, a you know, with a sketchy section and showed so much board control with a warbly, sketchy wave, he's got no leash. It was right by the pier. If he were to fall, 
that board would have gone straight into the pilings. That type of confidence and board control, so impressive. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking like, although the scale's set, that's pretty outstanding surfing, that you know, and it's, if not excellent, but it wasn't perfect and, and flawless, but uh, wow, that was beautiful, incredible. And then here, just gets a little hung up, incredible board control. That's a head high wave at that moment. Steps back into the carve and no inside connection, but incredibly critical surfing there by, from Justin and, you know, just doing once again what the wave asks, but more, really pushing the envelope. And uh, I suspect Justin might have a few things up his sleeve for, you know, if he does progress through this for his next quarterfinal. Yeah, and you know what? That's exactly what you want to do, right, Matt? Is yeah. that you actually, you want to peak on finals day. And a lot of times, I'm, I'm looking back to the Challenger Series or even the Championship Tour when we're talking about shortboards, there's athletes that what they will do is they'll hold back throughout the competition and they won't show some moves that they have until that finals day so they don't show it to the judges early you know what i mean they don't want to unwrap it very early and uh, have the judges expect it you kind of surprise them right on the finals day and not to mention in uh in three or four man heats um it's a different dynamic to surfing a two-man final true um you know you only need to get second and so in some of these cases with the regional qualification, you've never surfed against some of these surfers. You don't know what their strengths and weaknesses are. And you, you have to surf to what's in front of you. Whatever wave comes, you go, you surf the best you can. And you do see, say, Rio Wada, for example, who, who won in Manly, mm -hmm. get knocked out very early here in uh, Huntington. And quite surprising because you think this guy's on a roll. But hey, it's, it's a four-man heat, three-man heat is a very different dynamic to a, to a two-person final. Um, but Justin flourishing here with uh, a minute 30 left on the clock. He's leaving Cole with a... He, he'll, Cole will be needing to get one of the, the best waves of the morning, an 8.36. But as I said, he's super motivated. And he'll be thinking he can achieve that. Well, he's going to have to keep that PMA within his head, Cole Robbins, as Justin Quintal is just sitting pretty at the moment and just waiting for the clock to tick down. Cole does have priority. So he's got first choice of waves coming in. And it looks like he's going to choose this one. Again, the 8.36 is what he needs. Here he goes. High line, yet to get to the nose. 5 to 10 through the white water. Wave flattens out. Powers a little pivot turn there for the redirect. Has to get into the planing position to get through the flat spot. A little bit of a bounce to get over the hump. Does so on the inside. 5 to 10 again on the shore break. Floats a final maneuver. Putting his all on that wave. Absolutely. Very technical. I don't think he's going to have a chance to, to get back out and get another wave, but he uh, put it all on the line. Smaller wave, though, under priority, but, you know, Cole, never one to give up, and there he is walking in. I don't think he thinks it's enough either, Kaipo, but super well surfed, and is this the victory lap for Justin Quintal, 2019 world champion, and well on his way to a, uh, a victory here in, uh, in Huntington Beach, but still, he's got the quarterfinals up next, and... I don't think that last goal for Colby enough. So this is a victory lap for, for Justin, just trimming through on the north side of the pier and counting it down. And heat is over. And, uh, and Justin, another win at HB Pier. There you go, Matt. Yep, correct. Justin Quintal is going to waltz into the quarterfinals. And we're going to dance into a commercial break. So keep on boogieing, because we're going to be back right after this.
The Vans U.S. Open of Surfing is brought to you by Vans, off the wall since 66. By Pacifico, official beer of the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. Live life anchors up. By Youth Theory, official vitamin and supplement of the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. By BF Goodrich, official tire of the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. And by Stillhouse, the unbreakable spirit. Welcome back to the band's Duct Tape. This is Longboarding at its finest. We are live from Huntington Beach, California, here in beautiful Surf City, USA. And uh, we're getting very familiar with announcing that Justin Quintal has yet another heat win under his belt. An incredible run. Surprise, surprise. The surfer from Florida. Cole Robbins, though, put up a strong fight, 11.30 total. But that 14.23 that Justin threw down there was just too much to overcome. So we will see more Justin Quintal. Chris Cote here with Shannon Hughes, and we're about to watch Taka Inoue get his first wave ridden. Nicely done to get up on the nose there. Good looking little right hander here. So that's a great way to start your heat with a medium sized set wave. So these are the ways that we've seen paying off all day long. A little subtle couple of soul arch fades there. Back up onto the nose with the hang five pump straight back to another hang five. And a gymnastic style right out there. Great balance on display, style, flow, grace. Everything the judges are looking for on that wave. That was a nice looking way for Taka. Great way to kick things off. Had a good nose ride, like that little soul arch through the middle section. A little sloppy on the finish, but so much going on. So we'll see how the judges reward him. There's already a 5-3-3 on the board for Connie Stewart, so that's a good start for Connie. Here we go with the replay for that opening one. A couple steps up to the nose, gets that really quick tap to the 10 off the 5. Nice little redirect off the foam as well, keeps that board fluid flowing forward. Nice engagement of the rail there through that mid third and then sets himself up here. We'll see if he was able to find another nose ride. That wave just keeps going really flat. Ooh, that was a nice little combo again, five to 10. And then this one from Taka. Taka gets longer tip time, controls that hang 10 really well, and then goes for this little section. I like that drop knee cutback. That's a really powerful way to redirect a longboard. And then here you got that nice little sort of rail to rail work. That and this was is so where cool. It's pretty impressive, huh? To be able to pump while doing a hang five. And just kind of engage it back into that power pocket. Nicely done there for Tucka. 4-8-3, his opening wave. Coniella Stewart with a 5-3-3 on his opener. So we've got a heat on our hands, folks. 20 minutes, 50 seconds to go. Round four, heat seven. Uh, the unmistakable style off and on the surfboard. Coniella Stewart representing Hawaii. Uh, one of the uh, new generation of beach boys. He is the true beach boy himself. Coming straight out of Waikiki. He came quite explosively onto the World Longboard Tour a few years ago, and it's been just a real pleasure to be able to watch him surf. He's been surfing, kind of came into the scene, was riding Michael Takayama boards, Kai, Kaimana Takayama's dad, and then now has transitioned over and is surfing boards from Kai Salas, who got knocked out of the men's draw earlier on today. Uh, Kai now has his own uh, board company out of Waikiki, and he's got a couple of surfers that are riding his boards. I'm pretty sure that Connie is riding the Mango Jam model, which just has a little bit of edge in the tail, so it's good for engaging here in beach breaks instead of having just those full 50-50 soft rails all the way through. Gives him just that little bit of extra kind of speed or engagement when he's coming out of some good rail turns. Great to see him in the lineup. Taka as well has been competing at this level for a long time. He's a fantastic shortboarder as well as longboarder and he's had kind of a good transition in his equipment over the last couple of years to start matching that traditional criteria. Connie gets that first little nose ride, redirects here in the foam. Nothing too critical yet. A couple cross steps forward to keep that trim line. We have seen that little inside reforming really well. That was a nice kind of combination, two nose rides connected together. And then this is that section that is really nice to see the surfers be able to connect well with. Good pocket nose rides as well as that re-entry on the finish. Yeah, the fans on the beach are loving it. I heard whistles and hoots and hollers coming off the sand as Coniella Stewart finishes his wave in a really exciting way. 
18.55 to go. Justin Quintal is doing Justin Quintal things and just winning. He is standing by now with Louisa Florence. Justin, it just set the bar really high right now for us. How was this heat for you? Uh, it was good. I was stoked. There's uh, plenty of waves that second half of the heat. And, uh, you know, I think Cole and I just were going back to back. So it was, it was nice. Yeah. I know you guys were talking earlier about going to a fishing trip to make peace after the heat. <laughs> so how that's going to go? Yeah, yeah, when I come back out in October for the Malibu contest, we're going to go out on Cole's boat and try to get some tuna or some yellowtail. But we've been trying to line up a fishing trip before the contest and just didn't really work out. But we're like, dang it, we got to surf against each other. It's going to be awkward out on the boat. But this, you know, I'm going to let you go. Congratulations. And you're going to face Tosh next. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. Congrats. Oh, I'm, wait, I'm serving against Tosh next? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh-oh. Shoot. I was hoping we'd blink up in the final. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So what he's saying there is he's going to make the final. Yes. <laughs> but <laughs> he's got a he's got a tough competitor ahead of him. Tosh Tudor has been doing big things here at the Vans U.S. Open of surfing. Vans Duct Tape Invitational, of course, Tosh literally grew up on that tour and in those events, made a big name for himself uh, outside of those events just by what he did in and out of the water. You know, if you watch any of the old uh, edits that the Vans duct tape put together from all their locations. Uh, Tosh is right there in the mix. Um, just a really nice, affable, awesome kid. Um, pleasure to surf with, you know, definitely not a, he, even though he's on a bigger board than most of us most of the time, he definitely, you know, shares waves. He's not a, a wave hog by any means. He's, he's just a, a really cool kid, a great ambassador for surfing and for logging as well. And I mean, really, doing solid took out Harrison Roach current world number one runner up to the world title last year and now he gets to match up with the duct tape best in Justin Quintal in the quarters that's going to be solid the duct tape goat big heat coming up well Kaniala Stewart and Taka Inoue are currently in the water you've got a 627 is the high mark so with 1640 to go we've got AJ with the legend Steve Van Doren <laughs> We're in the Van Doren Village with the man, the myth, the legend himself, Steve Van Doren, over here grilling. You do this every year. Why do you find so much joy out of this? Because I get to talk to all the people here that are going by. How you doing? It's just a great thing. We're glad to be after missing two years, being back out at the Vans US Open. You know, it's just a lot of fun. Everything's free. So, you know, everybody comes somewhere and you always have to pay for something. It's nice to get something free. So as you see down the line here, they're getting Vans bags. A little while ago, we went through uh, about 400 hats. And so everybody lines up and just comes from 2 to 4 o'clock and we cook hot dogs and make people smile a little bit. What's happening over there? How are you doing today? You're the grill master. What is it you love about being at this spot? Well, because if everybody can walk by, but I started off in the snow because I was freezing and I wanted to see the snowboarders, but I couldn't tell who was who because they have goggles and hats and gloves. So if I cook, they take it off and then I could serve them. <laughs> but at skate events and, you know, surf events, you can see people, but instead of sitting in the stands, I'd rather be sitting over here cooking up some hot dogs. Ed, where'd you go? And how many hot dogs do you think you've cooked up so far? Well, uh, today we're going to go through 1,300. And then we're going to do 350 sliders right after this. We have the hamburger sliders after that. Tomorrow we go up to the max, 1,400 hot dogs and about 500 sliders. That's what we can get done in our two hours that we cook. Here you go, Ed. So my math's not great, but that's a lot of hot dogs. There's a lot of hot dogs. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of happy people that are going on. But, you know, the thing is, you just have to warm them up tender love and care and uh, they go inside the, uh, that area and then we go uh, from there over to the people right there so we keep everything nice and clean and healthy and stuff so we're excited to be back out here but nice thing about the Vans US Open great surfing today tomorrow Sunday great skateboarding great fun with the games and hey having some fun with all the people with sliders as well as hot dogs I love it so 12 to 2 come on down grab a hot dog from the man himself I mean they, p humans don't get much better than Steve Van Doren. He has been doing this for a long time. And, you know, as we all know, Vans, of course, is a big company, super successful. You know, he does not have to be spending hours and hours on the beach volunteering to cook for uh, all the fans coming out. But uh, he, he does it every single year. He does it with a huge smile on his face. He takes pride in his grilling as well. So you can uh, bet that even when making 1,400 dogs, they're all going to be perfectly cooked and uh, I just can't say enough good things about Steve Van Doren an absolute legend an icon in action sports 
And uh, you, you, you got to think of him and thank him every time you see that waffle sole. That is uh, the true sign of a good leader in a company, in life, in a family. Just spend his whole afternoon cooking hot dogs for the crowd, giving them out for free. Sliders coming up next. Yeah. And just what a legend. And thank you so much for the waffle sole. Hey, you know, and I will tell you, I know a lot of people that work at Vans from, you know, high level, VPs, head of marketing, all that stuff. They're all down here. They're all taking turns rotating in and out of every station. So it's super cool to see the company really get behind this event. And you know, we appreciate it. I know the fans do as well. 1320 to go. Wild style from Taka right there. Just a little out of control and unable to stay in that wave. I did like the energy down the line, but uh, just a little too much. Maybe too much mustard on that hot dog he's riding. Just a little bit. Scores come in small, just a 3.17 to a 4.83 from his opening ride. Let's take another look at it here. Sets himself up well for that first nose ride. I think, I mean, that's a really good critical nose ride that he ends up in. I think one thing that the judges maybe would like to see from Taka is just engaging a little bit more in that takeoff. A little bit more of a bottom turn thrown in, not even all the way to the bottom of the wave, but he just runs up to the nose so quickly on paddling into it that he doesn't actually have that speed coming into the nose ride. He then gains that speed going through it. Where for some of the other surfers in the draw, and I think we'll probably notice this from Connie, I'll start paying attention to it specifically within this heat, is that he might take a, a little bit more of a bottom turn into his approach on takeoff, maybe even just mid-face, and then set himself up for that nose ride, and he's going to come into that section with a little bit more speed and have that flow coming through, which was just lacking the slightest bit from Taka. We, they do have time. So there's 12 minutes to go here. We did shorten our heats as uh, surfer on surfer action started. So with 25 minutes on the clock, we're now over halfway through round four, heat seven. Connie Ellis Stewart on top for now. Stay tuned to find, what out, find out what happens next. Nice, serene Friday afternoon here, 1233 local time here in Huntington Beach, California. We're live from the south side of Huntington Beach Pier. This is the band's duct tape. Ten minutes to go here in round four, heat seven. Kaniela Stewart in the lead for now. Taka Inoue needs a 677. Plenty of waves coming through. We've seen 15 plus waves ridden by multiple surfers in these early rounds as now Taka Gets on the nose, a nice deep bottom turn to a top turn snap. Pushing the limits right there, almost edging up into performance longboarding, but holding back just enough to make it look fluid and stylish and within our criteria. He's making his way all the way to the sand. Nice rebound finish there. Right behind him, Coniella Stewart. And I'll ask you, Shannon, you've read the rule book back and forth multiple times. You've read the judging criteria. Was that too performancey from Taka? There definitely were, were some elements of it, especially in comparison to what we're seeing from Connie here. So really smooth transitions for Connie, not forcing things too much. I mean, he even just did kind of that full wrap on the inside section, which is super impressive. 
Um, for Taka, there was a little bit of that starting to really push off the tail, almost to that sort of pivoting conversation when we're talking about uh, turns. And that's something where the judges really want to see that engagement of the rail as opposed to pivoting. That opening nose ride was really good. I know before I said that we don't really want to see him not doing that bottom turn to start, but that worked out fine. Those first couple turns I'm okay with. Um, I think it was kind of just trying to get that board even around and engage. But right here you can see him kind of just having to pump along to find that inside section. And then again here he's going to actually kind of connect okay with it. I'm definitely curious to see where the judges will go. Again, I think we're lacking in the flow department on that wave. For Connie, that was a really solid opening nose ride as well. I like that we're having some of those bigger sets come through for the guys. He also kind of engaged that, that rail a little bit smoother than we saw from Taka, so that's a good comparison. It is a different angle that we're looking at with this camera, though, compared to the last one. Then right here through to the inside. Almost goes for that nose ride, but then decides to go for that full redirect. And that's such a good feeling when you can just engage that rail and then sort of wrap it around on the inside section. Yeah, if I was Taka's coach, simple, uh, simple terminology, I would say just chill out a little bit. And... You know, he's an amazing surfer. Uh, you can't help but sometimes get excited, especially in a heat, knowing that you, uh, you know, you've got to put up big numbers because Caniella Stewart is doing big things himself. But, you know, we do need uh, to lean into that traditional style of longboarding a little bit more than what we saw on Taka's last wave. That's why you see, you know, the scores, how they are. Caniella Stewart, a 5.33 and a 6.27. So uh, hopefully Taka... Uh, can just, you know, back down a little bit. I think that wave will be a good score. Uh, Might have been a little bit better if there was just a little kind of a, a less is more approach. But he's back in the heat nonetheless with a 6 one So uh, Taka Inui well within reach of getting the top spot here with 6 minutes and 45 seconds to go. Kaniela Stewart in the lead with a 6 and a 5-3-3. He does have party right now. So uh, this is going to be a test now of Connie's uh, kind of heat IQ as he has a, a lot of time to try to control the uh, priority situation. And this will be a really good comparison. So we haven't seen any scores filter through for Connie's last wave. Both surfers had that good nose right to start, good 5 to 10 combination followed up by a turn. Talk about those two turns in and then finished it off with that clean inside finish as well. Connie had a little bit more variety, maybe a little bit more flow to it, and his nose ride, I think, was a little bit better. But both of them really good outside sections. So the judge is also paying attention to those bigger waves, helping that score just boost up maybe a little bit for Taka. Not that the wave size is everything that matters, but it does mean that it's more critical, it's more difficult, there's more risk on the line because he was taking off on one of those set waves. Um, so I think it's sitting in a good position. And you just made that mention about, you know, Taka's coach maybe things that would be given back to him. Taka's coach is his mom, affectionately known as Taka Mama. If you're on Instagram at all, which I'm sure everybody listening in has an Instagram account, check out takamama.movies, Taka Mama Movies. She films everyone. She's been down here for like a week ahead of the US Open on the sand with her camera, getting footage of all the different surfers, in part because she just loves that and she likes to post things on Instagram, but also because she likes to help Taka work through things and work through his own surfing. So she's probably one of the most dedicated surfers, sorry, dedicated parents, I think, on the sand to helping her son Taka understand the criteria well and see what surfers are performing the best. They will analyze this heat to the bone by the end of it, going back and figuring out some little adjustments that he could have made. So cool. I love Taka Mom. I don't even know her, but I already love her just by the way you're describing her. 450 to go. Where in the world is AJ McCord? Oh, hey, guys, I'm over here. We're over at the San Vazan tent here at the Van Doren Village. You never know who you're going to find at the front of a massive crowd like this. Let's check it out. It's the team riders. We have Coco Ho. We have Ella McCaffrey, Sarah, Ruby, all of them right here signing autographs. So you always want to make sure come check out the Van Doren Village. You never know who you're going to find at the front of the crowd. Thank you, AJ. Please get me uh, Coco's autograph just real quick. I've got it every single year at the U.S. Open, and I need to fulfill that. One I of love my favorite that. surfers. That's amazing. Yeah. Speaking of AJ, such a great sideline reporter. She's been chasing up stories all over the place. She also told me earlier that Taka's mom sits down 
and watches every single wave that he surfs in a heat. We'll take a look at this one again. Great five to 10 combo. Remember that it was such a good start. Ooh, that's a bit of a hard drive off the bottom and then finds that second one. So this score is going to come through. That was a really good combo out the back. Now, this is where we're going to see that real aggression start to come in his surfing. He's chasing a 7.5. Curious to see where the judges are going to go for it. But Taka's mom, alongside of doing a lot of filming and posting edits for people, she sits down. She's done this for the last six to seven years of Taka's competitive career and for his sisters. There she is on screen. Is that a custom hat? Taka's mom? That is a custom Taka, Taka hat. Now, check out that notebook. She writes down every single wave that he surfs and tries to describe it the best that she can so that they can go back. And this is how she learned about surfing and what good surfing was and bad surfing was. Because she didn't really know the criteria and things coming into his competitive scene, both in shortboarding and longboarding. So she literally takes finite detailed notes of every wave he catches, and then they break it down afterwards with the footage and her notes what happened. So cool. And I, I actually ran into uh, Taka just a couple heats ago as he was preparing. I mean, grin, huge smile on his face. It's, smile. Like, it's like his hands are permanently stuck in the shaka position, which uh, I appreciate. He is uh, he's just a rad addition to the long world world tour. But right now he's got some work to do. He needs a 7.5 and Kaniala Stewart is uh, keeping the pedal to the proverbial metal all the way to the beach. Nice little quick turn right there. Fading across this flat section with the toes over the nose, a long hang five right there. Clean finish. Kaniala Stewart with a 7.33 and a 6.27. His cheer squad is stoked. Feeling stoked. Cousin, auntie there cheering him on. Kelis Kaleopa'a, who's on the women's side, is Connie's cousin. They all grew up surfing boards from Michael Takayama when he just started shaping when Kai Kaimana was just a little kid. He was just sharing with me that he kind of given boards to all these kids and they developed their surfing, which has been really cool to see them now perform on the world stage. That was a nice opening nose ride from Connie. And then I just love this flow coming through to the inside. And he's able to find a really good critical section right there once again. Kind of breaks through. Maybe not as critical as I kind of thought looking at it at the start. Seeing just a little bit of water pushing off the nose, a little bit flatter, without really being able to find like that critical, critical pocket. But that was a nice wave anyways. Yeah, he's, uh, he's throwing away five threes. So that's a good sign. Uh, Taka, his last wave came through a 4.90, I think. The judges uh, had to take a little away because of the verticality of his turn. I mean, that is obviously so hard to do, but we don't want you to do it. <laughs> we we want to just see a little bit more flow and a little bit more, uh, I, uh, I guess, I mean, relaxation doesn't sound like the right word, but, you know, it's, it, it's hard when a, you know, when a surfer gets excited and they feel like they need to manufacture something in terms of scores, uh, unfortunately, for Taka, the, uh, the aggressiveness didn't pay off that time, which is fine. He is a beautiful surfer when he, when he uh, gets everything in the right place. And he still has a chance here. Needs a 7-5-0. Well, now he needs a 7-8-3 as that last wave for Kaniela Stewart comes through a 6-6. Here we go. Taka Inoue gets to the nose to start. This wave is pretty wild. A lot of bump coming up the face. Did he just look at his watch? He Mid might have. <laughs> Mid-wave? That takes skill. Taking some consideration to the outside maneuver, knowing he's got to make everything of this. He's got a huge requirement in front of him, a 783. That is a beautiful 5 oh. to 10 combination. Unfortunately, just doesn't pedal back quick enough, and that nose bites. And Connie threw into the quarterfinals. Wow, we are stacking our quarterfinals with some incredible surfers. Give it up to Taka Inoue. A great performance, a solid showing. Taka Mom will be proud, no doubt. Kaniala Stewart, he does get the win, a convincing victory, 13.93 for the total. So uh, Team Hawaii, proud of young Kani Tsunami. More to come. We've got some big action. Tony Silvani coming up next with Declan White, and stay tuned, we'll be right back.
Aniala Stewart coming through triumphant, gets the dap up from his cousin. He makes his way up the beach with a win. Round four, heat seven goes to Kaniala Stewart. We do lose Taka Inoue. Uh, I was just starting to become a big fan of Taka, and uh, I'm just gonna have to wait till Malibu to see him surf again if he makes it into that event. I am Chris Cote, this is Shannon Hughes. That's Troy Elmore, AKA Floyd. And I got the Elmore hat on because you gave it to me the other day and I'm gonna wear it. I don't know, forever. Yeah, I you love look it. good. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for wearing it. I appreciate it. Congrats on your uh, Vans collection, which is uh, coming out any minute. Thank you. If not uh, right now, it could be dropping in, into the online and surf shops all over the world. Yeah, there's a couple. If you look around on the website and search, you'll find some. So that's cool. Heck yes. All right. Well, the action in the water has been heating up throughout the day. Now we have two of our top ranked surfers, number nine and number three, Tony Silvani from the east coast of the USA, Declan Whiten from Australia. Let's start it off with a paddle battle, and it's going to be Declan getting the uh, getting the edge there over Tony Silvani. So this is going to be pretty fun. So these guys. Uh, no doubt dedicated to the WSL Championship Tour of longboarding. I'm sure they've had a few looks and involvement with duct tapes of the past, but I think right here we're seeing a nice even matchup, two surfers with a lot of shared skill between them. And hopefully they, uh, they got the note that we just saw. And again, I'm not trying to ride Taka for going a little aggro, which is totally, you know, it's cool, it's fun to watch, but it doesn't fall within the criteria, so these surfers know that you gotta have a, a certain type of chill if you wanna be within the realm of what we're looking for here at the uh, Vans Duct Tape. And so much of that just comes down to the style and the way they surf their board. So just thinking back to that wave of Taka, it was such a nice nose ride coming out of it, but he went a little bit vertical and that, that was just that sort of pivoting or lifting like you would do with a short board. And in longboarding, as you know, in good traditional longboarding, Troy, we really want to see that engagement of a rail. For sure, yeah. I think like just like being smooth, doing all your maneuvers at the correct spot of the wave and stuff like that. And I mean, I haven't actually seen Taka before this event, and it was, he was really exciting to watch, and he was definitely getting radical. So, uh, but yeah, I think definitely being smooth and nose riding in the critical sections and stuff is a little bit more appealing for a longboard. I'd like to see Taka Mom's notes after that heat because you know she's proud of him, obviously, <laughs> and she's maybe thinking, well, you know, he went straight up in the whitewater. Shouldn't that be points? But, you know, as we all know, uh, you know, think, things change. They're I would have gotten you a 10 in the PSAA back in the day, but <laughs> totally, we've evolved a little bit, and Taka will be right there. I'm sure he's a huge future ahead of him. Yeah, and they're one of those duos that do then engage with the rest of the community. They will be in the athlete zone. I guarantee you picking the brains of anybody that walks through. Troy, if they see you, yeah. you will be questioned in a great way of okay. what you like about surfing, of what you think about Taka surfing, of just sort of the whole nuance to everything because they really want to learn and appreciate what's being expected of them now with those changes that have come into the tour, which is different from what Taka entered the world tour with for longboarding. For sure. And so I just love that approach from them that they're really open to learning everything yeah that's cool i think that this one is it's kind of like the turning point with the duct tape and wsl so it's confusing i don't know it's different like we see someone with a leash right here that's a no-no in the duct tapes before this uh so yeah it's different co-mingling in a beautiful way as we see mixed styles an eclectic field of surfers a great finish there for tony silvani this guy is a East Coast longboard icon uh, and a businessman. He said in a post-seed interview just a, a little bit ago, he's only surfed a few times this summer. He's got Airbnbs. He's got a surf school. He's, uh, he's doing a lot. But looks like he uh, got right back on that bike 
He's making it look nice. That's a great drop knee turn to start this wave. Yeah, nice to see him back on the surfboard, you know, finding some control out of the opening nose ride. Now looking for that critical position. I like that he's just been a little bit patient with it. Tap to the nose there, and he'll finish off on the inside. He's changed his equipment a lot over the years as well. Uh, I believe he's still working with Stewart on his boards. A little bit flatter. And Declan Whiten has been on a hot streak this year. I just love his surfing. I think it's really responsive. And um, yeah, he's making good use of this wave. Getting that rail engaged. Nice couple of nose rides as well. He's going to sneak past that section and just hit the double up. Yeah. I haven't seen him surf either. And I mean, he's looking really good. Definitely a little bit more aggressive, but still throwing in some traditional maneuvers like drop knees and stuff like that. And nose riding at the uh, correct part of the wave and stuff. He's looking good. You know, I feel like with uh, the field we have here, and especially in the fields you see in uh, duct tape events, it's kind of like a, you know, artists, right? You've got to have all the basics. You've got to be able to, you know, do a portrait of still life and all that. You get the basics done, and then you can go abstract. Yeah. And that's, I think, what we see a lot is they get the basics, the nose rides, all the cross-stepping, and the things that you have to have as a elite-level longboarder, uh, and then they can start getting creative. Uh, and that's where we start to see the unique styles come into play. And, uh, you know, that the, the showmanship and the, yeah. the showwomanship. Is that a word? Showwomanship? Oh, we'll run with it. I'm okay. happy with that. Yeah, he's definitely got the drop knee down. He's throwing in a lot of drop knees and maneuvering his board super well. You think Nat Young is kind of the uh, king of the drop knee? I think the original king for sure. I don't know who's the king now. I see a lot of drop knees by a bunch of different people. This kid, Chris Hall, it, he's a South Bay surfer shaper. He's got a killer drop knee. Tyler zekin has got a killer drop knee. Mitch Absher. Oh, yeah. I just saw Mitchell Absher. Yeah. That guy's got a good drop knee. Yeah. Um, Justin, he's throwing down drop knees all the time. I appreciate a good drop knee cutback because that's like specifically a longboarding yeah. traditional thing. You know, you don't see it. It'd be weird on a shortboard. <laughs> well, maybe we'll try it out yeah. and see what happens. I'll take your board out of the uh, duct tape festival and give it a go. <laughs> 17 and a half to go. Standing by with the winner of that last heat, Connie Tsunami is with Louisa Florence. It was a heat. Huh? That's How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. On to the quarterfinals. Stoked about that one. If you um, had to watch yourself in this heat and reconsider some stuff, like we were talking about, you know, Taka's mom taking every note, what would you think you would correct yourself or improve from this? experience to the next um i'm not sure i'll have to like kind of watch it over and kind of see what kind of you know sometimes um when i'm on the wave i'll see one one line that i choose where i could have chose a different line to do more maneuvers so just gotta see that experience doesn't come in the water for you it usually like it depends because this this wave is tricky you know there's a bunch of little reforms a little double ups so you got to kind of read it perfectly so for me to just kind of study that and try and get it down perfectly that's the goal What's in your pocket for the quarterfinals now? Um, I don't know. Probably just keep doing the same thing, you know. Um, just pray, you know, that God, you know, watches over me and provides some ways for me, and hopefully I move on to the semis. Gotta love the Hawaiian vibe, the gods, the shell, the yellow board. Here we go. Good luck. Thank you. 100% aloha right there, the sunrise shell on his uh, necklace right there. That is uh, most likely found on the beaches of... Uh, South Shore somewhere, a very, uh, you know, coveted object in Hawaii. It is, it is, you know, it's like finding gold anywhere else in the world. And Connie Ella Stewart right there, uh, an ambassador of Aloha. And I got to say the best hair of anyone in this entire event. And this is a big event, so that's a big compliment. Yeah, he's definitely got the best afro going on. What do you think of this one, Troy? So it looks like he got an in-betweener that's, you know, just enough to get him on the nose and go through and doing some drop knees, kind of waiting for the reform. Doesn't look like it's going to happen for him, but nice ride. I don't know. I think you kind of want to be taken off on more of the sets. That's what everyone's looking for and stuff like that. Yeah, that's definitely where we're seeing those really good steep sections out the back. For and sure. it's pretty standard here at Huntington. Like sometimes when it's small, it's just so slopey, especially when there is some bigger sets available maybe. Those kind of mid-range ones just don't offer that actual like stand-up. Yeah, there's that ditch here, and it's kind of a bummer. Sometimes you're stuck to the on the inside, or like you can get those sets that you can get that you know steep section on the outside, and 
it's going to push more whitewash through that hole and get you back onto the inside and hopefully the inside stands up good for you. Some of the middle ones though, every once in a while you might get a good one, I don't know, just from experience surfing out here, but it's hard. Yeah, I like Connie's uh, quote right there, just talking about, you know, he has a line in mind, but you really have to be an expert in reading water and reading the ocean. You know, he's a great waterman from Oahu, so uh, he's got uh, a leg up on most of his competition, but I think at this point, you know, the, all of these surfers have been surfing for most of their lives in all types of conditions. I'm sure they're all well-traveled. So, you know, with that, of course, comes inherent knowledge about reading the ocean. And, you know, Huntington Beach, well, uh, it is a kind of a vexing wave from beginning to end. It's still pretty familiar. I mean, you just got to stand up on the outside, do something cool, yeah. make your way to the shore break, and then do something cool again. Yeah. Way in the middle, subtle cool things. So just a lot of cool stuff on one wave. For sure. Simplifying the judging criteria. Make it look cool, like that. Yeah. Pushing through the foam ball. Now, when, when the foam ball covers the toes while they're on the nose, does that take away a little bit from the critical nature of a hang ten? Uh, I don't... It depends. Like, it's cool that you're making it through a section and stuff, but it's definitely more appealing when you see someone hanging 10 on that steep section, you know, their tail's locked in. Uh, but it's like he's going through a section on the nose. That's cool. It's definitely difficult. It's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Your average surfer and probably good to average longboarder wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, for sure. And, I mean, he would have just been, like, waiting for the next section anyway, so he made the most out of that wave, I would say. Yeah, I actually really like your phrasing of that, taking a look at it here. Like, he could have just kind of gone down to the bottom of that wave and set himself up here, maybe for another nose ride through that cleaner section. Yeah. So that definitely is a possibility. But at the same time, he kind of had this little crumbling section in front of him. So instead of doing nothing, he did something. For sure, yeah. And he had a big finish there. Almost pushed a lot. We don't want to see your fins unless you're doing a helicopter. So no airs <laughs> in the uh, duct tape. Well, we'll see what happens next. 12.35 to go. Stay tuned. More action right around the corner. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Vans Duct Tape Action, part of the Vans US Open of Surfing. We're live from Huntington Beach, California. If you don't recognize that pier, you might not be a surfer. <laughs> and that's not an insult, that just means you need to keep tuned in here because that is an iconic part of surfing history and heritage. There have been surf competitions here at this pier since surfing was a thing, since forever. Uh, surfers have been shooting that pier since day one starting with George Freeth, the Duke, all the way up to what we're seeing now, Declan Whiten and Tony Silvani in WSL competition here. As it stands now, your surfer in red has the lead, but Declan, or blue, has the lead, and Tony Silvani answering back now, and that's not how you want to answer by falling off your board. But I don't know what else was left on that wave, so maybe no harm, no foul, but it looked like there was some fruit left on the vine. <laughs> Yeah, I think there would have been that inside section for sure as we take a look at what happened during that break. We've got some scores to come through. 
Declan with a great drop knee turn now sets himself up here through the inside. He's getting a lot of power out of those drop knees, which is nice to see. And I love that little kind of soulful setup off the bottom, straight into the nose. Let's see if he can maintain control now on the finish, because that's kind of where we were lacking before. He is coming into those with a lot of speed. And I mean, his last score came through as a 6.4, so that's not bad. Um, sorry, that was for that wave. So his previous one before that, a 5-2-3. Judges liked the look of this one just a little bit more even. And uh, this is one of your younger competitors up against one of your older competitors. Always like a rookie versus veteran scenario. 9-10 to go. So Declan in the lead for now. Tony back against the wall just a little bit. Still needs a 7.07 .07 to get through this heat. That's a pretty big number. That would be the highest single wave score of this heat. But he could have a nice looking mid-sizer right here. Gets onto the nose through traffic. Makes his way around this section. A big carve working that board. And he hoping that this wave keeps the momentum. And as I say that, it's a straight up commentator curse. That wave completely disappears as if it was listening to the webcast. Meanwhile, on the other side of that peak, you've got Declan Whiten all the way through, dancing on the deck. Trying to prove a point with that inside snap that you can ride the red line yeah. and push it and you will be rewarded by the judges as long as you keep it smooth. He was rewarded for that last wave, a 6-4, the highest single wave score so far. Eight he's, minutes to go. He's really favoring those rights as well. What are your thoughts on this nose ride from Tony? Nice nose ride, especially backside going into the pier. Does more of like a snap and then kind of trying to find his line like we were talking about earlier. And yeah, I don't know, the going towards the pier right now, it seems like those rights are really pushing all the way through, like Declan's finding some really good ones and threading the needle all the way to the inside. So the rights might be the hot ticket right now. Yeah, he's able to really get that transition all the way through. And they just seem to have maybe a little bit less juice to them, but some good shape as it comes through to the inside. Yeah. And they are a lot cleaner than what we're seeing from the lefts. Yeah, maybe just the way the wind's blowing right now. It's a little bit smoother and stuff. But yeah, De Declan's looking good on all the rights he's getting. And he's doing maneuvers in the whitewash as he's waiting for, you know, the inside to stand up. He's doing those drop knees and stuff and kind of S-turning. Would not be a good look if he was doing the Huntington hop on the longboard. So he's definitely making the most of that middle section. Yeah, that might be a grounds for point deduction. Yeah, for sure. Hopefully we don't see that happen. 6.54 okay. to go. You know, one thing I've noticed about the entirety of our field, and I've had the chance to meet a bunch of the surfers competing here at the Vans Duct Tape. And uh, this is, of course, not a comment on any Challenger Series surfers or anything like that. But I've noticed that nearly every surfer that I've met and from what I've seen before and after heats, our longboard crew, male and female, very nice. They're so friendly, yeah. this whole group. I've met a bunch of new friends that I'd never met before. And uh, you know, it's just like Insta bros and uh, Insta friends all up and down the beach. Is that maybe uh, something uh, you know that makes you want to choose a longboard? You're a nice person, you're pretty chill. Is that like go into know. that decision? I mean, I have seen the bumper stickers that say, can't we all ride a longboard or can't we all get yes. a longboard? So. Okay. But that's definitely the vibe of the duct tapes. It's like, you're so stoked to be there. Even if you lose first heat, you're having like the most fun of your life. You know, it's like camp duct tape. You're taking buses, everyone's partying and stuff. Everyone's so cool. And from like the first duct tapes, you know, like people I only see at the duct tapes, but I'm still in contact with. And it's like, you pick off, pick up where you left off and have so much fun. So yeah, everyone is, it's not very competitive. It is, but it isn't, you know? Like, you want to win, but everyone's having fun. Well, you actually made history. You were part of the first heat of the first duct tape ever. <laughs> yeah, Virginia Beach. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't ready for it at I all. I heard you were <laughs> ripping. You keep saying that. I heard Congratulations for getting the call up anyways. <laughs> <laughs> and then you competed the last time we ran the duct tape here in 2019. It yeah. was kind of the last time you were wearing a jersey at all? Did you feel uh, like yeah, for sure. Uh, no. <laughs> you don't uh, wear a jersey free serving? No, <laughs> rash Why guards <laughs> sometimes <laughs> under my short john so I don't get sunburned. Ah, okay. uh, no, just kidding. But yeah, I do miss it for sure. Uh, I'm not the most competitive. I kind of freeze up out there and stuff. And uh, I feel like I'm, a, you know, 
really enjoying watching a lot of the younger kids that I haven't heard about and stuff like that. Like, and they're surfing so good and you know bringing new stuff to the table for traditional longboarding. So it's really fun to watch. I think it's been really great also to see that young crew invited into those events because at a young age they're getting exposed to what that traditional longboard surfing looks like. Yeah. And they're able to bring that into a new WSL criteria as well. For sure. I mean, I always favor like the most traditional, like the kid with the most dinged up board doing the craziest <laughs> drop knee, you know, weird hair, wearing trunks that are a little too short and stuff. Like <laughs> I favor that for sure more than like, but it's really insane seeing, you know, how well these kids are surfing single fins and you know performing more and stuff. Yeah, I'm a fan of the freaks. You know? Yeah, and I consider myself one as well at times. <laughs> uh, if I uh, if I was gonna you know say who my favorite longboarders historically speaking are, I mean they're all on the fringes. You know, Andy Niebliss is so fun to watch. Oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, he was a name I was looking up and down. I'm like, oh, where's Andy? Yeah. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll we'll see more of Andy. Uh, but, you know, all the surfers in our field, I've, I've gotten some new guys. Jules is a, an amazing surfer with some really cool, eclectic body movements and, yeah. and tweaks on the wave, which is super fun to watch. And I think both of the surfers we have in the water right now are a really great mix of kind of the new traditional. They, uh, they of course, can do all the tricks, but they can also get up on the nose with nice hang fives, extended, still hanging five. A five-second hang five. That's the benchmark right there. That was really nicely done. Yeah, that might be one of the longest hang fives that I've seen, actually. Obviously, not calling some of the heats. You missed some of the action. Now he's connecting it through. He's finally finding that reform yeah. on the right, which he hasn't been able to really even look for. Oh, if he had just put that pressure on the back foot to be able to ride out of that, it could have been, uh, you know, kind of inching towards that score that he's chasing. Yeah, that was a great wave, though. It stood up on the outside super nice. Uh, definitely found the line to make it through the inside and threw in a couple drop knees and drop knee bottom turn after one of his turns also. So two, three, four, five, six. That was an unofficial countdown. <laughs> that was nice. We're gonna stick with five. Yeah, talk us through these drop knees to the inside. So he just did a cutback and then did a little drop knee. Another one, and that was cool how the wave stood up right there, but yeah, then just got I don't know if it was a little bit of backwash too, but oh, really aggressive cutback. That looked cool. The dipping that back knee not only adds the difficulty of the the turn, but just looks cool. Yeah, and I appreciate uh, maneuvers like that that are both fun and functional. I don't. Yeah, who knows how that like came about? If they were just like. This looks proper if you put your knee back or yeah. like there are so many weird, cool, original maneuvers and like, you know, the 60s, like Quasimodo stuff or parallel stance. And I like watching all that quirkiness and like the drop knee is kind of one that's uh, still going, <laughs> but functional, like you were saying. I really liked that opening nose ride. Like you said, really kind of jammed in those couple of turns there. Got some power out of that drop knee, which is pretty sick. There's a... Australian surfer girl, Kat Hughes, that has the best drop knee. So she's, she's on the drop knee list too. She's cool. on the drop knee list. Honestly, fantastic. Has competed at this level for a number of years. We haven't seen her uh, at, at the WSL World Tour level for maybe three or four years now, but one of the best drop knees of all time and just really gets a lot of power out of it and is in, able to then engage into the next maneuver really easily. A um, couple years older than Declan would be, but they would have surfed a lot of events. Cool. Kind of, you know, men's and women's divisions. What is what is your back foot doing on a drop knee? Are you kind of like on your toe, like you're starting a foot race kind of? Yeah, at least for me, that's what it feels like. And you put your foot further back than if you were going to do a regular cutback. So it's almost like you cross that back once and then really slam it back there. At least from when I try to do them, that's what I'm trying to do. Or at least, like, I like when people are getting super low and stuff like that when they do it. Oh no, that was a pearl. It started out pearl. okay. He got yeah. some nice lift out of that hang 10. For sure, yeah. Well, we got 20 seconds left. Coming up next, a battle of the champions. Steven Sawyer going up against Taylor Jensen. They definitely have some competitive history between the two of them. And that is going to be it. Nicely done. Well, that's not going to be it because Tony Stavani is still going. And he only needs a 608. 
He chipped away that requirement. It was in the like mid seven range before that last second to last wave, which was a five eight three. But Declan just controlled it. I think for Deck, finding that right was really important um, early on and able to get just a few of those waves that link together really well, able to combine multiple maneuvers with flow. Where for Tony, chasing those lefts just didn't work out for him. All right, congrats, Declan White, and thank you so much, Troy Elmore. Shannon, we got you. Got to get you a Troy Elmore hat. I mean, uh, yeah, you know, cool. I know. I want one. Come on, guys. I we're, got we're one. We're gonna for do you. our best. We'll be right back with more action. This is the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Vans Duct Tape Invitational, and we are now in the quarterfinals. Big matchup here. Steven Sawyer out of South Africa against multiple world champ Taylor Jensen, and it is going to be an exciting matchup. 25 minutes in the water, and hi, I'm Kaipo. This is the Waxhead. Happy to be here. Matt Shinovsky. <laughs> I like just going by the Waxhead, and I like just going by Kaipo. Would you like, like just one, one word Waxhead name? Waxhead works fine. Okay, Shinovsky. We got it. You know what? What do you think about this matchup right I think now? Stevie Sawyer, Taylor Jensen. It's going to be exciting because you've got the 2018-17 uh, world champion, Taylor Jensen, up against the 2018 world champion. We have Stevie Sawyer, a goofy footer and a natural footer. So this is going to be fantastic. We're going to be able to get split peak scenario. Most of the high scores on the rights in that last heat. Let's see what Stevie can do in the lefts. Here he goes on cue. All right. Steezy Steven Sawyer on the tip, Matt. T steering from the nose there. And uh, nice little slash there for Stevie. Channeling Justin a couple of heats ago who really uh, took that left to town. Nice opener there for Stevie Sawyer. Uh, he's had, he was on a really good run. He had such a good heat earlier in the day when he overcame uh, Kaiselis. And it was... It was impressive to watch because Kai was on as well. But tell you what, Taylor's probably playing his cards a little close to his chest. Um, I did speak to him and asked him about the scores in his last heat, if he felt they could have been a little higher. And he said, no, nah, he wasn't that, you know, he's real tuned in and, and, and very ready for a long journey ahead. So he switched on. Uh, who's the advantage when we look at the, the two surfers in this heat? Who would you give the advantage to in this quarterfinal one? Taylor Jensen, purely based on his experience of Huntington. Uh, he's surfed here many times before, including when longboarding was a part of the US Open. And, you know, this type of wave, uh, he was just surfing super buttery before, and he seemed to have a really good rhythm with the lefts and the rights. And after what we just saw in the previous heat with, uh, with Declan and, and Tony, uh, I think uh, Taylor's going to be licking his lips. Well, I mean, as we look at, you know, past world champions, 2018 world champ Steven Sawyer, 2017 world champ, Taylor Jensen, when in time did the criteria start, you know, moving from progressive longboarding to traditional longboarding? Because I feel Stephen Sawyer really 
represents traditional longboarding, while Taylor Jensen does have some big moves off the tail. It did actually change in around 2017. Uh, uh, it, was, it was just that there weren't many surfers on tour adapting to it. Uh, and here we have Taylor Jensen, uh, beautiful opener there, nice 5 and 10 combo. Nice drop knee carve, beautiful clean transitions, great footwork. You know, just timing the nose ride perfectly. And you know what? That was just a, a clinical wave once again. I mean, that was beautiful to watch there, Kaipo. Well, great start for Taylor Jensen. Steven Sawyer opened up with a 3.5. Looks like Taylor got the best of the first exchange. What your thoughts, Matt? Absolutely. He's on that 9.6 uh, pintail. We haven't seen many pintails in this event. Uh, most of them are on square tails for the nose riding aspect. But uh, a Stevie, yeah, beautiful open up at only a 3.5. No uh, critical sections there and, and just to feel his feet and get back into it. But uh, his Taylor's recap here, kind of that uh, staying high on the wave, 5 and 10 combo. You see how he lifts his arms in the air to, to sort of de-weight himself. And you'll see that a lot with uh, the bigger frame surfers. Uh, but super delicate footwork here. Didn't put a foot wrong. And the sole arch, hands behind his back, and a really kind of like a sketchy landing there where it sort of popped off and maintaining that momentum. Nine minutes, 10 seconds, counting down on the clock. And Taylor paddling out. Well, Declan Whiten's on to the quarterfinals. Let's hear from Declan. Yeah, and he's keeping his eye in the water. You had a long time today just to study the conditions. Do you feel like that helped you somehow today? Yeah, I mean, we were lucky surfing later. Um, the tide got heaps better in the afternoon than say this morning. It was pretty tricky out there on the low. Um, but yeah, it's been cool. It's so nice just hanging out down here. So it's a good, good place to enjoy the day anyway. Yeah, what everybody has been telling me is just like the spirit of the US Open. It's just so different because you, you get to hang out with so many friends that you used to, but plus the short board. So what have you been enjoying the most all these days that you're here? Uh, I think just seeing everyone. It's been a, like a few months since Manly. Um, and the vibe down here is pretty cool. Like having everyone on the beach and like everyone's really into it. Just visitors and people that you don't know, just spectators and stuff are really into it down here. Uh -huh. So it's pretty cool just um, coming in and having all the support on the beach. And yesterday we were saw it, like we were watching you, you know, surfing. And Chris Cote was like, "Was he a dancer in the past because of your moves? Like, is there anything you're hiding from us?" Oh, definitely not. I've got <laughs> two left feet for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked him to teach me some moves, but he was like, "I'm gonna keep this a secret." So, take it to your next heat, and I hope to see you in the glass again. Congrats. Ah, uh, thank you. Thanks, yeah. Declan, um, Manly Beach, right? Manly Beach, yeah. I think uh, <laughs> Louisa was talking about maybe the twinkle toes there. That's... Declan does have very delicate footwork. <laughs> um, but that verticality, which I received a few messages about, uh, that was mentioned not by us. It was actually by Chris Cote and Shannon in that previous heat. But uh, Troy agreed as well. But I think what they meant about the verticality was the loss of momentum. The harder you hit it and, the, and there's nothing left on this right hand on the inside section, once you land, you may land on your feet, but you lose all speed. And it, it's radical, but radicality is not in the uh, <laughs> judging criteria. Flow and momentum are. So you can hit it as hard as you want. If you don't come out of it with speed, you're not going to get the score. This is true. And put stitching together, you know, use of the entire surfboard um, was illustrated by Taylor Jensen's 7.17 strong start for the three-time world champ. Absolutely. Yeah, that 717 well-deserved. Clinical once again. You know, it's you got someone like, you know, the Taylor Jensen, 57% 50, fan pick. So he's, he's with me. Uh, with me there on my suggestion, but uh, Stevie with 43%, um, that's still pretty high uh, against um, a three-time world champion with Stevie just winning the one. So uh, fans out there still backing Stevie for an upset, but here's Taylor. See those left to right transitions. He's really generating speed so well, rail to rail. And, and, and nowhere to go there, but you know that's a good way to duck out. Unfortunately, he's just gonna have to swim a couple of yards and get his board because he's going leashless out there. But uh, that really frees up the feet as well. And just aesthetically, um, it's really pleasing to, to see the freedom of, a, of the pureness of just like 
Yourself and your board. That's it. That's Speaking all you need. Speaking of pureness, have a look at that board of Stevie Sawyer's. That's the back up there with the red rails and the, the nice blue uh, airbrush. Um, have Taylor's replay driving through the whitewash. Super technical for a pintail to nose ride like that. It's, it's definitely some uh, from very stable um, rocker and tail design combined with a really stiff fin. Ducks into that little tube just to get out of there. So... Um, I was just, I just love watching Taylor surfing at the moment. He's surfing really free and he's really got those little speed pockets uh, worked out on those right handers. Sure does. So it starts with a 7.17. Not as good on his second ride, but a, a decent backup with a 4.5. Here we go. The answer back from Steven Sawyer. Heading towards the pier, gets the 5, switches to the 10, and some jumbled water uh, kicks him out the back of the wave. Yeah, that's. Uh Hopefully he gets priority back because it's kind of like a missed opportunity there with 14 minutes left on the clock. Stevie needs to build pressure on Taylor because he's just locked in a 4.5 for a wave that, you know, he was really cruising on Kaipo. He, he, he didn't expect too much out of that and uh, he's out to an early lead with Stevie needing an 8.17 to advance. That's right. Um, Sawyer's going to reduce that deficit with this next score, uh, his next scoring wave, but tall wall to climb for the South African on the paddle here taking a look at it and Sawyer is going to take it right on the backhand some footwork and catches a rail and killed his forward momentum that was odd yeah do you think there could be some nerves out there um, it's it's very un Stevie like we've seen him come out all guns blazing the last few heats so uh, yeah this is 0 0.87 there and yeah, one and a 3.5. So this is a very uh, an unusual start of the heat for Stevie. But, you know, it's we're on longboards. It's really quick to get back out the back and, and reset for heat. And just speaking to Michael Takayama just before, was giving his son Kai a bit of a pep talk. And yeah. he's like, you know, the best advice is. And I said, what? And he goes, I just say, look, you just paddle really fast. He goes, you stand up. If someone's in the way, you turn. <laughs> Go get him. It's so simple, you know, because you can give him all the information you need, but at the end of the day, keep it simple. Stupid. It was pretty wild, too, that uh, Michael Takayama Kai's, Kaimano's dad, who shaped that board that he was riding, that board's, I think, around 10 years old. Yeah, I, yeah. He might have gone a little bit extreme on that, on that prediction. I remember it in Mexico in 2017-ish, so that would be about five years old, maybe a little bit earlier than that. But it's an old favorite of Kai's. Yeah, yeah. And it is like a... Like, Taylor's riding a proto-type board, same with Kai Salas. All right, a paddle here. And it is Steven Sawyer again. Wow. Uncharacteristic nerves and fumbles by Steven Sawyer at the beginning of this heat. Hey, where's AJ? shoe at the Van Doren Village. We have so much going on and this gives me a bird's eye view of it all. We have the shaping bay, we have music going on, you can pick up an instrument, there's games, there's a great viewing area so you don't miss a single section of the action and of course get your picture taken in a van shoe. Pretty fun down here at the Van Doren Village you guys. Yeah AJ, wonder what size that is. 1,000. All right, here we go with Taylor Jensen, our heat leader. And a little roller coaster on the inside. Jensen continues to surf through. And Steven Sawyer really has not found form as of yet in this matchup. But Steven having over 11 minutes to regather himself and get two good waves. Yeah, it's... Um it's a little bit concerning for Stevie because this heat should have been all fireworks and he was all re re revved up and ready to go. But uh, Taylor, the consummate professional, finishing up another wave and we'll, uh, we'll get a replay shortly of what we missed there. But trying to better a low score of a 4.5. Um, really feels like Taylor's just pacing himself in this event. Speaking to CJ Nelson yesterday who's on site for uh, a coaching role as we watch the replay of, uh, of Taylor's. CJ alluded to, uh, to Taylor actually being his, his pick to take out this event. And um, just a little subtle mention that he's, he's ready as, as well as anybody else too. So look at the smoothness from Taylor. Just carving rail to rail, those transitions. And that board just looking like it's in the right place at the right time. Tapping off the top. So again, another really well surfed wave from Taylor. 
5.83 Kaipo. He's dropped that 4.5. So he's way out in the lead. And uh, Stevie's chasing a 9.5 right now. Yeah, talk about Taylor Jensen's equipment. I believe he ri rides Firewire. Am I correct there? Firewire, Thunderbolt technology, yeah. So um, so those Thunderbolts, so this is not your typical kind of board construction. I, I would think that it has like a, a one or two pound, a very light EPS core, and then a wrap around it. You know what? I'm going to get right into the uh, the crux of his surfboard after this heat. I'm going to go speak to him because whatever it's under his feet is working really well in these choppy conditions where people are getting bucked off. We've got a former world champ, Stevie. Here he goes. He's going to try and right the wrongs of the previous wave, and he's doing a very good job so far. Beautiful drop knee slash. Even losing a little bit of the, the uh, losing a little bit on that uh, that carve there, but those knifey rails coming back. Oh, I'm digging the parallel stance and the transition right now, coming into the wow. short break for Stevie Sawyer. Redirects left again. Wants to make a great Way. last impression, and let's finish off in the pilings. Why not? Steven Sawyer trying to throw on the brakes, but uh, that's going to be a ride that's going to get him right back into the game. Phenomenal. Just what he needed. Uh, critical nose right in that outside section. That dropped me. Can't wait to see the replay of that. Um, but we have Taylor just super smooth and, and powerful. Um, Stevie throwing a bit of unpredictability there as well, so nice. Kind of like a 10 there as well on the outside. Bit of backwash in this. Beautiful. And those rails are a combination of like a 50-50, but they are sort of pinched as well, which allows that, that beautiful parallel stance. Any, a, little, a little salute to uh, somebody on the pier, perhaps. That was unreal. Points up to the crowd on the pier. That's why we call him Steezy Steven Sawyer, because he just oozes style in his surfing. And then add the degree of difficulty with the pier shoot. I like it. I yeah, like what I'm seeing. Cool. That was great. I love that uh, unprediction, unpredictability there. That was really cool. And that's what the duct tape's about, you know. Traditionally, although this one's a qualified event and uh, the invites are not actually invited, uh, the results speak for themselves in their regional qualification. Uh, but in this case, Stevie possesses what we would usually see at the Vans US Open for the duct tape. Some... Uh, unpredictable surfing which has earned him the high the second highest wave of the heat with a 6.70 6.7 steven sawyer has reduced the deficit he now needs a 6.31 to take the lead let's see if sawyer can take the lead off of taylor jensen we're going to find out right after this break Quarterfinal number one out in the water here at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. Taylor Jensen on the lead over Steven Sawyer. Sawyer has reduced his requirement to take that lead. 6.31 is what the South African needs. He's out there in the red jersey. Jensen in the blue jersey. Down to six minutes on the countdown. And opportunity for Steven Sawyer, but he's going to have to elude the, the priority of Taylor Jensen, who has the lead and priority. Here we go. Steven Sawyer breaks away, looks left, All gets right. to the nose, glides through that section. A little bit of levitation there. 
Has to deal with some warbly water wax head. Then here he nears the pier. Yeah, that's uh, and that parallel stance again. That one not cooperating on the inside, Kaipo, but you know, that shot of Stevie paddling for that wave really showed just how much our chop is in the surface. We haven't seen wind for the last few days here, uh, not as strong as this, and it's really affecting the surface. And that's perhaps why Stevie was catching some chops at the beginning of the heat with five minutes remaining. Um, he's sort of making up for that lost time, but it's deteriorated, no doubt. Tides come in, which is favorable for a longboard. But you can see that, that texture out there, and you've got a mixture of that uh, the sort of northwest wind swell and some south swell coming through as well. So it's tricky. And, you know, Taylor's picked the eyes out of it, and then Steven really did well on that 6.70. But the game's changed a little. On the replay, you can see Steven Sawyer just under the priority, able to sneak away. So you see how he's in the middle of the board there, step back to control. His foot was over the fin just to control through those chops. Um, they're the little tiny idiosyncrasies that separate longboard from shortboard, but, um, but also the traditional element of longboarding versus the performance element where you're not generating speed from the multiple fins or the edge in the board. You're actually generating speed from the wave. You're surfing the wave, fitting the board in the pocket by utilizing the middle of the board, the trim spot, which is generally, you can see where he's knee paddling now. Kaipo, that's flat there. The board's flat and generally all longboards will be uh, flat there. Not just a knee paddle, but it's momentum. You have a nine foot board with a lot of rocker, it's gonna push water. But Stevie's on a nine foot four with me, uh, probably say three and a half inch nose rocker, maybe four inch tail rocker. Uh, but in the center, it's pretty flat. So it's allowing him to knee paddle. And it's also what's helping him maintain speed through sections. Why would you want a knee paddle? Is it just a different a stroke angle when you're paddling? Uh, it alleviates the rib cage, diaphragm, all that stuff. It also gives your lower back a little bit of a rest as well. Um, but in the case of Zoe Gorpion, one of our female competitors knocked out earlier today, she had uh, a broken rib. So the knee paddle was very efficient. It was probably one of the sole reasons why she was actually able to surf, because she didn't have to paddle on her stomach. Yeah, yeah. Um, Zoe. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, knee paddling, it's just a nice variation. and. Um, well, I know in long distance paddling, guys like Jamie Mitchell and so forth, they'll knee paddle when you're paddling long distance on race boards because changing positions, you're actually using a different set of muscles. Correct. You actually do have a different uh, angle of paddling. And again, like you said, you're just um, alleviating that, that pressure on your chest. And yeah. it actually opens up your lungs more. So if you think about surfing, I, I mean, and you're paddling, you're, it's like running with someone sitting on your chest, if you think about it, cardiovascularly. Absolutely, and then your lower back's in a bind, your, uh, your shoulders are, you know, it's a terrible posture, and a lot of surfers, um, you know, do have surf-related injuries specifically because of paddling. Um, the performance elements that come into it, like a lot of surfers out there right now. I mean, I'll give you a little bit of trivia here. Uh, I love it. The longboard, the longboard era in the 60s only lasted for about eight years, Kaipo. By 1960, longboarding in America was uh, pop culture. It was part of pop culture. By 1968, it was gone, disappeared. So you could argue that the youth of the 60s only rode a longboard for eight years. I've been riding a longboard for 20 years. So my back and my arm from carrying the board, sitting on the board, you know, we're rotating our feet around, talking to Mitch Abshear last night, who's uh, working with Vans in the duct tape. Same thing, it's the SR joint down the bottom, it's that lower back that really gets a workout from also that back foot pressure that we're, you know, nose riding, steering from. What about, uh, let's see if the if surf knots ever come back to surfers' feet. Oh yeah, the board bumps, absolutely. I've got a couple, bumps. absolutely. Yeah, tiny ones, the, the 60s, now. those guys had giant surf Huge. knots. Huge, yep. And uh, they didn't, we, t we actually talked before today about no wax on boards. Did you know when the knee paddling out they use the balls, the, the, the bottom of their feet and the top of their feet to control themselves and they would go over a wave on the knees. Yeah. You think about it, you've got no wax, so you're using your knees and your feet to hold you on the board as you're punching through the wave. Yeah, I mean, hell, my, my, my grandfather was a surfer, my dad's surfer. I mean, I remember just paraffin and candle wax before the invent of any kind of specific surf wax. That's what you went to the lick, uh, went to the hardware store. Yep and just got candle wax, and that's what you use to, and the candle wax is not the grippiest stuff in the world. Tell me about it. It's um, better well, than in fact, we used to use it to wax up curbs for skating. Yeah, there um, you go. That's the real use for it. 50 seconds left on the clock. <laughs> and it looks like Taylor Jensen 
is going to go into the semifinals because he's got priority. He's got the lead. Steven Sawyer needs a 6.31. That's a pretty big number in the context of this heat. And I'm sure that Taylor's got a side eye on Steven in his position right now. I'm surprised he's giving him even that much room in this closing few seconds. It doesn't look like there's much coming. There was a small little bump just coming where that black buoy is. But uh, Taylor's, he's going to get that next wave. Um, yeah, this is, this is a tough scenario for Stevie because he started slow. You know, his first four waves were basically throwaways and came back towards the end. But... You know, a couple of missed opportunities there for him, uh, unfortunately, and he'll be kicking himself. All right, well, great sportsmanship here, and Steven Sawyer will take away an equal fifth from Huntington Beach, and Taylor Jensen is going to dance into the semifinals. And you know what? Let's boogie on to a break right now, and we'll be back with more action from the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. Quarter final number two in the water here at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. It is Kevin Skvarna on your screen here, kicking out against Kaimana Takayama. What's up for grabs? A spot in the semifinals. Takayama opened up with a 1.5, likely not going to be in his scoreline at the end of the heat, and a 1.07 for Kevin Skvarna out of Dana Point, California. So, uh, Neither surfers with an advantage, just the clock ticking down. This is just like a good old fashioned duel. Both of these surfers know each other uh, inside out with their techniques. You've got once again a goofy and a natural footer. But these two surf at San Onofre all the time. And the Southern California locals, all the coalition events in Cell Kids, and here's Kai. Takayama to the nose, steady there for the oh. nose ride, comes down, recovers in a layback, but that killed his momentum, so he couldn't continue on with that wave. You can see the frustration in the body language there for Kaimana Takayama, a third generation surfer from a legendary family. Uh, the Takayamas, great uncle Donald Takayama, uh, had so many contributions to surfing in both surfing approach, discovering spots, shaping surfboards, and he made a mean teriyaki sauce as well. Wow, teriyaki sauce, I love that. They actually sold, they actually sold it. He had Don, Uncle Donald, Donald Takayama's uh, teriyaki sauce bottled and sold in stores and stuff for a period. Here's the winner from quarterfinal number one, Taylor Jensen making his way up the beach. Yeah, I'm gonna have a look at that board later on. Looks very spicy underfoot for Taylor and he's just cruising through this event. Now into the semifinals, um, CJ Nelson's prediction may just be you know, he may be onto something there. So uh, here we have Kevin just looking for that little reform, not happening. So uh, 21 minutes remaining. Two really good friends traveled the world together. Both families know each other as well. And um, it's going to be an exciting heat. It's going to, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of waves ridden. Well, that's the one thing about the professional longboarding community. It's a, it, it's a 
a very friendly group of people who really support each other. And these surfers need to switch modes when they get into competition modes and when they put in the put on the jerseys. Absolutely, <laughs> switching modes and and not internally, not only from the friendship aspect, uh, but you know, it's it's really tricky to ride a nine foot longboard when there's bump on the face like this. Doesn't matter if it's one feet or ten feet. Um, the, that flat rocker, which we talk about being also so ad advantageous, uh, is also a detriment when we're paddling and the nose is purling. But uh, Kai, on the right side of the rib here, can he connect to this reform? And he's in the right spot on the board. It's a and test he gets of it. planing, and he gets it to the shore break. That was incredible. That's really light foot and re reading the wave. So well read wave from Kaimana Takayama. Here we go, Sparna. And that wave just goes dead in the, in the gutter section there. So it's going to be advantage to Kai Takayama. And I'll tell you that uh, Kevin was persevering on the WSL Longboard Tour up pre the uh, adaptation to traditional style surfing. The criteria was there. Not a lot of the competitors had adapted to it. And Kevin was one of the lone single fin surfers along with uh, David Arganda. Uh, those guys were surfing really, uh, really well. But unfortunately, the experience at the time, they were getting trumped by guys like Taylor Jensen and Harley Ingleby and Kai. Here he is against the pier, no leash. Um, and it's a replay from a side angle of Kai, or is this a... No, this is the side angle of that wave previously. And he's just trimming through. Does he make the connection? He's in the middle of the board, steps back, and he makes that connection. And a little tap off the top. So that'll be the best wave ridden so far in this heat. That one was a... What do we get? 3-8-3. 3-8-3, yeah. So taking the lead, an early lead. So one thing I noticed, you know, before we broke into that replay was Kaimana getting caught in the white water, waves coming through, he's against the pier, and he does the turtle roll, turning his board over and then using that rocker in his board, basically a reverse rocker, mm -hmm. to submarine underneath the wave. That's one of the techniques to get under white water, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you've got the turtle, you can, with a longboard with that momentum, you can paddle through some white water, uh, but at the same time, the, um, yeah, if you flip over, and the whitewash goes straight over the bottom of the board. Uh, it's a very efficient way, but you've got to be holding on. You've got to life. hang on, yeah. That's right. Um, but that's the same with rescue boards. We talk about um, you know, early lifeguards and the crossover between surfing and... Uh, there we go. There we go. Perfect. Now, if he mistimes that, right. that board's going in the pier. Yeah. That's, that is actually rolling over and actually underwater feeling when to push against the wave. So the technique would be you're underwater and when you feel that wave, just the white water, just about to hit the board, you want to kind of push against that so you can push that board and use that reverse rocker to kind of dig into to the water and submarine that board just a bit. And it sounds a little bizarre, but that's another skill set that uh, a lot of longboarders, if they're riding surfboards in a variety of different waves, um, that's, that's a skill set they'll develop in the muscle groups. Yeah. So that's super upper body, that's your pecs, that's your, your um, biceps, your triceps, um, and core strength to rip that board around. You see some beginners, and I know there's a lot of people watching this super fascinated. Uh, you know, it's morning in Australia right now, and there's people of all different levels watching this. And how do they hold their board? That was incredible. You know, he did it so quick, so fast. But you just get used to it. Yeah. And it's a core strength that we underestimate as experienced surfers. Uh, but when you are helping someone, you go, wow, yeah, that is a skill in itself, the, uh, the old turtle roll. Look at scratching into that one and unable to get that wave and he's going to lose priority so priority error for Kevin Skavarna hands it over to the leader Kaimana Takayama and a little bit of frustration there we have a filling in tide it's really taking effect of the break we still have the tide filling in probably for another hour or so yep. and it already looks very high tide even though it's only a five foot high tide this afternoon but it has this high tide kind of vibe to it out there so, yeah we spoke this morning on the lower tides and uh, you asked me what was it going to look like and I pretty much said exactly the same thing it'll move in on the inside um, it will be hard to connect but if the surfer does connect they'll be able to get the scores so this guy that wave hasn't even broken yet he's in that nice trim spot uh, as he makes his way from left oh, towards the pier that was beautiful great camera angles and wow. and just his ability to really be aware beautiful. of the planing section of his board and to skate through and it's almost like when you when you open ocean race you're looking at wind bumps and you want to stay on the wind bump and, and go from yeah. like bump to bump that's exactly what he did right there 
weaving and reading the energy in the ocean. Love that you mentioned that, Kaipo, because there's a lot of hydrodynamics that shapers um, do think and talk about, and boat design is very relevant. Wow, and Kevin Skivana, oh, oh, just throwing it, it all out, and talk about core strength. Unfortunately, the wave actually did dissipate there, but uh, yeah, wow, right into the pit. Oh my gosh. Okay, let's have a look how experienced Kevy is here. And he goes for the duck dive. Okay. So, um, so Kevin, I don't know what this is in uh, in pounds, but Kevin would be about uh, 80 kilos. Yep. Um, and that board, uh, pro possibly about 9.6 or 9.8 or uh, 9.7. So that's a big, that's a pretty big board to duck dive. Um, but the technique, he actually uh, had one hand up on the on his on the, on the left and the other hand back down on the right and he dug the nose in and twisted it sideways and actually was able to push the rocket down and penetrate through it uh, very skillful and you know what these are professionals these are the best in the world you know this is not just about making it all look super easy Kaipo that was that was super graceful under pressure and we're not even he wasn't even on the wave wow yeah that was Im impressive and a duck dive on a long board is definitely a different kind of technique than a duck, a straight duck dive on a short board. I think that's the, the point you were trying to yeah. make. It is more of a twist, twist. To, because you need to get that really long equipment twisted and sliced under the water. I mean, that could have been the end of the heat like Kai previously. These are the little idiosyncrasies once again that separate longboard to shortboard and they are often overlooked. Thank you so much for pointing that out. We're learning so much about you know design, technique, um, approach, and let's learn more about maybe some bathymetry out there. For that, I'm going to throw it to Mitchell Salazar. <laughs> Kaipo, your vocabulary this week has been fantastic, just so you know. But yeah, I actually want to talk about the berm that we have right in front of the scaffolding area. This berm wasn't here before this last well began, so without that south-southwest well and Hurricane Frank, we actually wouldn't have had the same kind of development that we've seen at the Pier Bowl in the last two days. So because of all that sand development going up against the pier, as we're seeing Kevin on the back end here with a good turn on the outside, looking to make his way to the inside. And this is where I see the, the, the pier ball waves really mattering so much and being a factor in the scoring potential for not only these two competitors, but everybody that's been in the event. Great 10 right there to end for Skvarna too. And these gentlemen know each other, they're neighbors down in South Orange County. They've competed against each other many times too, but I think the conditions have not only bettered a lot since we started this event earlier this week, but one thing that we've noticed so far is that they're not even using the southern or middle peak anymore. Everything's been concentrated on the south side of the pier, right next on the Pier Bulkaipo. That was fantastic insight there, Mitchell, and I can attest to that and seeing some absolutely unique, and I'm sure a lot of the shortboarders coming up in the future events and looking at this right now, the sand has been displaced. Uh, we do have that build up and a lot of sand and erosion on the beach, so these surfers are going right through to the pier now as the tide's moving in. They're on that inside triangle bank. Look at all the reverberation. This is now fully turned into a pier shootout with Kai Takayama trimming through the pier. Um, these guys are uh, surfing a unique HP and um, they're having fun doing it too. Absolutely love that this heat is starting to tighten up. Kevin Skvarna with that 2.4, the judges saw another score, so it looked like it was in a position with Kai Takayama being able to run away from this, uh, but now we got the paddle battle under the pier. Paddle battle was actually happening afterwards, but I think these guys got the memo and thought it was during the heat. <laughs> There's money up for grabs too, as per normal duct tape rules, but uh, here's Kevin, look, stroking away. Big fit junior lifeguard Kevin, who wasn't always the frame that he is, he once tells, tells me. Um, his nickname was Donut? Doughboy, I believe. Oh, wow. Um, but he can tell that story maybe in his post-it interview. If I, he's... <laughs> I did refer to him as a Dana, Dana Hills Dolphin, uh, but that was not his high school. It was San Juan Hills, so he's actually a stallion. Stallion. Well, he's certainly a stallion now. And, and he's, uh... A stallion just won the paddle battle. He should be getting the uh, priority as he does over Kaimana Takayama. So that is valuable for him in that... He will have an opportunity to have first choice the next wave coming through. He needs just a 5.51 because he's trailing Takayama at the moment. Yeah, that was a very crucial priority uh, move for Kevin. So those extra strokes and that uh, stallion-esque paddle was uh, was well earned because he now needs a 5.51. Now the lefts aren't really cooperating that well in this heat, Kaipo. They're, they're not linking up onto that bowl and redirecting back to the right. Um, but we'll see... Well, this right was a 
Wow. And that was the, I think this is the one, this is the one in the break where, uh, where Mitchell was filling us in on the, uh, the erosion on the beach. Some nice footwork there and trying to get that link up and redirects into the pier. Ooh, and was able to, uh, that was a bumpy old ride there, but he did the best he could. And that's right against the inside pier. And he's up again. And Kevin working the inside here. Now he really needs to play to get over this little hump. Gets forward on the board, does so. Wow. And <laughs> kicks the board away behind him, Kai Takayama. Uh, just trimming away. Look at that uh, that hull bottom. Just wow. And he's just lifting that up. And you actually, that's the rocker there as well. So super, super complex but simple board there. I know it's... Uh, it's quite ironic that I say that because he's just trimming around, but that board, that's um, fantastic momentum on that inside section. Um, I mean, the thing's like a spaceship. It's like a UFO. Um, being able to trim through that section and make that drop, step on the tail. But Kevin Skivana really pushing it. A lot of showmanship in this heat. He was after a 5-5-1. We'll have to watch the replay because there's a lot to unpack. Here it is, right for you, Matt. All right, so uh, the wave isn't broken yet. Gets up very high. I love this super technical adjustment here. He just makes it. And now, getting low. Really, really low in that middle of the board. Maintaining trim. Waiting to go to the nose. Needs to go to the nose. When's it happening? Four steps up. Not, not yet. Head dip. Nearly. Not quite. Pier. I've got to get out of here. So, uh, I'm talking with the, uh, the panic that Kevin's feeling. Or we should say panache. And wow. Oh. Gorgeous 10 there. Look at that board is just doing the work for him. He's skillful, but that board is training wheels. It is a planing machine and just able to cut through the water, catch any little bump, gets into the inside. What a great exchange between Kai Takayama and Kevin Skvarna. I think uh, Kai will be looking to drop that low score of a 3.83. And, uh, and well, Kevin's nose right on the outside. I think that could be one of his best scores. We're up there with it. So not sure if it'd be enough to eclipse that 5-5-1, considering now that uh, Kai may have pushed out his lead, but we'll soon see the scores to drop for both surfers. 4.23 for Kevin Skvarna, still trailing Kai Takayama. Can Kevin come back? We'll find out right after this break. Stay tuned. Vans duct tape invitation looking at Michael Takayama, father of Kaimana Takayama, and also the board builder for his son Kaimana out in the out in the water in the red jersey with a lead over Kevin Skvarna. Kevin Skvarna, there's Kai right there on the knee paddle back out. Yeah, he's got a six and a 4.9 to have that commanding score over Kevin Skvarna. Skvarna needing a 6.57. So at this point, Kevin riding right now needs the best wave of this heat. Powerful layback carve on the outside. Now needs to make the connection over some warbly water through this middle section. 
needs to get through the deep water gutter but separates the outside to the inside shore break does so handedly now looking for the tip he's not going to do it he's going to kick out right by the pilings avoiding disaster I'll tell you what kevin doesn't do anything by halves putting it all on the line and that layback carve um you know the judges haven't enjoyed have not enjoyed maneuvers that stop momentum but that one was like a stab where he leant back and the layback kind of is a stalling kind of snapping maneuver but it was required because he was heading towards that pier and he needed to redirect but uh, we'll get that in the replay is a little bit to unpack in that wave but kevin throwing it all on the line super critical turn but he needs to he needs a 6.57 needs to put it all down yeah he needs the highest single wave score of this heat to turn this heat and it's going to be interesting where the score goes as we watch it again with a, a wave with a lack of a nose ride widens those legs steps up a lot of bump on that face gets into parallel stance subtly these he's his feet side by side either side now shuffles back on the tail sets back up for this drop knee carve here and it's more like a little setup let's see what we got You know, uh, he had to it, give up on it too early, unfortunately, because of his line, don't you think? And he did. But I'll tell you what I really loved about that was the pull out, the flick out, the finish. You know, there's so many different words for it. But that is something that is so often underscored. And I'll give you another little bit of trivia there if you're not trivia out. Please, no. Okay. So you can't trivia out. In the 60s, you actually started with a perfect score, and it was up to you to keep that perfect score through the wave. Surf what was in front of you, surf elegant, critical part of the wave, um, and, and just perform and like, a, like a ballet performance, like a dancing performance. Surf the, to the song, you know, that the, the wave is your canvas. You keep drawing, but the canvas is a 10 point ride. Whatever the wave is, you need to give it that equal, uh, you know, equal style, and you have to perform it to the criteria. Jerry's last contest, I believe, was at Huntington Beach. Jerry Lopez, yes. one of the all-time stylists. And he came in, thought he surfed a tremendous heat, but obviously that was in the uh, uh, points per maneuver era. Mm. And he surfed beautiful. And he didn't understand. He thought he'd won the heat. He didn't make it through the heat. Love it. Love the trivia. Keep, keep them coming. Okay, 3.8 for Kevin. So that didn't change the situation. So... Like you said, the stop, of the lack of the stop of momentum going forward did affect that score. Here we go back to those five for Kevin. Hops over this bump. He's got another bump in front of him. He's building up on the inside, giving him a chance for a dynamic finish. Svarna oh. hot up there and unfortunately cannot execute that outstanding finish that he needed to attain that score on the swim back out. Gets the board, no problem. So uh, both surfers opting for, um, you know, bigger, wider boards in this heat. Kevin's on a diamond tail. Um, Kai's on his 9.7 uh, Perplexa, which is, I guess, sort of set the tone for a lot of the nose riders and inspired a lot of boards in the last couple of years. Uh, where in the next heat, we actually have uh, Tosh Tudor who's riding an Aussie-style longboard, a Thomas, yeah, a narrower Thomas. nose and yeah. a wide point back. But Justin's on a, I would say, more a more... Um, an East Coast style longboard, which is lends itself to nose riding, yeah. per se. So a lot of similarities between, I think, Kevin surfing and Justin's. Um, but, you know, right now Kai's got the lead, so he's holding. He's trying to drop a 4.9 and super attainable. Be very inter interesting to see if he does priority. Does he fancy Kevin getting that 6.57? Will he play the priority game uh, or will he try and better that 4.9? Well, we're down to two minutes and 20 seconds, and uh, we'll see what the play is, offense or defense, between Kai Takayama and Kevin Skvarna. Takayama's been surfing brilliantly, and uh, Dad's shape has been working well under his feet. The planing ab ab ability of that board has been absolutely incredible. Here's an example right here. Scratches into that wave utilizing that planing portion of the board. Look at him just glide. He's going to pick his bump, and uh, that one just got a little crossed up, couldn't stay with that bump cross shore. But now he's going to give Kevin an opportunity. Yeah, that was very interesting. He did fancy Kevin getting that uh, 6.57, but I would call that a mistake. Missed opportunity there for, for Kai. He could have held on to that priority, but you know he's got a lot of respect, obviously, for his competitor, but I hope this one doesn't come back to bite him. Well... The Pacific Ocean is going to have a say in this one because Kevin's going to need a good-sized set wave with a long wall 
for him to uh, acquire that score. It's a, it's a meaty score in the context of this heat, a 6.57. Yeah, it's going to have to be a wave of substance, Kaipo. It's going to have to have uh, a critical outside section. We do have some light waves on the way. Um, it's going to need to have an inside bowl as well, but uh, Kevin's ready for it. I actually saw him rubbing his hands together, you know, <laughs> kind of like a personal a let's go type of Let's go. Motion. Look at so he here called he goes. He's got it. Here he goes. Four steps up, and this is exactly what he needed. And he steps back from a 10 into a slashing turn. So he's on his way. A little loss of momentum here. Oh, no. And he's just, but with 40 seconds left, we'll see if there's anything else there. He knows it too. Oh. Head back and... He submitted the defeat there, Kaipo. He was on his way. He was on his way. He knows. In my gut, in my eye, in my heart, he was on his way. You could see him getting a little warbly through that middle section, but he had such a good start. And that wave came at a really good time for him. But it's going to be Kaimana Takayama who's going to slide his way out of this heat and into the semifinals. Yeah, that's... Um well, I'm glad that priority error didn't um, didn't make anything uh, negative there for Kai Takeyama, but I would say that, that was an upset. Kai taking the win over Kevin. Kevin coming off that South African duct tape win. Uh, but yeah, wow, Kai didn't get a run in Manly. Kai was the alternate along with myself, and he needed this event. Yeah, uh, he really did. And unfortunately, Kevin um, also not making. Congratulations up yeah. in the support squad, Dad Michael. Stevie Sawyer getting there. Getting a hug, Stevie Sawyer. So Artie Castro up there. And there's the final numbers for quarterfinal. Number two. We're going to continue on. Quarterfinal number three in the water after this short break. putting on the van surf camp so we are working not only with native like water but stoked mentoring and city surf project native like water works with tribes throughout the state of california and also internationally the group that we have here today are representing various nations sovereign nations from throughout southern california and throughout the nation so it's a, what we call an intertribal representation where we can all kind of get together and and, and participate it's native territory, and it's super cool knowing that WSL is acknowledging that. One of the things, our goals and our, the grant that we received is to help restructure that narrative and to have that inclusivity of our people within these coastal environments. We want to go from just surviving to thriving, and this surfing is, is an example of us thriving within our natural environments. Welcome back to the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. You are watching the Vans Duct Tape. This is where the best longboarders on this planet come together to surf these waves with flow, style, grace, creativity, and everything in between. I'm Chris Cote. This is Shannon Hughes, and Hello. we've got a final in the water. Wait a second. 
to quarterfinal with two names that everyone had on their list from day dot to potentially My mind take is out this event. Blown that these two have matched up. First off, that Tosh had to take out Harrison Roach in the last heat to then meet up with none other, none other than Justin Quintal. Yeah, this right here is a, an epic matchup, matchup, and this, depending on how it ends up, could be the passing of the torch or the continuing domination of this guy right here, Justin Quintal. Uh, Quintal doesn't fall, and he's really good on the nose. He's really good on the rail. He's kind of the complete package, uh, has won nearly every duct tape we've seen in the last few years. Didn't get the last one in South Africa. Did not. That went to Kevin Skavarna. Look at this little inside Whoa. section straight through the pier. That was cool. Standard J. Quinney. What, why is he so consistent? What makes him so dominant in these events? Man, he just knows how to read waves. I think that's so much of it. Obviously, he knows his equipment well, and he knows you know what the judges are looking for when it comes to dominating contests. But I think coming out of the East Coast, coming out of Florida, he surfs a lot of conditions like these. Windy, choppy, difficult to read, and he just absolutely knows how to figure it out, which is really impressive. I like this opening ride. Goes really flat through that section. I've kind of been questioning a little bit of the decision for the last couple heats to just go left. Kevin Skavarna, I think, maybe could have made it through had he changed up and maybe even redirected to the rights on some of those for Justin making it look really super easy. And he could be dropping in a solid score to start things off though. I think he will. I think the uh, kind of danger element of that little elevator drop as he went right through the pier, you know, will uh, will give him a pretty solid start there. Your 2019 World Longboard Champion, Justin Quintal, the most dominant surfer in duct tape history. Uh, he's won a million of them. And this is gonna be a, a good test for Justin because Tosh Tudor, has been turning heads and definitely ripping his way through this field. And he's doing it his own way. He's not changing anything. This is how he surfs every single day. He really is that good. And uh, it'll be really fun to see these two surfers, you know, go head to head. You know that Tosh has looked up to Justin. They've been around the world and back together. Um, so this will be a really fun one. And I guess, uh, and, I, and I will say Justin will not take young Tosh Tudor lightly knows how good he is up on the nose and how good he can read waves. So we're in for a treat here. 1932 to go. The first score comes through. It's all Quintal, a 6-6-7. Six, six, what a way to start. Tosh Tudor with just a .50, but plenty of time to go. Uh, I've watched Tosh Tudor just post himself up on the nose since he was about six years old. And he always had that signature trademark Tudor style. And it is uh, truly a pleasure to watch him surf, but now He's got to lean on the, the style, the creativity, the flow, and also the competitiveness, which we know he has. I mean, he surfs some of the, uh, some waves that are so hard to, to catch in terms of the crowd. So it's a different kind of competitive surfing. You know, a lot of places that he uh, chooses to surf, like Pipeline on the North Shore of Oahu, uh, you have to have a lot of competitive know-how to even catch a wave in a free surf. So Tosh might be a little more fiery than we give him credit for. Yeah, you got to be able to get yourself through a lineup like that. It takes a, a certain personality to be able to handle it and to come in still with a smile on your face, as well as able to bag some of the best waves that come through um, in free sessions out there at somewhere like Pipe. Even just thinking of, I mean, I remember being a kid and growing up, and as he was kind of growing up underneath me, surfing out at Cardiff. Cardiff Reef is mayhem. Oh, yeah. There are so many people. I mean, that's your home hometown of all levels so many people of all being, levels that is like polite. if you can handle paddling out at cardiff no matter what the conditions are like and honing some of your skills in a place like that you're going to be pretty good dealing with a competitive nature in a lot of other places in life for sure 1750 on the clock for now our quarterfinals will wrap up after the next heat. We'll see Kaniela Stewart and Declan Whiten, but we've got some time before we get there. Uh, whoever wins this heat is going to be uh, a front runner. I mean, that's how tough this heat really is. So 17.34 on the clock. Surfers waiting for the next set to roll through. Gives us a chance to catch up with Kaniela Stewart standing by with Louisa Florence.
Kai, I just saw the sweetest thing between you and your dad. What's yeah. behind this battle between you and Kevin that we all want to know? Um, I grew up surfing with Kevin since forever. We both started competing at the same time. Uh, we entered the Oceanside Longboard Club together, the coalitions. That's not heat number one, Kaimana versus Kevin. That was like heat 500, I swear. We've done WSAs, we've done, you know, all these international events, we've done duct tapes. I've seen his face in the heat with me more than anybody else on this planet. And Kevin and I are really, really good friends. We grew up together. And to share a heat out there with him, you know, I'm stoked. He, he got me years back, uh, the last man on man we surfed. I mean, we were both dropping nines at Oceanside in this North American contest, and he he got the better of me. But today I came back a little bit. And it's, it's unfortunate that obviously it's picking and choosing. It's not too uh, equal opportunity <laughs> out there, but I'm just stoked. And I'm really stoked to share the water with Kevin because he works way harder than I do. You, you know, when it comes to getting ready for stuff like this, he's always in the water, but I'm, I'm stoked. <laughs> you deserved it too. Go regroup. Yeah? For sure. Yeah. yeah. I'm on till tomorrow. So Amazing. I, I go regroup, go rest, <laughs> and you see you on the semifinals. Absolutely. Oh, that's so cool. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Kaimana Takiyama with a win there over Kevin Svarna. Uh, that was a feel good heat. You know, best friends for a long time. Uh, you know, like you said right there, they've been going back and forth for a long time. And, you know, all smiles at the end of the day. Of course, both of them wanted to make it through to the semifinals. But, hey, this is where things get a little cutthroat. Even in the loving world of longboarding, things, uh, you got to have a winner. You got to have a winner. Someone advancing through, someone getting knocked out. I was down watching that heat unfold in the athletes area alongside of a couple of Californian surfers, all that have grown up, kind of raised up surfing together. Uh, David Argonda goes by Veed. He, he, the, some of those in the surfing world will know him. He's an incredibly good uh, longboarder who's down here cheering on some of the pack. Has competed at this level for a long time. Rachel Tilly, uh, a couple of others. Sally Cohn was down there. And they were saying that they remember specifically with Veed and Rachel being here in Huntington. Solid day when they were all Grom still surfing in the junior divisions of those WSA and USA national events. And seeing a heat between Kevin and Kai where they started out both with sevens on the scoreboard, next dropped eights, and then they both got into the nine point range. And it was like inching each other higher wave after wave. One got a 9.23, one then got a 9.5, next one got a 9.72, and it just kept going higher and higher. Um, I can't remember who, I don't think they even remembered who took out the win, but it was just one of those moments between those two surfers where they were really surfing to their best and pushing each other to the best. And there's so many of those coming out of this kind of classic California scene who have been able to rise themselves up to being some of the best lumbers in the world because they all grew up competing against each other and pushing the limits. Talk about good times, good friends, good competition. The only thing uh, more fun than beating your worst enemy is beating your best friend. That just means you get to brag about it until the next time. So all in good fun down here at the event. Duct tape, of course, there are points, prize money, pride on the line. And as we get now into the... Uh, business end of this event trying to stack our semifinals we got two heats left Tosh Tudor going up against Justin Quintal right now Quintal in the lead Tosh needs a 6-1-8 quarterfinal four has your current two number three surfers in the world and yeah, that right there that's for a big chunk of points whoever gets the edge will get the top spot on the leaderboard for the year-end rankings going into Malibu yeah, this is huge. We also didn't see Justin or Tosh compete in the first event in Sydney. For Tosh, he's here as a wild card. Justin is here off of his result from last year. So he's already got a spot into the finishing event. But Tosh is going to have to really make a statement here. Maybe with a win, he gets the call up to be able to surf at Malibu and compete for a world title. That would make a lot of sense if he already had 5,000 points behind him. He'd be right there in that race alongside of Harrison Roach. Justin Quintal obviously needing to get some good results to really be in that conversation heading into Malibu as well. I'll be curious to see if he decides to compete there. Since winning his world title, which was his first year ever competing on the WSL World Tour in 2019, he won it the first year. And for reasons like this, just perfectly perched on the nose for that opening section, cuts through into the next, and that board just playing really, really well. We'll see if he continues to just favor that. Nope, he's gonna go for that redirect. 
which is good. We want to see a little bit of that that change up in his direction and then redirects into that finish. He's not quite going to land it. That was going to be a hard one to come out of. Tosh Tudor now up and riding. Rare mistake for Justin Quintal. I haven't seen that very often. Tosh Tudor, the wave, uh, let him down a little bit. Try to fight for the fight for the nose, but had to opt out. So just another point nine three. Add that to the point five. Tosh Tudor uh, off to a little bit of a slow start, but still plenty of time to go. Justin Quintal, I think that's going to be a decent wave, a decent score, but it's not going to eclipse the six six seven. So with 11.30 on the clock, time is flying by. This heat on paper set to be a stunner. So far, a bit slow, but that will all change after these brief messages. We'll be right back with more Vans duct tape. Welcome back to the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. We have a big announcement. It is Vans and Hydroflask's first collaboration. I brought Dane and Tanner Godowskis here to help me with the announcement. This is a limited edition, special edition, featuring some key features. We got the boot on the bottom with the Vans waffle sole. We have the checkerboard strap, Vans signature check checkerboard strap. This is available September 1st. Vans.com, Hydroflask.com, and in Vans retail stores. What do you think, guys? Loving it. It's going to be awesome, man. We're stoked on it. Get some. It's limited edition. You want it. Thank you, Kaipo. That was cool. Usually those Godowskis brothers are so negative, but they looked happy right there. I know. They really struggled to just bring <laughs> the sunshine, you know? Totally joking right JK. there some of the most JK, positive JK. people on the planet that is a very cool you know it's not often that you get to say wow that's a cool water bottle but this one right here this hydro flask is awesome it's take, got uh it's accessorized take it to the skate park afterward with that waffle on the bottom exactly 7:45 to go this was during the break tosh tudor getting involved in this heat this wave was a 4.5 Getting involved, that's a good way to start off. He uh, just had a, a couple of throwaway, less than one points coming into it. Nice nose ride to start off. And then let's see what he gets done on the inside section and why it didn't jump above that five point range. 
Nice clean footwork, connects with it again, and then loses control. So that'll go incomplete on that finishing maneuver. I think the judges would have liked it and, and, and likened it somewhere not close quite to that 6.67 of Justin, but slightly higher had he been able to finish. Um, that outside section was really good, but we're also looking for those bully sections through the inside. Sometimes it's a little hard too, to see from this uh, that camera angle, just looking at it from behind rather than that sort of straight on or when they're coming at you. But he's back in this heat officially because he wasn't before that wave. Yeah, and uh, of course, Justin Quintal does not make it easy for anyone he's going up against. He's now dropped his second score, that 483. So uh, with the 667 and 483, Quintal in the lead. And he's always, he always seems to be a guy that just puts together the perfect heat at the right time. This is the quarterfinals, so we're looking for our next semifinalist to come from this one. Semi-final one and two will be set in about 30 minutes. So we will have our draw, and of course we will keep you posted as to when the semifinals will happen. Deep paddle there for Justin Quintal, straight to the nose, weightless, hood ornament style, straight to that carve. And here's where uh, Quinny cruises, makes the decision, fades back left. More cross-stepping, toes over the tip, through the pier. Some action right there in the dark side of the pier. Gets right through it. Classic approach, classic Justin Quintal. He does it every single time. Finishes off, he's still going. He just did a drop knee cutback as well as a little hang five on the inside section to kick off right where the stingrays hang out on the north side of the pier. That's the only time you can shuffle in this event. Please and As please do because the water. I tell you they're all over Southern California, especially in this Huntington region, and they hurt really bad. It's the worst. It's not very nice. Yeah. It's definitely the worst thing ever. It's a greatest fear every time I hit the lineup. Um, having a look at that last wave of Justin, I really like it. I think that he's just going to make it harder and harder for Tosh at this stage. And Tosh, I got to give him credit. There hasn't been that many waves that came through, so the start of the heat. Really fast footwork up to the nose. Nice perched on nose ride to start things off. Had a lot of that kind of levitation coming out of it as well. And then just patient here, finds that trim, that trim line, and then back into the nose ride once again through that inside section. This is where he goes to shoot the pier after tapping the nose one more time just because his footwork is lightning fast and then goes for that drop knee cut back in a moment. And one more nose ride as he hits it into the sand. He also, that outside section, really good nose ride, connected with a really good engagement of the rail. That was a great turn. Also, it kept that flow and momentum moving forward. He didn't kind of put the brakes on in any way, which is why he's just found the highest score of the heat. That's what he does. Look at his career heat win percentage, 80.49. That's got to be one of the highest of all time. He's got one world title already. Three event wins in his career. This is a World Surf League competition when it comes to duct tape competition. He's right, got ten? nine. Nine? Nine. Officially nine. This could be his tenth. Should he take the win? Yeah. He's basically the Kelly Slater of the duct tapes. You want to look at it that way? Believe it. I believe it. Of those three event wins that we just saw from his career deep stats, that was all from the 2019 season when he won the world title. Entered his first ever uh, WSL event. Won the Nusa Longboard Open, then won the Galicia Longboard Classic in Spain, and then a few events later came back and won the world title, which was amazing. So incredibly strong performances coming through from Justin in his very shortly lived time uh, in, in the WSL jersey outside of duct tape. 3.14 to go, that makes Tosh Tudor's job that much more difficult. He needs a 9.67, and right there he had priority. Deep paddle for it. So we'll see what our priority judges decide to do there. Yeah, this and is a bit switches. of a bummer. Like, Tosh had such a good heat against Harry. He had a lot of really good waves. On that one, though, Justin uses priority, gets that perfect section. Great pocket for that opening nose ride. Again, carves back to set up in front of our cameraman. And now has that backwashy section that we've been seeing all day from those lefts. But again, finds that pocket and accelerates out of the nose ride, which is super impressive. Does a little S-turn, runs back to the nose again. Somehow maintains control. 
And that was really good competitive surfing from Justin. Used priority over Tosh. Tosh lost his priority on that last paddle, like you called out, Cote. And that could have been the score that he was looking for if Justin had let him go. Yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, I'm sure how a lot of people thought this, this was going to go, just because of how dominant Justin Quintal has always been. But Tosh Tudor, an amazing young surfer. And right there, I mean, that is iconic. <laughs> for To have an iconic style at such a young age, that's saying a lot. Tosh is just... He's so fun to watch, and you know he has this this presence about him that you know just makes him uh, a standout in any in any situation from big barreling lefts, long rights, whatever you got. Tosh Tudor is going to shine, and he does it the right way with positivity and just he's just an awesome kid. Here's another look at this last one of Justin. That was such a nice nose ride to start off with. And then look at how much power he has, but he keeps that flow moving forward. It's that perfect combination of style and flow while adding in that powerful element of engaging the rail in the right section of the wave. It's exactly what the judges are looking for and what they love about Justin surfing. Like heat after heat, they just eat it up. And I think this is why. And I mean, I'll guarantee you there's so many of the surfers in the draw, whether they're still in or knocked out, they're here watching because they wanted to see if Justin Quintal would get himself another excellent score. And he's done it with a nine point ride. And 58 seconds left with the highest Sing the highest heat total of the duct tape, the highest heat total of the Challenger Series, the highest heat total, period. Justin Quintal, 16.50. Making it look all too easy. And it's safe to say he will be a semifinalist and most likely a finalist. He is that good and that consistent. That was also, so he got a nine. Tosh was chasing just over a nine, I believe, before that score dropped. Now he's in a combination situation. But Justin's use of priority to go on that wave instead of letting Tosh meant that he kept Tosh off a wave with excellent scoring potential. Yeah, he knows. It's almost like you wish he wasn't so likable. I know. Everyone Both loves Justin us. Quintal and he wins everything and they, they, you know, there's nothing they can say about it because he's such a nice dude. Yeah, he's just wonderful to have around. That's great. That's good camaraderie as well. 17-year-old Tosh Tudor has a huge future ahead of him in the world longboard scene. Yeah, no doubt. Big ups to Tosh Tudor. Great showing here at the Vans Duct Tape, part of the Vans US Open of surfing. But it was Justin Quintal getting that high number to get through. Special guest coming in next. Can't wait for this conversation. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Vans Duct Tape, part of the Vans US Open of surfing. We're live from the south side of the Huntington Beach Pier, and we're very excited to be joined by the one and only Alex Nost. Welcome to the Huntington Beach Pier, my guy. Uh, a lot of hot action, and uh, I just never thought I'd be on the webcast like this. Welcome. So. Yeah, it feels good. It's a pleasure to be here with you for the very first time. 
It's comfy, actually. It's oh, less pressure, it's less pressure, it's pressure than out here. All right, here we go. Carnella Stewart. Rocking a leash. That's hardcore. I've never seen him wear a leash. But he probably wants to win. Yeah. Things have escalated a little oh, bit, oh. competitively speaking, out here. <laughs> Kani Tsunami, big start. This way of providing from beginning to end. Nearly goes down on the inside, makes it all the way through. So Alex Nost coming at us all the way from Blackies. Yep. Were you out there this morning? Coast Mesa. Uh, no, I wasn't. I'm kind of like on the injured list right now. But uh, so I just like go to physical therapy. And then we put you That's to work nice here. That's kind of nice Yeah. Um, wow. You know, I'm missing out on the action, but it's pretty cool to watch, actually. Like, that last heat, Justin Quintal, he's, he's got his competitive teeth, you know. He's really trained at this. He's kicked my butt quite a few <laughs> times. So it's cool to see him advance. Uh, he's, he's a groovy guy. Um, and uh, Kynell's the same way. You know, they're like, they're chomping at it. They want to win, you know, which is uh, a lot of longboarders kind of lackadaisical, you know. Uh, don't really have that competitive drive because you catch so many waves on a longboard, you don't really, yeah. you're on a shortboard, you know, you're like really, you want it. Uh, longboard, you catch so many waves, it's kind of like. If they calm yourself down every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> but Kynella and uh, Justin, they're hardcore, man. They'll, they paddle fast, they catch tons of waves. We're trying to field our semi-finalists, Daniela Stewart, a.k.a. Connie Tsunami. Nicely done there. What do you think of the boards we're seeing? We're seeing a pretty, kind of a mixed bag of surfboards in uh, this particular event with the World Surf League crew meeting up with the duct tape crew. Yeah, uh, you know, I, it's pretty funny. I remember being a little kid and seeing all the high-performance boards out here, and Joel was kind of the only guy riding uh, traditional equipment. Uh, and most people are on single fins, but uh, I feel like contemporary longboard design's kind of really gone in like an obtuse direction. You know, there's this wide tail stuff that you'll really, really wide tail stuff. Super wide tail, like up to like 17 inches, huh? Yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's insane. Uh, whereas maybe that's not so ideal for Huntington. You know, I mean, I grew up down the street. But uh, I remember serving here, and it, it's got like a lot of lumps in it. So uh, you see like this, a lot of the wide tails work really good at clean point break surf. But uh, I kind of trip out on how well they can surf them out here, to be honest. Yeah, I've blown away on nearly every single wave ridden. 1958 to go, Kaniala Stewart with a 5.67 in the lead. That gives us a chance to come up against one of the most likable dominators in longboarding, Justin Quintal coming through with a victory over Tosh Titter, standing by now with Louisa Florence. Yeah, likable dominators and peer master cruiser. Like it just make us so nervous on those on those waves. How how is it working for you out there? Yeah, I just hope that left keeps working into the pier. I love that little wave and watch grew up watching Joel surfing, David Nueva before him. And uh -huh. Yeah, I think a lot of people have made that their little zone that they like. I was talking to Tosh before this heat, and he was so nervous. Did you guys had a chance to chat before or in the water? How was that experience for you with him over there? Yeah, we were both kind of joking around before, and I would have been just as stoked and proud to see him win that heat, but I was really nervous as well because, you know, I try to mentor him a little bit, and we hang out all the time. We're really good friends, and, um, yeah, I think we're always, like, friendly competitive with each other and like that heat meant a lot to both of us I think. But Anything special on your sleeve for the next round? Um, No, just try to have fun and keep the crowd cheering, you know, put on a show. Amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank Good you. luck. Appreciate it. Yeah. Class act. Gotta love Justin Quintal. What a cool guy, huh? So just, nice. Yeah, I would have liked Tosh to win, but I kind of just had to, like, kick his butt. <laughs> Great sentiment uh, right there. Yeah, he's <laughs> cool. He's such a cool guy. Well, with uh, Declan Winton waiting for scores, uh, I, I can't hang out with Alex without uh, appreciating the musical stylings. As you see uh, Declan Winton right here. Oh. Whoa. Oh, my God. There's a lot happening. A lot to unpack on this wave. Look at these lumps and bumps coming up the face. He's 
kind of having to battle this thing from the get-go. It looks really challenging now, too, with that wind that's picked up. There's not as many of those clean sections, and he falls on the finish there, but I think he was just trying uh. to work out, like, how he could find the nose. Connie's been kind of in some rhythm. His first score was a 5-6-7. We'll see how this one comes through. Found that nose right at the start, and you can just tell how bumpy it is, huh? It's, it's, it's insanely choppy. There's the backwash, there's the wind chop, and when you got that big of a board, and uh, some of them aren't that aren't, aren't that heavy, so they're not really cutting through the chop. Uh, you know, these guys probably want to try to maneuver their boards. Uh, looks like Declan's board looks pretty light, so uh, timing's going to be everything for him uh, with that chop. But he's, is he from Manly? So Declan's from Manly, Declan Whiten. He just finished uh, with a semifinal, him and yeah. Connie, semifinals at the first event, which was really good. Um, so he's kind of used to surfing yeah, like beaches. Pretty similar wave, actually. Yeah. Manly, and as long as. Uh, Aside from that gutter, doesn't yeah. really exist at Manly, um, but you still do get that kind of like harsh outside section. But it tends to have more of that sand mm. bar that kind of not like a full sandbar on the outside, but it kind of has those little strips of sand where you can get those those real runners, which yeah, is really yeah, nice. Yeah. Similar energy on the takeoff. I yeah. In my, I don't know. Have you spent much time there? Yeah. Totally. Actually, that's the first wave I ever surfed in Australia. Really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I was like 12 or something. I remember being like, I came all the way here for this. <laughs> Yo, this is yeah. Australia. It's exactly. Fun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Could have driven no, five minutes north. No, it was, it was cool. Um, so what do you guys think? Who, who do you think's got it? Ooh, I mean, Kaniela Stewart. He's deadly. Yeah, he's just been putting together really just nice heat, beginning to end, not a lot of mistakes, and so fluid. Um, I don't know, the board looks really nice under his feet. Declan, you know, I would say he's kind of the more uh, modern approach, you know? Yeah. You, you can just tell a little bit more, like, electricity. That's almost retro now. Right? The, like, That's high performance 90 almost, style. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he is, he, he's he's going towards the line, but he, he knows when to pull it back. You know, he he hasn't done any airs yet, and no that'd top be, hops. That'd so. be crazy. Yeah, it would be wild. Uh, Alex, while we have a little bit of a lull, I got to ask you, 70s two bride. I've been a fan of every single musical project you've had. So uh, as the 70s two bride maestro. Oh yeah, I started a new group with my bud, CP and uh, Matt. Uh, my friend CP's in uh, this band called Semi Trucks and Matt Korea is in Dalaws. So we just kind of, during the downtime of COVID, you know, a lot of bands aren't touring or whatever. Uh, yeah, we just kind of started this makeshift fun group. With, and uh, yeah, we haven't put anything out yet, but we got a tour coming up in October. So with be Babe sure Rainbow? to check us out. <laughs> Touring with Babe Rainbow We're now. Yeah. Check yeah. out. Tickets available. Uh, I just followed Ticketmaster. you. I followed you on Instagram. Did you? Oh, yeah, I followed everything you've done. How many I got? 19? We're getting there. We're, 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 we're growing. 300. Uh, Alex Nos became my musical hero when he started a band with Kim Gordon. Uh, he just kind of, uh, I've been a fan of all the all the bands. That one, I mean, yeah. a band with Kim Gordon, come, like, the pinnacle right there. Yeah, throw your guitar at the wall. <laughs> Get that thing out of the way. Chris it's Cote, Shannon Hughes, Alex Nost in the booth, 1420 to go. We're watching Duct Tape. How many Duct Tape Invitationals have you been in? I think I was at every single one of them until I broke my leg. Uh, and so I've sat the last, I'm on timeout <laughs> past two. But, you know, I'm kind of like, it's actually been really nice because uh, I tune in and watch, which is, which is, I mean, what we're doing here right now. But um, before he didn't, you know? Yeah. I'm just like, oh my gosh, look at this. This guy's getting so good. No wonder he's going to win. Oh, that guy's gone for sure. So. I, I kind of dig it. I like watching it. Um, especially I have so many friends that have, when I met, were so young, and now watching them come into like the fruition of just kicking serious butt, you know? Like, <laughs> well, like I, I, veterans I, I mean, yeah, Justin Quintal was a wild card, like way back in Virginia Beach, and it was just some local kid, you know, everyone, it was this guy. He just he smokes everyone. He kicked everyone's butt. Did he win that event, yeah, that first event. one that he entered? I was like, who's this guy? And he's like, I'm this guy, Whoa. right there. So I, I just dig it. I like watching it, and uh, it's super cool. I like seeing Tosh, and, uh, and same thing with Connie. You know, I never even knew the guy, and I knew he's just this guy fro from Hawaii, and he kind of came on and just started kicking everyone's butt too. And 
I like that quick turnaround in, in the longboard world. There's always somebody new that you kind of never hear about because it's not necessarily such a spotlight on like longboarding. So yeah, the publicity of, doesn't exist as much. They just come out of nowhere, and you're like, what? I can't believe this is even happening. The new new kids, uh, and same thing with the women, too, you know what I mean? How, how incredible some of the women longboarders are. That yeah. I I don't even know how they blossom this fast. Like to, It's the point where you don't even recognize them, and the next time you see them, they're blowing your mind. But one one year away, you know? Yeah, it's super cool. fun. Super fun to see it. I think... Alex, you would like the uh, new judging criteria that was created, you know, for this event, uh, not specifically, but it's really kind of coming into focus here. You know, you think of duct tape rules originally, and those are, you know, shared waves. You can run into your friend, you can slap them on the wave, whatever you want to do. That's all fair game. So we've implemented some of those rules, but we're also leaning heavily on traditional longboarding and we're leaning on grace, style, flow. It's all there. We'll talk more about that after this quick break. We'll be back. I know it's in the lead for right now. There. Don't go anywhere. More duct tape action coming right up. Yeah. We are hanging out at the 805 deck, the perfect spot to watch all the surfers in action today. And coming up right after this final quarterfinals heat, we have a really special event coming your way. It is the paddle race. It's a tradition that goes back to the 80s and 90s for clubs around the entire world. The last time it ran in a duct tape invitational, though, 2019. So here's how it works. All the surfers go from the sand to the buoy and back again. And I've talked to surfers all day. It gets gnarly out there, but it makes sense because first man, first woman to finish, each of them get a thousand dollars. So we've got that coming up next. And then of course, stick around because we have the 805 post show right after that. Wow. Excited to see a uh, paddle racing on classic longboards come back into back into fashion here. That buoy looks really far out there. And with all these uh, 805 flying embers decks all over the place, I'm wondering if uh, these surfers stayed away from happy hour and they're gonna put on their athlete hats, paddle their brains out. Oh. This is during the break, Connie Ellis Stewart. Yeah, that was a really nice nose ride to start. And then just that good use of variety. We wanna see him keeping that flow that creativity as he comes through to the inside. Nice use of the rail, nice redirect, and no downtime either. He's just staying busy, but in a really smooth way. That was a good looking wave. That was a pretty insane wave. Actually, if you think about, if you surf these waves, how, how hard it is to sort of win, to stay busy, how it goes from like a power surge of energy to complete flat. I mean, he, he was walking up and down the board all the time and kind of got a lot of acceleration on that drop knee cutback, which is, when you're on a nine foot plus board, when you have that much chop in front of you, it's kind of hard to do. I don't know, it's pretty, pretty bizarre how he, he's so comfortable in <laughs> conditions coming from 
serve in the South Shore where it's always so groomed. I don't know. Makes it look really easy. He's a strong guy, which, what, which means he might <laughs> take out the paddle race. There you go. And one of the things that's in our uh, judging criteria is use of board. Alex, you've always been a master with footwork and a master of, uh, you know, shortboard, longboard, bonds, or whatever you're riding, you seem to be able to use the whole board kind of with ease. Uh, it's not as easy as it looks, right? Especially, you're, you know, you're looking at a guy like Kaniela Stewart, who uh, just looks like he's on the sidewalk. He looks so comfortable on his board. So what, how is the uh, use of board, you know, how is that such a difficult thing to do and to make it look good without making it look too uh, just erratic? I think what comes into play is just being a good surfer and uh, understanding how to use every inch of your board, you know. Uh, you can watch someone like Mason Ho ride a shortboard, and he uses every inch of his board, or Tom Curran. Same thing goes with longboarding, and you've got so much real estate to kind of navigate, and the best people, you know, they know how to use every, every square inch uh, to engage that rail, to utilize the depth of the fin, and uh, Connie's kind of one of those guys, you know. You, you can kind of tell just the way someone paddles into a wave almost, you know, with confidence and... Uh, whether it's longboarding or shortboarding. Here's Declan now, straight up to the nose, carving it back, dropping the back knee. And Declan's not wearing a leash. Yeah, Declan definitely like wants to be viewed as a good traditional longboarder. He does, huh? He really wants to, and he's really good at that. I think coming out of some of those regions in the world, and it was the same thing coming out of California, but in those kind of younger years for those surfers, I feel like you probably know this really well, Alex, that are in their early 20s, when they graduated into the longboard world, especially if they were a hungry competitor, they saw two plus one boards being ridden all the time, a lot of kind of high pro boards. They've now made that tradition, especially on this stage, into that more traditional conversation. And so maybe some boards that they were kind of learning how to ride when they were younger were pretty different than something that they're currently riding right now. I think Declan's been a surfer that's been able to kind of take that into, into his repertoire with a lot of grace. Um, I really like the use of those traditional maneuvers. Like, he's obviously a great nose rider, but his drop knee cutback is really good. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I saw him do that. Uh, yeah, I don't really know the guy personally, but I mean, he's made it this far. He's kind of, he's going for it. And Manly's a tricky wave. So if he can master that, he can, can deal with the chop here in Huntington for sure. Yeah, I really like that outside section and then kind of finds that little trim line right in that top third of his board, that front third, finds another hang five and then pedals back really well. That's also an adjustment, Cote, to what we saw in the last seat that we saw Declan in, where he was going into those finishing sections just with a little bit more aggression, right? We saw it a couple waves. This one, he's kind of made some adjustments. I feel like he's probably watched a little bit. He's paid attention to some other surfers and where some of those scores are going. And he's looking for more of those in-section finishes that just look a little bit softer. Yeah, I think he got the note. Just keep it chill. Yeah. So you don't have to go vertical. You can do your nice power turns, but just don't get too erratic. Yeah, it's, it's hard. Yeah, it's, if you're going backside and trying to like hit the lip with that backwash coming off and the chop, you know, see, you see the best guys They'll fall every time. So, yeah, it's kind of cool. Keeping it chill, grab a nose ride, straighten out. I saw Harrison kind of even doing that. Where Harrison's kind of a guy that will go for broke and, and, and hit that end section. I noticed today when I was watching, he was opting to straighten out just so he can complete the ride. And it's it's almost tough enough straightening out right there, I feel like. It's so hard sometimes, huh? like pedaling back and making sure you actually get that weight on that, that tail early enough. Yeah. Especially yeah. when it's so sucky. And we see we saw it on the uh, you know in the Challenger series. These, these oh. are like uphill landings. That's a pretty nice look. Carve. He's getting. Oh, he wants it. Uh oh. Come on. He's gonna tickle the tip. Oh. Oh. Just a touch. He checked his watch. Do you see that? That was a that's a rarity. Uh, tip tickle watch check. <laughs> Dude, it's that's brand hardcore. New. That's brand new. Nobody's doing that. Three twenty six uh now. Kaniela Stewart still in the lead. Declan Whiten, uh, the numbers are kind of telling a different story. It feels like this is a tight heat, but he needs an 807. So uh, it's a little bit looser than I thought it was when I looked over the scores. But he's still putting in, putting in a lot of effort and making it a match. Yeah. yeah. 
Sorry? I even thought, kind of looking at this matchup heading into it, that it would be a little bit more even, that we'd really have a tight run for it. But Connie just finding a couple of those waves. And like you said, he's able to just keep that trim point through waves with like that full dead section in between, totally. which is so difficult. Yeah, he's like hanging 10 through it. I, yeah, he's, I mean, I don't know. I almost think Connie's going to get even a higher score before this heat's over. He's just, he's hungry. He's, he's, he's radical, right? I think you don't want him out the back with priority and two minutes left. He's just going to, he's going to probably do something wild because he's, he's looking at the other guys in the other heats, you know? He wants to get a better score than Justin Quintal because he's, he's mentally preparing himself for the final. Probably tired of hearing Justin Quintal's name so many times in the it's like, I can't the take it spot. in. No. no, he County hasn't been around. I mean, how old's Connie? I don't know. He's tall, but he's in his early twenties. Yeah, he's like he's a baby. He's super tall. Yeah. <laughs> Plus the cool. fro adds a couple inches. Yeah, he's gonna be kicking butt for a long time here. I, he's too confident and he kind of you know he can surf one to. 10 foot waves. I've seen him. He's pretty gnarly. He'll charge pipeline. Yeah, he's a cool guy. He'll rip bowls. Oh, here we go. Declan, he wants it. Hanging 10. Oh, wiggling. Ooh. That was a pretty good 10. A couple snaps. He's looking for the points. He's throwing some spray. What has he got? What do you think he's going to get on that one? Ooh. He's not going to get the eight. He's not, is six. he? Six. Nah, he's not going to get the eight. He's going to get at least a six, is what I would guess. That was a really good, like, bit of combination surfing. He wanted it. That wave was just kind of short. Th those rights are, you know, unfortunately, that when there's south swell and this west wind going into it, they're just hard to surf, and they're shorter than the long lefts. But he kind of made, made the most of it, that dude. Like a, where, where he picked to do his turns, you know, kind of rebounding off the, like the chunks coming up the wave. Not easy to do on a nine foot plus surfboard. Well, 53 seconds left. Uh, Declan Whiten would need a 7.45 now. That last wave comes through a 5.73, so a great score, but you look over what uh, Connie Tsunami's hanging on to, a 7.5 and a 5.67, still in the lead. We'll see if there's time for one more look oh, from Declan. Oh no. I wanted to see some more action before the seat was over, just because it's exciting to watch longboarding and kind of junk surf, you know? Yeah, these are like, they could really make the most as, of it. as longboard waves, but they're ripping. Yeah, you can make the most of it. Al, thanks so much for joining us. I know uh, you yeah. got a busy schedule coming up on tour with 70s Tube Ride along with Babe Rainbow. Check out at 70s Tube Ride on the gram. I will do all <laughs> the promoting for Alex. Yeah, yeah, well, you <laughs> want a job, dude. That's, he's pretty good. Yeah, you got to see this band. It's a, it's a super group. I'm going to go yeah. ahead and throw it out there. It's a super group. So check them out. Uh, congrats to Connie Ellis Connie, Stewart. Connie, yeah. Speaking of super group, we've got a super group of semifinalists now. That was quarterfinal heat number four. So our semifinals are stacked and stocked with talent and uh well we're gonna have to uh get alex suited up we're sending you out for the paddle race uh you have three 30 seconds to get ready now alex uh Run. we're all gonna be going to water's edge to watch this spectacle unfold this is gonna be great stay tuned the epic paddle race coming up next
2022 Vans Duct Tape Invitational. We have a very special treat for you right now. It is the paddle race. The surfers lined up behind me. They have to go from the sand to the buoy and back. $1,000 on the line for the fastest man, the fastest woman. I'm with Kira Seal, who is the Senior Managing Director of the Longboard Tour. And Kira, you know a thing or two about these paddle races. Tell me how gnarly they can get. Well, there's no gentleman rule. Uh, <laughs> rules are out the door now. They can push, they can pull, anything can happen. I did one in Japan and I was in the lead and then all of a sudden I got my leg pulled and pushed and elbowed and I was last. So you never know who's going to win. <laughs> there's a lot of strategy, probably going to be a lot of carnage, and it's guys. About to start. And it's about to start. We'll send it back to you. Oh my goodness. Here it goes. This is the paddle race out in the water, and this is a tradition of the duct tape classic uh, Kuiper Girl back in the booth with Michelle Michael <laughs> Mitchell Salazar as well as Whoa. Alex Nose. Oh my gosh, look at the sneaky vision right now. The, yeah, we got What's sneaky vision. Don't even look at the sneaky vision one. <laughs> okay, so here here we got the paddle race. The girls are up first. Uh, and it's gloves off, like it's on. Oh wait, are these the guys first? No, guys no, and girls. At the same time. It's on like popcorn right now, Alex. We got Tully White in the green, Sophia Culhane in the red, Jasmine is in the blue, Rachel Tilly in the white, Mason Schremer is in the blue, another blue, Kalis Kaleopaa, Takle uh, Noise in the green, Kyoki's in the white, oh, Kevin Skvarno's in the white. Look how heated it's getting. It's getting heated. Declan wants it. Who's that in the orange? Uh, Taoka Inoue. Oh, he wants it even more. All right, let's start hedging our guesses on who's going to huh. take this one. A couple of different lines. I didn't really like that approach next to the pier. I feel like you got to start a little bit south and go with the current. It's I just, like that. Well, it's just way flatter over there too. There's not as many waves breaking. But you never know. People do the the, the darnest things in these. Uh, I've seen people trip each other running up the beach and, and like go straight in for the win. Like it's gloves off. You can grab, huh? You can grab. Grabbing is, is within the rule book, oh, isn't yeah. it, Alex? Oh yeah, cutting off, grabbing, tripping, kicking, throwing everything. What yeah. about what about like biting? I think I've seen a couple people bite each other actually. Yeah. Once. Hey, no. it's a thousand dollars for the fastest yeah. man. It's a thousand dollars for the fastest winning. I saw women. It. You yeah. saw somebody bite somebody else? Yeah, I saw Tosh Tudor. Come up behind Canella and 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 bite his big toe. It was yeah. hardcore. Of course. <laughs> yeah, you might see a good bite. Hey, it's you know what, endless. Mitchell Salazar, for a thousand bucks, I'd bite you for <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, I, you wouldn't. He, yeah, I, no, you would not. Any, but would hey. you bite his toe? Uh, Let's see after a things. shower for sure, not yeah. after a day. You're, germ you're a germaphobe, big time. I said. So. After what about a these bad boys? Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> show, show them again, <laughs> Alex. You're, Too you're many glass shops. So, <laughs> yeah, no good. Uh, Alex, your number's 2K. Hey, you can call me anything you want, but my name's Kaipo. This is Mitchell Salazar. This is Alex Nose, and you're watching the paddle race here at the Duck Tape. Invitational. Okay, sir. They're almost at the buoy right now, and ooh, look at that. The oh, look at it. Oh, see, they're hugging it. It's tight, and you know what? We're on, That's we're Skavarna. On. I think Skavarna's in the lead yeah, right there, right? Well, look at. I hope so. He lost out, and he's a strong dude. He wants it. He's like. He's a lifeguard too. Yeah. He, and did you guys know this about Kevin? Tell us. Do you know? What? what? I think he's kneeboard world champion. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I actually judged that event. He won. Uh, it's actually right here when he won. How cool is that? Yeah. That's shit hot. Yeah, that's you know, that's, I mean, kneeboarders. Shouts out. Phil Fine from Huntington Beach. Great knee kneeboarder. So cool. Bill Sharp. Oh, it is him. Michael Novikov. And there you go. Yeah, Kevin. I mean, when you're, when you're an ex-lifeguard, you're going to be fast in the water because that's what you do to save people. Yeah. They can I mean, catch though. waves too, right? Yeah, they, they can, can actually it. catch a wave to come in and, and make it easier on them. I wish it was. That is, oh, that is the, oh, that's the tactic of every single paddle race in the world. And can now, they not stand up though? No need. Look at He's a kneeboarder. He's the kneeboard world champion. Yeah, he doesn't have to this. get there. Right, Alex? No way. Okay. Is he going to do it? Oh, I'd be standing up right here, honestly. Who's next to him? I think it's Declan. Oh, Declan White. Yeah. Oh, Ooh. my goodness. He's going to come down to the wire right here. Dude. Paddle, paddle, paddle. Oh. Look, he just looked over and saw him, too. Kevin's kind of maybe got it, right? 
I can't tell. Oh, he's got oh. that. There we go. Wow. It is Let's sleep. go. This it one is, sleep. is for Infinity. And there goes, oh, no, wait, it's a relay? No, it's no. not. It's the champion, ah. Kevin Svarna. There you go, 1,000 bucks. Dang, he had that so hard he could have, like, let's see, Let's hear from him while he's still huffing and puffing. AJ. We are down here on the beach with Kevin just coming in from a really gnarly paddle race. Tell me, what did it take to get the win? Oh, here comes the ladies. Here they come. Woohoo! All right, Kev, tell me what it took to get the win. Uh, Gretchen making me do the paddle race at the coalition contest. Yeah. My whole life. Woo. How gnarly did it get? We both yeah, come won. over here. Hey. Come over Infinity, here. Infinity, the fastest boards on the planet. That was nice. Very good. Very good. Let's go. All right, and our fastest woman right here. You're out of breath. You doing okay? Yeah. I'm riding Kevin's board, so <laughs> I was lucky. He said, if you ride my board, we both have to be champs. So what? And here you go. Both of you champs. Congratulations. Did it get gnarly out there? Oh, man. Mason's a fast paddler. <laughs> I can't believe that. How did you get the win? I just paddled hard. <laughs> oh, man. That was exhausting. That was good, though. I bet. A lot of fun. <laughs> there you go. Just paddle hard. Got the winners coming in hot. Back to you guys. Congratulations, Rachel Tilly, Kevin Svarna, the Infinity Speed Freaks take both men's and women's division. That was absolutely incredible. Mitchell? Yes, it was. It was fun and entertaining, too. And I thought it was actually going to be a lot longer. It was quite quick, Kaipo. Yeah, they were fast. Going great. Yeah, it's too too quick. <laughs> too quick. I wanted to see it. For, I wanted to see a little bit more like action, you know. But that's I, Infinity. I guess the best sports. Well, they're that's fast. Good. Yeah, I like them. I'm gonna get one. Hey, Alex. Before we let you go, I want to ask you a question. When are we gonna get a Van Zick duct tape invitational at Blackies by the Sea? Ooh, I don't know. I think maybe like maybe next. Sorry. <laughs> I think soon. Soon? Yeah, I think we got this. Okay. okay. Cool. That is a good answer. Alex, thank you so much for your insight, your time, all this stuff. I'm not coming in for a handshake. Get yes, in I there. am. Oh, yeah, thank you. Alex guys. knows. Thanks, Alex. Mitchell Salazar, my name's Kaipo, but I'm going to say goodbye. But stick around because after this, we're going to wrap up all of today's action. Stand by for the 805 post show.
rides and epic vibes and now it's time for the 805 post show ring the bell it's officially happy hour chris cote here with shannon hughes and mitchell salazar a full day of vance duct tape competition wrapped up with a ferocious paddle race you know they say that uh traditional longboarders aren't competitive i beg to differ because that right there was a radical race from beginning to end. Congrats to Kevin Scavarna. Was that Rachel Tilly who won it for was. the women? All right, they got $1,000 each. Find them at the local establishment, wherever they end up, maybe the first round's on them. They just earned 1000 bucks for that paddle race. Oh, that was feisty. Everyone straight into it, especially with that wind trap in the afternoon. That was not an easy way to paddle a longboard, and uh, proud of Kevin and Rachel. Yeah, it was really cool. It was entertaining because I also thought that Having Kevin Scavarna just come in after a few heat surfed earlier today, too. I thought he was going to be exhausted, and all of a sudden he was the person that was out front as soon as the get go started. So it was really fun, entertaining while it lasted, too. It was very short. We should do that in the Challenger series. Uh, yes. we'll, we'll, we'll get a, a vote going for that one. That will be fun to watch. Well, Connie Ella Stewart has been absolutely ripping throughout today, throughout yesterday. Basically, every time he surfs, he does it with style, and he did it in a big way right there, getting the win over Declan Whiten. He is standing by now with our correspondent, Lucy, uh, Louisa Florence. And here you go, Connie Tsunami, once again, you striked, clearing everything in front of you. How was this heat? Uh, it was fun. Um, it's a little tricky out there. A, the wind's kind of making it a little harder to balance on the board, making the water choppy. But um, yeah, I just found the right waves and I'm thankful that I got through. Amazing. You have such a village here cheering for you and they're all surfing. Do you guys share tips? Like, is it helping you to have that kind of support outside the water? Uh, yes, always. Um, I got my family and uh, my friends back there. Uh, Kai Salas, my auntie Malia, Kilis, my cousin, got Sophia, my, my cousin Moses over here, my bodyguard <laughs> and coach. Um, but yeah, having all those guys behind me is it's just such, you know, um, I, it makes me feel so happy. And, you know, they get to help me and give me tips, you know, on things I have to work on or things they see that I don't see. Exactly. So it helps a lot. Amazing. So Oh, good luck semi-finals uh, you go thank you guys um, yeah well one more thing uh, I just want to thank uh, the Lord above Jesus thank you for everything I wouldn't be here without him no you won't <laughs> here you go congrats again thank you <laughs> there's a reason why Coniella Stewart is such a fan favorite great guy amazing surfer and a semi-finalist so far in our Vans duct tape 2022 well today was filled with incredible longboarding from beginning to end, we saw a lot of cross-stepping, we saw a lot of swiveling, we saw some incredible surfing. And uh, one of those moments came from round four, heat three, Kaimana Takayama versus Ben Skinner. This was gonna be the heat, uh, one of the heats of the day on paper, and it lived up to those expectations and more. Yeah, that's exactly right. Skin Dog Skinner was coming into this event, ranked number two in the world, just finished second at the first stop on the World Longboard Tour, and Kai, He's a he's a call up for this event. He didn't get to surf in that first contest. And so now here we go with him looking for a spot to get himself into that race. And he surfed so well. Great style coming through and all that energy taking out number two in the world. Yeah, that was a great heat right there. Ben Skinner, of course, one of the favorites to win this event. Out relatively early for him uh, in the quarterfinals. So round four, heat three went down like this. Takayama with a six and a five, nine, seven. Skinner right there in the mix, but just fell short. Quarterfinal finish is pretty good. Uh, he will be at Malibu uh, when we get to the final stop of the WSL Longboard Tour. Well, from that heat, let's go to Kaimana Takayama's next heat, his quarterfinal two appearance against Kevin Skvarna. This heat right here, another epic matchup. These guys best friends from way back. Uh, and they were definitely trading off wave for wave. This was one of the best heats of the day. Yeah, this was a really solid one. Kind of saw it going in Kevin's favor, but Kai had great wave selection. He was able to connect through on those critical sections on the outside, finding really good nose rides, and then just getting the job done on those reforms towards the right, which I think was the right decision. And to take out Kevin also, someone who's had so much experience here alongside of him, the two of them had so many battles in Huntington, had to go to one and went to Kai. I will say that board looks awesome too. All these boards look awesome. I took a uh, trip down to the board rack and uh, man, these are like collectibles. These things look beautiful, Mitch. Yeah, I know, and this is 
actually an interesting situation for Kai because coming in as a wild card and now at least making the semifinals now, I think there's a good chance that he's probably going to get an opportunity to compete at Malibu with this performance alone. And obviously having Kaniela Stewart in the event, one of his best friends, matching his equal third place position at Manly, things are heating up for a good finals day for the Longboarders. That's right. Can't wait to see what happens next. And I got to say, the heat of the day, we're talking about the now generation versus the next generation. Justin Quintal versus Tosh Tudor. Everybody on their feet. You know, people came out of the woodwork to watch this heat. And it was a, a great match, but as usual, Justin Quintal just did everything right. I mean, even on that one, Mitch, he used his priority over Tosh to link into this wave. Tosh was chasing something in the nine point range, and Justin got a nine for the wave that he hold, hold Tosh on. Yeah, and it was a man versus a boy in that heat. It really was. Like, he proved to him how much more experience he was a, as a competitor. And Tudor did knock out Harrison Roach in the round right before this. But I think that the experience of Quintal, especially in these kind of conditions, paid off a lot. He's going to be tough to beat anytime, any place. Uh, Tosh Tudor, congrats, a, semi, a quarterfinal finish in you know, this iteration of the duct tape, along with the World Championship Tour surfer. So a great result for Tosh Tudor. You know, the Van Dorn Village has been going off since about 7 a.m. this morning. People started right lining up to get involved with the activities happening over there. So let's take a look at what's been going on in the Van Dorn Village. Some of the things that uh, make this fun and functional. Uh, a couple of uh, things that you might need in your life, starting off with at Stitchbox. Wetsuit repair. Now this is really cool because if you've ever surfed with a wetsuit, even with the slightest hole in it, that's an uncomfortable situation. And there's not a lot of wetsuit repair shops around, so we're stoked to have Stitchbox here on the sand. Especially with how chilly the water's gotten the last couple days. So many surfers have come in commenting on the fact that they need to go from their, maybe their boardies and bikinis, all the way to a full suit. So get them stitched up. And the party continues in the Van Dorn Village where everyone can get involved with art, music, Waffle Man is even there. And, uh, it's just been a really good time. And, you know, Vans always has a way of including art and music in the in the mix with whatever they do. And, you know, I, I've walked by there on day one, and there's a few pieces of art on the wall. You walk by there now, the place is completely covered with fan-created Vans art. So it's a, a super fun place to be. And we're going to be here for two more days. So get down here early. Get involved. The Van Doren Village opens tomorrow, bright and early. And Steve Van Doren will be cooking dogs. So uh, we know you're going to want to have one of those Steve Van Doren dogs. They're magical. And uh, with the fun behind us, now it's time to get serious. Well, seriously fun. I'm talking about the top five moments of the day brought to you by Stillhouse, America's finest. This is your unbreakable top five. Number five, well, we just saw it go down. An intense longboard race for the ages. So much paddling, so fast, Mitch. I was gonna say, it just reminds me so much of those old school movies. I, I can't stop thinking about Endless Summer when I saw this right now, and it was just very fun, it was entertaining, and it kind of brought, brought back that fun factor that we've seen from the longboarders in comparison to a lot of the shortboarders before. And it is funny when you think of a, a paddle race, that feels really serious. That was one of the more fun paddle races yeah. I've ever seen. Now, this was really cool. Your Stillhouse Unbreakable at number four. Tully White escapes elimination. The manly local making it look easy and clean beach break conditions this morning. A little redemption after heat yesterday. And I think she's feeling really good heading into that next round. And our number three spot goes to Kaniela Stewart. This was a uh, Kani Tsunami going into the quarters by way of shooting the pier, riding the nose, and just doing beautiful surfing. Yeah, and I like to call him our generation's buttons. He has a great style, beautiful flow, but I mean the significance that he had in riding these waves obviously moved him up into the semifinals, but he's moving up in the rankings, he's elevating his confidence, and I think he's due for a win here in Huntington Beach too if he can keep it up. Right there with you, number two goes to Kevin Skavarna. His uh, earlier heats through the day kind of showcased him as a potential threat to win this entire event. Uh, he did buy out after this, but put on a great show for us in early heats. Uh, it's just, he's one of my favorite surfers to watch. I love the new equipment he's got under his feet, the style, the, the technical elements of his nose riding coming through. It was really great to see him in the water. And your number one unbreakable moment, Justin Quintal 
quote, ices the Grom. Yeah, no, and it's completely true. That's the wave you're talking about, Shannon, where Justin with priority took away that opportunity for Tosh and got the nine point ride here. And it seems like every single event, Justin has at least one, point, one nine point ride. And I think moving into the semifinals and better, he's easily the favorite in my opinion. Yeah, and in true Justin Quintal fashion, you know, he almost, you could tell he almost felt bad yeah. uh, in, in that win. He did address, look, we've been friends for a long time. He's kind of a mentor to young Tosh Tudor. So all good times after that. He didn't, he said he would have even been happier if Tosh would have won. So put Justin Quintal on that list of potential favorites to take out this entire event. Well, check this out. Set your alarm early tomorrow is going to be going off down here at the vans us open of surfing if you can't get down here tune in we'll be here bright and early tomorrow morning till then aloha back at it again the vans duct tape invitational competition continues to roll on getting a nice speed line right up to the nose hanging that five that was a beautiful ride by avalon let's give it up for it oh, i sat down with the queen Whoa, beautiful vibe. I try to convince myself that lonely was my creed. Oh. I knew the card I had was wish love up my seat. Let's go. I never knew when my eyes were against you. Finally, everything it makes sense. I just met my match. See, I've been waiting, waiting for the Five to ten, and this is no surprise. Wow, Justin, another win at HBP. Connie threw into the quarterfinals. Light and loose. We are now in the quarter final. Grab that turn, dumping buckets towards the pier. Perfect execution. He's just showing off now. This copyrighted event broadcast is produced by the World Surf League for broadcast around the world and may not be retransmitted, reproduced, rebroadcast, or otherwise distributed or used in any form without the written consent of the World Surf League.